Block 5 Over billions of our people fought and died in our world for resources, ideals, and power for hundreds of years and every generation. There is always a new weapon ready to unveil its head to the world, Melona said. The girls began to whimper as Samantha's empathetic instincts kicked in. They felt their souls torn asunder by these revelations. Seeing their fair share of fantastical elements and every arcane awakening imaginable. None prepared them for Dr. Malona's discourse. They are like birds trying to outfly the storm. Try as they might, their might cannot compare to nature's wrath which the earthlings had mastered to be able to weaponize in such a terrifyingly regular reproduction. S. Stop. Samantha told David alarmingly. They've no enough. Not even taking into account David's personal space, Samantha dove to the chief scientist's computer and closed off the sordid sight that the Gleesians had the unfortunate curiosity to witness. Ola Dewey rose. Samantha. Aliath Rez's eyes flooded again as she grasped for the lieutenant's warmth. So does. But not as ardently. Iris the vampire which too, like a crying child seeking the shelter of her mother's bosom as she entangled the lieutenant in her embrace. Aliathra, breaking down on her person was perhaps the only thing the young elf of a couple of centuries old could fathom to do. In all of her life, she never felt so humiliated and powerless and the more she is exposed to the earthlings, the more she had wished she had just stayed in her lofty tower back in Ethylon. But even then, she could imagine the cracking of the earth that she had witnessed to be the end of her people that she had in her blood. The duty to protect alongside all of Gleesia's younger races. Iris too can feel the same way. Neneth's mercy, what do you want with us? I beg of you. Aliathra broke into incessant pleas. Do not destroy us. The demons, the demons of old are nothing compared to your might. Please I beg thee. Spare us. She sunk down as Samantha caressed her golden hair. I never knew you were capable of such. Such destruction. Iris muttered with distraught, as for your gift. Now I truly understand why you see it as a curse. Iris, perhaps in the first time in her long life humbled herself before someone. I am so sorry. It was. For me the only way to show you. You have to understand. David said. I already do understand. Aliathra said stifling the tears from her eyes. She mustered all the courage she could in order to face this leviathan. You do? David asked. If our people continue fighting against you, that will happen to all of Gleesia. Aliathra lamented. The elf no fully vowed that only she could prevent such a disaster from happening to all of Gleesia. No, it won't I promise it won't. The lieutenant reassured. We will only use such weapons if the lives of the colonists are at stake. Tell me, do you know of such magic capable of doing something similar to this? David asked. None that I know of. Ira sporked. Perhaps the colleges but even I am not so sure. Aliathra unassumingly answered. For all that you see, we only use these weapons against military targets, like armies, fortresses, and castles. Cities, however. Melona stuttered. Depends if your magic does something very dire to the safety of New Albany, he said. Old Dewey Rose, please promise to us, you will not do this to our home. I know my people will fight back but please, we are like children to you. Ants to your feet. Ultimately powerless to resist your flood but please, give us one chance. One to become the water that flows instead of the rock that withstands in vain only to be eroded. Aliathra begged. She began to blurt rapidly in religious psalms and proverbs incoherently as Samantha continued her warming embrace. Perhaps it was the first time for the elf that someone, deep down, genuinely had cared for her, not for her status, not for her superficiality but for the virtuous soul within her. All she ever wanted her was to be the paragon that all could aspire to be in Fenanith's cleric, radiant, maternal and principled. She just never knew that it would create a road filled with such hardship. I promise, we will make all of this right together, the lieutenant sanguinely vowed. Dash. The local Grey Order office boss, Diaz informed as he pulled up his Mustang as he unlocked the door to allow himself and Bobby Bianchin out of the car. He had also taken with him, one big duffel bag of a cumbersome weight that Byung-Chin had theorized that he will need for this venture as the two Aparo Corpos stepped outside. 
In all of its entirety of this establishment, the Grey Order office had never before seen such activity. Tyrion's guild manager, Flynn was exasperated by the amount of foot traffic and demanding traffic inside the building. It was a mix of complaints, inquiries and peculiar of all demands by an assortment of people. On one half there were the usual patrons of the regular stock of Grey Order adventurers, gallivant knights, wandering wizards and roaming rogues. The other half were the foreign warriors that the Federation had recently imported from their homelands. They were distinct in uniforms compared to the standard camouflage texture wear that the armed forces wore. Instead they wore pitch black uniforms with lime green outlining that protruded from their strange armor and weapons. They also wore on their backsides a silvery backpack. These were mercenaries under the payroll of Aparo Corporation. Their company goes by the name Silverback Securities. They are one of many private military contractors rallied forth by Aparo Corporation to bolster the defense of the new Albany colony as per the Megacorps alliance with the colonial governor. However, their real purpose into this strange and foreign land was of a more subversive design. Under orders of Aparo Corporation, their mission was to, by all means within their abilities, and even then, some, dismantle all presence of the Grey Order's economic and political influence in Tyrian and Sanigrad. This also aligns with the youth's goal of having a more centralized network of law enforcement and public utilities. The strategy was devious but impactful. Their targets were not the institution itself per se, but the very people who make the said institution be what it is, the adventurers themselves. They would walk into any Grey Order office that they come across and take up all of the quests on the boards at a discounted or even straight up no restitution for their services. The mercenaries are still getting paid stably by Aparo despite the varied risks of all the tasks, earning credits by the number of quests they have completed for the Grey Order. Most of the grizzled mercenaries were somewhat relieved that they are doing relatively easy work for an above medium pay grade while the greenhorns were balked by the disproportionate risk versus reward balance being gerrymandered. But for poor old Flynn, the guild office manager was having the time of his life in his long career seeing adventurers pass and go. Coming through, one silverback PMC said as he carried off the bullet broken body of the ferocious works who runs wild and rampant to prey on unsuspecting beings around the principality. Impossible. It would take days for even silver adventurers to catch such a beast. Flynn said, Here is the certificate of collection from the sheriff for the delivery. Another merc said, But, the journey to Habshan would have taken weeks. Flynn suspended his disbelief. Took only three hours, he answered. Seeing all of these quests being turned in at record times and quantities nearly made Flynn faint but even then, more and more quests from item retrievals, explorations, bounties and escorts were done all throughout the principality solely by these silverbacks. What would take even the best of adventurers days with a degree of hardship took only these other worlders hours with barely any sweat to fall off their brows. At first, by the name alone, Flynn thought that these men would ask for an unconscionable price for their high quality services but they didn't. These people couldn't care less of whomever or what rank and station in life who posted the quest or how little they would pay. In the most extreme cases, they even asked themselves to offer their superior services at a discount or straight up free if the quest giver was of a low status. Completely unimaginable for most other adventurers who would often get into arguments with their quest givers over their rightful earnings. If his throat wasn't so meek, he would sing to these otherworldly heroes his praises. Yeah, keep em coming lads. Crocker rushed the oncoming mercenaries in and out of the establishment for their sweeps. Hey Flynn, we need more quests for these guys. These gorillas are starting to get restless. He asked the guild manager. Aparo is paying me 20k per contract and I need to keep going. One silverback demanded. I am sorry but... Flynn put his foot forward and gestured his hands to be exposed. But these other quests are for silver-ranked and higher adventurers, he explained. Why not give it to us? If it's just more killing some big monsters then we should handle it. The silverback bragged. I apologize but there are rules in this guild. I appreciate what all of your men have exceptionally accomplished but may you all yield for one moment please? 
the manager gaveled for the order, understand me, but I am stretching the rules to the limit by allowing you all in here right now without proper registration of your identities, Flynn said. Are you sure about that? Bobby walked inside of the conversation to inquire. All of the Silverbacks saluted their patron whilst Crocker and Clay lightly bowed in respect. Status reports urge? Bobby asked. 25 quests sir, but there's more inside that safe over there. Crocker pointed to the secured object behind Flynn's back. So, Flynn's your name, right? Bobby asked. I am sir, welcome to the Grey Order Guild office of Tyrion. Flynn bowed down. What do you think of my men? My silverbacks? Bobby asked. I think they may be causing some trouble with. The manager was about to air his grievances when the front door suddenly opened up to reveal even more mercenaries wearing the silverbacks colors enter the building. One kidnapped for ransom victim. And the bandits are now six feet under. That means dead. The newly arrived said as he carried a dirtied and likely battered woman on his arms to the safety of the city. From her faint tears, she shed tears for joy for her valiant rescue from her oppressive captors. Gonna give praise thee, these men are indeed exceptional in every shape or form. Your men are perhaps the best people I have ever had the honor of hosting in my humble establishment. Flynn quickly changed his tune. Bobby had done his research of the Grey Order and had studied them thoroughly after the coup attempt in Souville. In the eyes of a corpo, the Grey Order is a guild organization of unacceptably vagrant mercenaries who act as both teamsters, explorers, and soldiers upon the drop of the coin. The Order is headquartered at the Empire's capital and has reached around every corner of the Gleesian world. All races, creeds, and species were allowed membership through a meritocratic system of ranks. From the lowest to the highest ranks there is the beginner porcelain, obsidian, and steel, the intermediate, sapphire, emerald, and ruby, and the venerable bronze, silver, gold, and diamond ranks. They were an accessory to the law and order of the land and is a higher risk and higher reward means of alleviating one's status across the realms. But even then, such a loose-knit institution had its flaws. The most peculiar that the corpo can exploit today is the disparity between the higher tier silver and higher ranks versus everyone else lower than the bronze rank. Silver rank and up adventurers get access to exclusive privileges within the guild such as exclusive access to elite quests that offer the highest pay grades, access to various perks on selected business establishments and quite the most unpopular of all the ability to influence or outright decide rank promotion and emotions. These elite cloaks or just cloaks, named for the distinction formal cloaks they wear to administrative meetings that display their statuses, or simply just elites as the lower folks call them were famous throughout the land for their exploits and are often hold significant political power within and without the guild. The rest had to contend with limitations on their ranks such as subper privileges to none at all, contending with lower paying quests and uncertain job securities. They will be taking all of the quests. There's nothing left for us? One of the native Gleesian adventurers complained. He had the misfortune of arriving to take in his next odd job from the guild he calls his own but only to be outshined virtually immediately by these other worlders. This isn't fair. If they keep doing that we are going to starve. We worked hard to get where we are in the guild now. You have to do something about this Flynn. You can't just let them walk all over you. An emerald rank adventurer yelled. Walking someone over implies intimidation. I believe in this situation for me and my represented party's interests. Persuasion I believe is the best course of action. Observe. Bobby snapped his fingers to signal Diaz. Vincente with the duffel bag in tow, dropped it onto the front desk counter causing a loud thud to be emitted in its wake. He quietly unzips the bag and grabs a fistful of its contents before dropping them onto the floor. Ducats. So many ducats. Flynn hovered his hands over the gilded coins, the high of the denomination at that was before him, but his hand was caught by the firm grip of Mr. Biongchen's equally gilded in Ring's hand. I want those elite quest details. My silverbacks will accomplish them and they are going to get away with no problem. And you will keep feeding my men more quests whenever they come up again and again and again. And they will do them. For free, Bobby said. His coercive voice struck true at Flynn's innermost desires and needs. 
he was always making a meagre salary being both the manager and the desk clerk of the Grey Order office building. His position wasn't an attractive magnet for Graf due to him being only a simple herald that doubles as a second-rate innkeeper for the office due to how little power he truly wields in the grand bureaucracy side of the guild, but this much gold, he had never before seen so many ducats in his life. Do you understand? Bobby asked. Yes, he bluntly nodded. Bobby let go of Flynn's hands as the manager quickly collected the ducats on the table before the table, much to the uproar of the native adventurers present in the scene. As the manager turned around to the safe to acquire the elite quests upon the corpo's word, tensions began to escalate unhealthily among the natives and the other worlders. Who do you think you lot are coming in here and taking our jobs away? One adventurer said. Because we want to drive your kind of folks out of Tyrian. Crocker bluntly said, you scoundrels, have you no shame? He raised his fist, says the one who drains old farmers off their coins to protect their hovels from monsters. Crocker cringed in disgust. Sergeant, allow me. Diaz intervened. I'ma pay you twenty pieces. If you fuck off right now. Diaz offered a hand of several ducat coins of varying denominations to the provocateur. Who do you think you are? All of you? You're not even bothering to hide your intentions. You. You villains. He shot down the obvious bribe. The man was fighting for his livelihood and to see these outsiders pay to be adventurers by breaking so many rules and regulations that had to maintain the Grey Order Guild's reputation of promoting peace, well-being and safe commerce throughout the land. I pay for the privilege. Diaz smiled. Oh, you think you do? The adventurer furrowed his brow. Indeed. Where are your papers and tags? All adventurers need those to be allowed to take quests. You just came in today and just grabbed all the quests on the public board then fly off to finish them. Another adventurer backed him up. You know, you can just take this gold and go away too. Diaz offered to him. You think I am some scanty guard that you can just bribe? The adventurer gnashed his teeth. It's not for you though. Bobby smiled. Oh? The adventurer turned to the rotund man in the rich dress, in confusion. It's for your wife, Jaisla, Bobby said. Darmor isn't it? He asked for his name. The adventurer nodded. But in his stricken heart, he was absolutely left frozen upon the hearing of his own name by the other worlder. How did? I am friends with Luya Amirian at the inn she works in. It's no surprise she being wench offers a few extra services to make your ends meet and you hate letting her do it just to put food on the table. I mean, what the hell is a foxy and big titty redhead with golden eyes doing with a guy like you? Hunting wolves and bears for a living while she struts around her skirts all over at the drunken bastard, huh? Bobby asked. Wouldn't you want to at least I don't know. You come home with something nice for her? A new dress? Jewelry? Tickets to a show together? He asked, his eyes piercing down on Darmor's. Bobby's eyes then darted back to Flynn. Which reminds me, you have neighbors right? At Bine Hall? They got a bit of a Quinn Griff. A rabbit raven I call them. They're too poor to afford the fees to get their problem into the registry yeah? Bobby inquired. Flynn nodded. If it makes you want to scratch my back more if I send some boys and make some stew out of them? You know, a few herbs here and there, some vegetables and you got a really nice soup. Something you want to go home to yeah? His charisma made nearly everyone stoop down to laugh or at least smile reminiscing such a delectable dish. Also, how about that little orphanage that I presume many of you folks have either come from or would sometimes donate a bit to the nuns there? Yeah, your nennith be praised. That makes me happy, seeing kids healthy, learning and having fun, especially when a little someone of my own stature and likeness offered to help renovate the place yeah? Bobby smiled. All of the adventurers lowered their tone as the stranger who seems to know their own lives just as well as themselves. It shook fear and door to their hearts of how much power and influence this other worlder possesses. He then spat at the wooden floor of the premise to assert his high gallop at position now that the natives have been cowed. I am Roberto Ferrero Bianchin of the Aparo Corporation. I have eyes everywhere in this city you call your own and thanks to your prince, 
This city is working for me and the youth now. Look, I know what I and the youth doing is obviously bad for you adventurers in making ends meet, but I believe in striking some compromises. My job is to make deals for a living you yeah? He clasped his hands forward politely. Never you cretin. One of the adventurers challenged avidly. You will not take this city you scoundrels. I will not let some disgusting looking upstarts like you people to take away my glory in guard. The adventurers witnessing him knew of this man, a local hero of sorts who is known for his reputation of hot bloodedness and his martial proficiency with the blade. But just as he was about to unsheathe his long sword from its scabbard, Diaz beat him to the draw by unleashing a wild swing of his titanium bat, knocking him to the ground. Sadistically, whilst the man was down, Diaz repeatedly hammered his bat onto the swiftly defeated adventurer much to the native's shock and the silverback's nonchalance. Crocker wanted to stop this as per his principles but these were two evils he had to choose over and the mega corporation were the devil he knew. For the governor's plan, whom his and Clay's true loyalties were to succeed, Aparo's creeping takeover of their soft corporate power was a necessary evil. They just couldn't have what has essentially hired vigilantes to run loose around the principality, not while their only interests are their next pay, not while they come and go as they please and definitely not while the prince or his puppet masters the youth cannot have direct control over such deviancy. For if he remembered one thing to say about the common state party is this. Whatever they cannot control, they will destroy. As I was saying, I am offering you a choice. Bobby gestured his right hand to the heart to showcase his sincerity. However brutal it may be, we, Apara Corporation and the United Federation are inevitable. Already, Prince Clovich as we speak is thinking of having us partner up with the guards for Terrian's safety and security which will all of you be driven out of business. He told them the painful truth. You can either leave here and don't make me see your mug ever again. Second is that you end up like your little friend here. Bobby pointed down with a belittling tone to the beaten up and lifeless body of the man who dared try to openly defy him just as Diaz has finished his little session of battery on the man by whistling a playful tune as wiped the blood off of his titanium bat. The natives shuddered upon the sight of his purplish red face oozing out blood and pus from his broken body. Many of the more green-faced of adventurers, knowing no better, entertained the choice of taking their loss and run. Or lastly, something you may all like, he chuckled, what could possibly be better, one of the adventurers asked, I will give you twice this amount of cash you saw me pay off Flynn here if you join us, Bobby reeled them in, gentlemen and a few ladies over there at the back, I know you are struggling to earn a means of living because my silverbacks take over all the quests and finish them much better than all of you could ever hope to pull off, sooner or later. Aparo and the Federation will take over all your jobs and your prince is going to love every second of it but there is a way out for this. If you can't beat us, join us. Join you, to share your quests? The adventurer pressed. Indeed. I know that some of you adventurers band together to increase your chance of success in your quests so why not join the Silverbacks? We are in needs of people who know the terrains, flora and fauna around here and who is better than you gentlemen who live here longer than us. Besides, we pay you fixed salary that means that every week you receive payment unlike you have to wait for who knows when to get some money. Why wait for the opportunity when you can be the opportunity? Byung-Chin proposed. And to sweeten the deal. Free healings for all work-related injuries and a retirement plan after at least 10 years of service with me and the Silverbacks. He added, the adventurers began to whisper among themselves of this brave new prospect being offered before them. What this stranger and his merry band of men were offering was a way out of their unstable financial situation. Like the security of knighthood minus the titles and glamour but all of their futures and beyond secured. There is a saying where I come from, uh oh ferrito, gold or pain, join us or be wiped away by us? He gave his ultimatum. Join you, ha. Huh? When it rains wine. You are even worse villains than the demons of old. Another adventurer rallied himself. Wine? Oh, go on. Toast to your noble profession. Diaz teased. Toast to being glorified murderers, thieves, and hypocrites or you can all do better. Join us. 
join the Federation. Diaz added, You know what? I am sick and tired of the shite pay while all of the cloaks get all of the good stuff for themselves. One adventurer stood up and volunteered. He walked towards Byung-Chin and received his introductory welcome pay from him. Where can I begin? The adventurer asked. Hey, Sarge, make every one of these good folks like him find a squad and attach him to it yeah? The man slapped the natives back like dear friend and brother as the Yafif soldiers begin the long process of assigning native guides to the Silverback Securities mercenaries. However, just many adventurers pragmatically join the youth to work and then enjoy better means of making living, not everyone thinks like that. For those adventurers who rejected the proposal, glory, fame and rank are more important than a fat paycheck or luxurious benefits and the other worlders are taking them away. They quietly walked outside as they were showed off by the foreign warriors with their head looking down to the ground as to not show their ashamed face to the world as their position of keeping the status quo. Weakened upon the wake of this new invasive wave that these other worlders brought forth, as some walked around, cursing silently of how cheated they were by the Aparo Corporation. A shady figure approached them. Hey, are you adventurous? He asked. Looking for a quest? How so? There's nothing left. An adventurer sadly informed. Oh no. This one I managed to save for myself but I can use some help for this. We can split the cash. The shady figure explained. Lured in. Several dozens of them like several dozen more before them approached the man. You know of those folks over by the branch office? The figure asked. Yes. They took all of the quests away. We are being driven off. You want some payback for those other worlders? I have a quest for people like you that can surely gain you great fame and let you pay back those people. The figure coerced. Really? The adventurers the figure managed to catch in the most opportune time collectively gasped. Have you heard of the adventurer Radrid the Flagrant? The shady figure asked. Yeah, I know him. He may be a gold rank but he looks out for us scrappers. What's going on with him? An adventurer asked. I hear he pays quite well. Another adventurer added. He he he. The figure grinned. Listen closely and do spread the word quietly. The man curled his finger back repeatedly to usher them closer. Little did they know, that these adventurers were not only going to be recruited into a plot so sinister but they were being watched unknowingly from above them. A spy camera designed in the shape of a native purple bird to overlook discreetly the Grey Order office, a point of interest for the new Albany Police Department. What are you planning? Inspector Reed whispered to himself as all of his colleagues spied at the disgruntled adventurers that Aparo Corporation wasn't able to successfully defect. Dash. Light on her feet but still reeling from the revelations before she came to the Root family household. Aliathra put into her practice, years of the Quarral Felvander, the dance of the elven forest as it is called. Something close to heart about the creation legends of Gleesia, specifically the elves and her homeland of Alphelnora. It is described by those few outside witnesses to the elven continent to be a merriment filled cavort filled with flowing movements to mimic the movements of her goddesses creation separated in verses, the rushing rivers, the warming sun the peaking mountains, the blooming wood, the frolicking wilds, the caracol of the first peoples and lastly the nenith's regalement. The moves can be described with the contrasts the beget the real world it imitates, a mix of flowing, rising, and falling actions followed by a free style of rapid movements and slow movements that interprets the wilds that was the goddess's creation. It is normally danced by multiple people but if one has the ingenuity, intransigence, patience and arcane competencies in the fields of illusion magic, one can accomplish the full dance alone with the aid of several minor illusions. The quarrel Falvander is often performed to mark a new point in a certain road for a person or to mark the beginning of spring and summer, especially of one April Root's birthday. This dance was more than appropriate. The elf just hopes that this would be up to her parents' satisfaction as she has yet to detail a bead about how she is going to provide entertainment. As Aliathra hummed to the verses as she remembered from her youth, her ears perked, alerting her to an uninvited visitor. Who is there? She asked amongst the solemn grounds of the Root family homestead. Hi hi hi. 
a peal of childish laughter can be heard. April, Aliathra eyes widened as she recognizes that girl's voice. Should you not be at your home right now? The elf asked. Never. My mummy will make me eat beans for dinner. I rather play with you. She playfully protested. You need to be back with your parents right this instance. Aliathra ordered. You have to find me. April challenged before another playful laugh echoed through the chiming of the tree leaves. With her senses tingling, Aliathra's eyes darted around the scenery, her shivers raised and ears perked to attention as she tried to search for Abedaya's child. She will humor this little one today. Come out April. Your parents could be worried that you're missing. Aliathra warned. You have to find me first princess. She teased. May I remind you that I am also a ranger? It's like your father being a hunter. I track and find things in the forest. Aliathra kept the conversation going to egg the child for a response. You bring my mommy meets you too? That's cool. She exclaimed. Cool? What does that mean? Aliathra questioned. It means you're a nice person to be with if you are like my daddy. April smiled. Oh, sweet child. You know nothing of your father. Aliathra backed herself behind a tree, with a confident smile on her orifice as the shiver of her skin alarmed her to April's hiding spot. Surprise attack. April leapt off of the tree branch she hid from only to be caught by Aliathra's reflexes midair. Got you. Aliathra babbled at the little one. Hooray. Hug me beautiful and pure princess. April articulated her arms open to receive the warm bosom of the elf's embrace. Pure. That word, that one single word soured that innocent moment that the elven princess wanted to cherish at this moment of fading peace. It made her body quiver upon the guilty word that the child had innocently reminded Aliathra. Her cybernetic body, her fractured soul. Her broken heart shivered at Pure's reverberation on her ears. Her smile faded as her mind wandered off once again. You. Think I am. Beautiful? Aliathra asked April. Not only that but Pure. April squealed. Daddy told me all about you. How you help people, care for animals and being nice to everyone like a real princess should. Oh, your father must be saying Abo. Aliathra tried to backtrack herself in a haphazard attempt of humility to save her the further embarrassment of the child's incessant praises. Daddy also told me about how many bad people line that you're evil. But you're not, April said. He. He told you that? Aliathra asked, her mouth left agape at the child's insight. You are just misunderstood. You're not evil. You can never be evil. April further embraced Aliathra. You are like Elsa the Ice Queen. Elsa? Who is she? The elf asked. Elsa is a princess and later a queen of her kingdom of Arendelle who has tremendous ice magic powers which makes people be scared of her. They even called her a monster too. But later, she does a good deed for her people and her people accepts her for what she is. My daddy and mommy said the beauty from the inside of a person is purer than the beauty from the outside. April explained. You think I am like Elsa? Aliathra asked. Uh -huh. April nodded. She's just like Shrek too. He's a big ugly ogre but gets to marry a beautiful princess because he is a good ogre from his heart. Even Auntie Iris too is a good lady. She may be a blood-sucking vampire but she is a good vampire. She always helps us when Daddy and his friends ask for her help and makes Mommy happy by buying her food too. April further revealed, thinking back, in addition to the previous revilement of ogres and their foul general appearances, Aliathra recalled the time the Empire and her own people would describe these other worlders as demons. Feeding off of souls, ruining the land and wantonly sowing the seeds of decay in the world. But what these other worlders did was to the contradictory, constructive and benevolent even. They build prosperity when there's poverty, they built order for where there is chaos. They brought peace when there was only strife. Demons, shouldn't do that. However, the prophecy as she heard from Grandmaster Owen that these are the worlders will sow the end of Glee easier still troubles her. Little one, I have to tell you something, it is about. Aliathra swallowed her angelic demeanor to explain something serious, the but she was cut off when April whispered softly into her pointy ears. Prophecy, Shmopesi. She denounced. Those bad men in Harry Point are just dum-dums. Nobody can see the future. What do you mean? 
clairvoyance is one of the most powerful spells in all of Gleesia. Aliath relapted the child's non-belief. The future, as Daddy told me is ours and ours alone. We choose where we want to go. It's just how we will face it is the hard part. April said. Again, reflecting back, clairvoyance, in spite of its name may be powerful in manipulating the quantum dimensions of the world to see into the future, but it is imperfect at the politest descriptions of its practical evaluation. It was a relatively new discovery by the College of Magi in Herring Point that had met some controversy amongst the top arcane academics around Gleesia due to its unreliability and general inefficiency with how much mana must be consumed to properly conduct the ritual. Was there a chance that Grandmaster Owen misinterpreted the future of Gleesia? You, you are wiser than you look little one. Aliathra softly praised. For once in her entire duration of this tumultuous quest in a search for acknowledgement, Aliathra felt a sense of hope. It wasn't through the political machinations these other worlders concoct that will inevitably be triumphing against all odds. The prophesied humiliation of her kind nor the continued corruption of Aliathra's body with cybernetics so she may fight on for a better future in this new tide that the Federation from the world above the skies that gave her a glimmer into a day where all of Gleesia can live in peace. What renewed her hope was this child. This small tyke before her gave her hope. Her lamenting prayers to her goddess or whoever is listening to them were answered. Aliathra hugged the child wholeheartedly as April embraced her back in equal folds. She even shed a single tear from her eye that, despite her damaged vision was able to seamlessly yielded. Enough talk princess. April lets go of her embrace so her little hands can grasp Aliathra's. Can you show me more of those cool magics you are practicing for my party? I want to see it and I am the birthday girl and the birthday girl gets what she wants, she ordered with an impish tone. Of course, your majesty. Allow me to demonstrate. Aliathra smiled as she stood up and began to hum again. A rainbow's worth of orbs consisting of sparkling lights conjured around her as Aliathra began to flow her body to the rhythm of the quarrel Falvanda. April in tow danced along to the playful song as well as her little body could copy the intricate and delicate steps the elf had taken. Despite the contrast, they were both enjoying this moment together. This moment even reminded the elf of a simpler time at her youth when she would use her magic not for healing, casting defensive wards nor even deceiving people with illusions but to create something. Something truly magical. As the two danced together, a bewildered but now relieved Abidaya and Leah Root watched their only daughter play along with the elf harmoniously as the sun began to set on the horizon. Dash. Done. Ken smiled as he wiped the sweat of his ebony skin over a hard day of work. The combat engineer was helping Iris Kadahagan move into her shared new little house, that she will also share with the elf Aliathra today. All of the basic furniture has been moved inside and now the home is now minimally livable. There were some empty walls that could use some brightening up with decoration and other sorts of knickknacks here and there but outside of that, Iris now has a place to finally call her own, although she will have to share it. It is a single floor, residential home situated a moderate walk between her new home and the underground laboratory's entrance. It wasn't as spacious as her old cabin by the River Valley Woods but it was definitely more aesthetically pleasing. What was considered the most profanatory of this little hearth was the fact there's only a single bedroom inside the residence that she and Aliathra will have to share with two separate twin-sized beds on opposite sides of the room. There was a garage area that was meant to be the storage area for one such of the youth's mechanized beasts they call the he kills but as Cairn explained. She can with some help convert it into a workshop just like or even better than its predecessor with the luxury of adding several new amenities and gadgets such as a full-fledged blacksmith anvil, a forge and a tannery. Too bad that she will also have to share that space with Aliathra too, but at the very least she can brew stronger potions without some straggler getting suspicious as per her previous clandestine arrangements. There was also enough plot of open land that Iris can. When she can gather the seeds again, make her own little herb garden just like before. But for now, such additional facilities to continue her work at the comforts of her home will have to wait for now. 
she will have to contend with the bare minimum of decent living until more of the Federation's boons bless her again, and already, the blessings she counted were beyond her ten fingers. Oh, glory to Sir Mudwin you are indeed so capable with your hands. Iris cooed as she placed on one hand to her breast and the other skirting away her long raven hair as she approached the otherworlder whose skin was black as night. Well, this is your new home now Iris, I do hope you and Aliathra find it comfortable. It's not much but if you work more with us and with the party you should be able to get some decorations out to make it really yours. Kayan acknowledged. You know, my dear, Sir Mudwin. Kayan I mean. But ever since our little tango back at my old home, you were always so, so nice to me. Despite your physique. Tilda Aris tantalized as she caresses Kayan's biceps that lay bare due to his sleeveless shirt. It seeped with sweat excreted through diligence but the vampire which marveled at Cairn's firm muscles and how his skin was as dark as the night sky. She had a previous weakness for males of a well sculpture based on those Bandle Thunderhand novels who has a similarly described body. The musk of him. However, it made the vampire witch tremble at Cairn's presence even when he tries to be humble. She still feels an aura of masculinity whenever he sees him bravely fighting whatever it may be in front of him. From the western desert, that rainy day in Suville and the most especially their first encounter. She has to say, Cain Mudwin was quite a catch. Exotic skin color not included. He was intelligent and as curious as to her. But there were some degrees of complementary traits that the nightmen exhibit that Iris lacks. Cain was a planner above all else whilst she was a creature of impulse. While he is calm, she is passionate. Lastly, despite his lack of magic, he had respectable understanding and respect for her that Iris had never before had gotten before. Even Lunar Amirian, the closest person Iris has to a friend before meeting the other worlders was more of a business partnership with a few perks since deep down, even the dwarf feared the vampire's powers, but the other worlders, unlike the inquisitors and self-righteous adventurers who took bounties of hunting down vampires like her. They treated her as a person and a sense of respect to her abilities with Cairn being its strongest example. And this feeling turned into desire for Iris, a desire akin to the romantic novels she occasionally reads in between projects and business assignments. She wants Cairn, she craves his warmth, she needs his arms to wrap around her and protect her from the ravages of this cruel world and the horrors of what this other world's eldritch magics and technology could possess. After only having herself to fend against such monsters, Iris had always dreamed of a man who can say they will love her for who she is and have the actual might to protect her, a metaphorical, and quite literally in such a humorous sense of black knight to chase away the scary monsters of what Gleesia has to offer. You know, Cain, now that you helped me and all moving into this new home of mine, would it be good if you can stay for a bit and help warm this place with your presence? Iris said. She stared at his eyes longingly as she fought her urges to claim him. Her hands, rather obnoxiously caressed her body top to down her violet dress in an amateurish display of sultriness. It was still too early to have her for himself and it would ruin this moment if she shoots her arrow too early. However, due to her lucid body dynamisms, Cain was able to decipher that there was something off with the vampire witch. Is something the matter Iris? He asked. Oh love, so many where should I begin? Aliathro exploded her arms up and about. I had the most dreadful epiphany today with Samantha. Did something happen to the LT? Cain asked. Oh no. La Dewey Rose is fine, as fine as a horse. Iris reassured, it's what happened a few moments after that got me so. How do I say? Restless. Iris said, what could be so bad now? Ken asked today. Your friend, Malona talked about these powerful weapons you call WMDs and it may be so. Dispirited, hold me love, Iris said as she pried Cairn's large right hand to caress the back of her head. Almost instinctively, Cairn brushed the vampire witch's silky black hair and for a moment he was mesmerized, but as Iris jovially moaned, the combat engineer snapped back into reality letting go of his amorous grasp. I I Iris, Cairn questioned. Don't stop love, I want you, I need you. Iris retracted her nightman's hands. 
Relieve me of such fears. Hold my body as I fasten mine unto yours! Exclamation mark tilde. I know we do. But this is all going so fast. Cain protested. But his face was then caressed by Iris's lithe snow hands. Where is the night man who bested me? Where was the night man when he defeated the villain Divico from of one Iris Kudahagan? Where was the night man who valiantly slew the orc hordes? Question mark tilde Iris poetically challenged. She was no true romantic however unlike the comical characters of those Bandle Thunderhand novels could suggest. The dashing elven bard rescuing the damsel in distress or the ravishing ladies demanding to bed such a paramount poet had the gaudiest jargon to prose the very translated pages. Many of such ladies who read these novels, mostly of those of obvious literate comprehension, the dream of a man like Bantle to romantically lift them up their arms and be their knight in shining armors. It was common for such folks to host chivalric tests to find the superior specimens amongst the males to become their husbands. Iris was no different. She may have the most extensive collection of Bandle Thunderhand this side of the Empire if she can admit since such a scandalous book was unheard of in the more conservative Empire territories and is regulated under the locked cabinets of the nobility's study rooms. Iris, are you okay? Did. Did the doctor get you all mad because he showed you all of those? Those things? Ken asked. Oh. Hold me. Oh. My brave black knight. Iris smothered herself on Cairn's chest. Protect me from the horrors of the world with your sword you dedicate yourself to me exclamation mark. Tilda Iris fainted blithely, taking good care, to follow how the woman would have posed visually speaking, as seductive and as vulnerable as possible. Vulnerability, something Iris never thought she would allow herself to be in such a state of. But if it was with Cairn, all of the world around her, all its hate, all its tremors, and all its sorrow means nothing if he was by her side. Perhaps she has a taste for men who can keep up with her in the aspects she excels for a century in. I think you just need to relax after what happened. May I suggest some herbal tea? Ken asked. I need something better. Iris grasped and fiercely pulled down Ken's shirt on until Ken can sent Iris lust pulsing breath her teeth exposing her excited smile as she licked her yearning lips to meet with Cairns. You have bested all trials to prove your virility on this young maiden. Claim your prize oh my brave black knight. Iris teased. Ravish me, she shouted. BB but. Cairn was reaching his inhibitions breaking point as he too wanted to claim his glory but is still held back by his own volition to take it alone. But alone, he did not have to take the next step in this amorous adventure as Iris' lips for the first time made contact with the flesh of another living being, not for her own feeding of her vampirically enhanced nutritional needs but for the primal craving for something she didn't know she needed. Companionship the vampire witch and her black knight warmly united their bodies together as the latter pushed their combined weight to the newly installed sofa who, true to its nature held firm as its soft foam supported Iris and Cairn as they magnetized themselves for the first time. Little did they know, walking home now that Malinaries began to set down into the horizon, an elven cleric, one named Dalia Thaleth the witness Tyrus and Cairn's romantic moment. Ducking down shyly on the bush, the elf saw the passion that drove each of the two together as the repressed memories of her restrictive upbringing came back to haunt her. If she was the same Alia throw before months ago, she would have recoiled in disgust but, knowing Iris and Cairn's growing rapport with each other, how could this be a sin? Was what she witnessing of what she was forbidden to see as a proper princess should romance? Aliathra a single word echoed through her head as now she too desires companionship in such a time where she thought she was alone in this world and everything is out to destroy or taint her soul. SS such might. Iris squealed in delight as she faded to black under Cairn's charcoal embrace. Dash. SS such might. Prince Klovich squealed in terror as the thunder of the self-propelled gun's 155mm cannon pound the ground and decimate a dummy castle to literal dust. They were still in Renataho Industrial Complex today as the otherworldly but primitive guests get a front row seat to a weapons demonstration of the youth's arsenal. They saw the guns. 
the mechanized steeds and arms that the earth humans possess and wield with such distinctive enthusiasm and discipline. Many of Klovich's militaristic of companions and advisors speculated on the applications of such deific equipment be given to their own soldiers as they eagerly studied the Afif's doctrines. The military exercise that was used to demonstrate such arms, however, were of an unsettling scenario. It was a siege of a pre-constructed castle with the youth's soldiers attacking target dummies worth of men in similarly designed steel, leather and iron equipment just like the Gleesians wielded, they were torn to shreds without such an opportunity for a reprisal could be mustered as the outer walls were decimated by the combined might of guns, aircraft and worst of all, the youth's answer to the Gleesian trebuchet, a self-propelled gun, this is big base target is no more, the radio on their observation booth casually informed all the congregation. Indeed, there was no more pretend castle to seek protection on. All that is left from the dispelling black smoke was a shallow crater of black where said target used to be. All were frozen but felt a stunning fever paralyze their bodies as they imagined such firepower impact their or their liege master's armies. No amount of formations, magic or equipment could stand up to such might. Klovich too now realized the hard truth about the Federation's power of whom its leader proudly smiles with self satisfaction. He can imagine such familiar places such as Tyrian, Suville and Great Herring Point herself grumbling in ember-red smolders under the tattered and now trampled remains of the Empire's banners as the Federation's armed forces marched triumphantly above their corpses. My lord, Edmurl shuddered, I know. There is no denying it. Clovich swallowed his pride. They may not be gods but they might as well be. Of course, you do. Just as easily I can build, we so easily can destroy. Just so I can easily gift you so I can easily take it away and use it against you. Prime Minister Bowski lectured, you know understand what power is at your back right? All of the native visitors acknowledged silently, at a loss for words of what to say next. Good, very good. You do your part in making sure what happened to Fort Rocky over there not happened too much to your home otherwise. Well, you know, we may be generous but we are also impatient," Bazka said as he snarkily chided to the crater before them at the distance. The Uthworlders humbly lowered their heads. Hey what are the long faces? Bazka's voice raised up to a cheerful tone. Long faces? Did something happen to my face? Klovich asked in alarm. Oh, I mean, why are you sad? The Prime Minister corrected himself. I am not leaving here until you have something to bring home," he said with zealous determination. What could I bring home but doom says? You are like gods, Edmurl despaired. No, he shot down the emotional old man, his senile mind, not able to handle the river's current that is the progress of time, aspiration, he said. As, but, I, what is this word, Clovich asked, the definition unknown to him, it's an ambition. You saw what you could be back in Geneva right? Glistening cities, happy populace, peace, and prosperity, Bazke explained. But, you speak of those yet wield the power to destroy everything with a killing word. How can I have the ambition to achieve all of what you have built if you can easily take it all away? Clovich asked. I believe there is a special someone who lives in a castle in the middle of a certain island country that can help you. Someone who can show you what was it like to see such power. Bazka smiled. Nakamura, the Prime Minister summoned, a man of a humble stature with a soft smile emerged into the Gleesians' field of view. As the man stood before them he humbly bowed down to Klovich's presence. With his visage enthusiastically smiling on them, the man calmly introduced himself. I am Masakazu Nakamura, herald of the Imperial Clan. He gave his name. Emperor Shinharu of Japan has cordially invited your audience to his palace. The herald continued. Chapter 38 The Road Ahead Inquisitor is in position. Reed radioed his static buzzing through the air of Governor White's conference room. Good. All forces move in. Jeremy exercised his authority. It had been about day's work of nerve-wracking detective work for the police forces lead by Inspector Reader's anxieties from both the civilian and military sectors of the colonial government of New Albany waited on for evidence of the most sinister of plots unlike 
they had faced before, a deliberate attempt to undermine their power within Lee easier. According to the intel gathered, several disgruntled Grey Order adventurers are being recruited for a plot against them. However, they do not know the specifics such as what, when, how and where is the plot would take place. That is why he is now in his conference room to deliberate on the matter. With him were his league of ungentlemanly folks that make up his inner circle. Major Holyfield, commander of the Aurora Battle Carrier, leading a contingent of Marines and the projected might of the Federation's air power to bear. He was sitting idly by, paying little to no heed to the live feed on Governor White's laptop displaying Reed's operation. His eyes stared blankly at his smart pad that showed order of battle across his project of Operation Haymaker. Colonel Polonsky, leader of the colony's defense forces, held the most sway on the largest amount of Federation troops and arguably several natives too. If Holyfield is youth's sword, Polonsky was its shield. Agent the Sut of the Bureau of Intelligence, instrumental into the discovery of the plot sat eagerly by Polonsky awaiting any update from the action-oriented read on what yields he will likely bring out once the mission concludes. He twiddled his thumbs, littering his husband's muffins over the mahogany table as his ears intently directed its attention to the governor's computer. Lastly, was the newcomer, from all the way from the crystal spires of Earth, one Thomas Sight, a senior bureaucrat from the Ministry of Education assigned to Glee Easier to help lay the foundations for Prince Klovich's healthful modernization and reformation efforts. He was an uncanny human being in respect to his minimal human face. Bald hair and lens-like eyes gave him a more robotic appearance than a human. Yet despite his eerie appearance from the militaristic members in Governor White's inner circle, Agent Dessart and Governor White gave him in high regards unquestioningly taking his sage advice. Roger, moving in. Reed nodded. The laptop displayed a feed from the inspector's action camera as his team approached a fluff house door. Based on Agent the Sut's intelligence gatherings through a few well-placed spy birds, the Colonial Police have tracked a suspicious group of adventurers to that location thanks in low part through their irregular get-up of mismatched armor and exotic weapons. Unlike the more uniform Tyrian Citadel guards that regularly patrol the streets, many folks like the ones they followed come and go at Tyrian all the time which unnerved several of the colonial defense forces and the marines as such people can suddenly turn to descend upon the Matmele range and in response to a possibility, the enactment of an alienating measure, enforcement of a rule that a minimum distance to be between a Yafif soldier and a native be of two sword lengths apart from each other. This was suggested by Klovich sometime before his departure on how mannerisms towards soldiers were conducted when they have to visit a city whilst fully equipped in their gear. An additional precaution by arming Yafif personnel with bayonets below the barrels of their rifles were also ordered. Check the door. Reed instructed. One of his men grabbed a tool from his pocket. A snake-like appendage object, known as the underdoor camera was inserted underneath the gap of the fluff house's door. One tango, crossbow pointing at the door facing us. The team's pointman holding the camera informed him. Breach and clear. They are expecting us. Let us not disappoint. The governor ordered. Will do. Reed nodded. On view with the camera. As Jeremy observes. The team began to set up the fuse and the payload of the breaching charge. A tense moment occurred as the SWAT team embedded the breaching charge at the door as their off-site superiors observed them anxiously. Clear, Reed shouted. The breaching charge gave a great expulsion of dust and debris as it effortlessly demolishes the fluff house's wooden front door. Their greeter, pushed back by the explosion barely saving his constitution from the shock tried to aim his crossbows at the intruders but a reactive shot from one of the SWAT members gunned him down in the head. Damn it, remember we need some of them alive you know. Reed reprimanded his subordinate. Undeterred, the SWAT team redoubled their efforts as now the whole building was alerted to their presence. They knew they need to clean this house quickly and fast before the adventurers flee away or worse destroy the evidence. One team scoured the upper floor whilst another, Reed included searched the ground floor. The governor minimized Reed's personal feed to oversee the rest of the action cameras of all of the brave souls participating in this operation. 
Hands up. Don't try it. Hey, one SWAT member caught an adventurer in his room who tried to pull a blade on him but was quickly gunned down. They are here. Kill them all. They must not find out. A voice echoed ominously in the distance of another feed. Clear. Moving up. Another SWAT member monotonously informed. Inspector. One SWAT member, whose feed was facing Reed himself called out. What is it officer? Reed asked. Got something on my scanner. Something hollow. Behind that cupboard, the officer informed. He pointed out to the object of his suspicions across the room. Riveted. The inspector quietly gestured his men to form up behind him as he and another officer moved the cupboard away, much to the alerted officer's satisfaction of his tools. There was indeed, hidden behind the furniture a hidden flight of stairs leading down. It was however dimly lit to pitch black that one cannot see the bottom of the stairs well. Going in dark, Reed said as he pulled down his night vision goggles with their feet stepping down the flight of stairs. Sweat began to nervously fall down the SWAT team's brows as their heartbeats stressed upwards at the darkened anxiety that the stairs give a menacing aura on. Hold up, there's a door. The pointman gestured. Check it, Reed ordered. Using the underdoor camera once again, the pointman observed what lays ahead. Ten tangos, and a whole damn armory, he said. Reed get in there, bag them and tag him back to HQ. Dasat would want to have his way with them. Governor White radioed. Will do. Reed unquestioned. Breach and clear with a flash. He ordered. Breaching. The pointman unpinned a flashbang grenade from his pocket, peeked open the door and tossed the explosive inside. They are he. One of the adventurers tried to scream but her eyes were devoured in a brilliant white light as all ten of them became dazed by the flashbang's rude awakening. Reed's team descended upon the adventurers aiming their guns and shouting at them in vigory to surrender. Two adventurers however either did not take the message or were foolhardy enough to try to. Attempted to reach for their weapons to fight back against their attackers but were quick with a double tap on their heads by the SWAT's carbine rifles. What am I looking at? White radioed as he leaned forward to examine the hidden room of the fluff house. Reed turned his head around to gain a closer look at the rest of the room. There was a stockpile of assorted weapons and magical scrolls in one side, enough to arm a small brigade and his magical aura detector. A recent invention by the collaborative efforts of Dr. Malona and Iris Kadahagan when it comes to detecting various forms of magic. It's HUD displays that the magic present in that stockpile were of the holy category. On the other side of the room, he can see what looked like an oversized map of the entire street network of Tyrian with big circles and arrows pointing towards locations that to Governor White's horror was the Tyrian Castle Keep. The youth's embassy in New Albany herself. Surrender now, Reed told all these dissident folks. Never. You took away our glory. The only things that matter for us in life, one adventurer flouted. You think your fame will be noticed by anyone if you die? Don't be a fool. Nobody will mourn a dead man. Reed shot down. That is what you think demon. We are silver and gold ranked adventurers who have made our names known to the people and the guild. They will all remember us. He rallied his ego. You are all just cheats. The lot of all of you. His friend behind him backed him up. Cheaters who never have to work hard to get to where you are all at unlike us all. These adventurers have let fame cloud their judgment and rationality so Reed has observed. Even his superiors were frustrated and admiring their tenacious stubbornness. Let's get real. Here shall we? The common folk don't need people like you flashing your badge of silver gold rank or whatever color it is to show you are great and demand high pay. I am sorry dot rewards. Right now. They want us more than you people because we youth do better jobs than you and we don't make folks spill their guts out pay for your crappy services no more. Reed said. That is where you are wrong. When we are done here. There will be no shortage of heroes and gold for us to repatty every so grateful Tyrian. By the gods. An ever so grateful empire. The adventurer defied again with all of his breath. 
Done with what? What are you planning? Reed pressed for answers with his carbine jerking lurching towards the adventurers. I am afraid you will not be alive to see it. A cloaked adventurer coyly smiled. Flame wave. The man revealing himself to be a mage began to conjure his hands to form the magic used to incinerate him and his teammates. But Reed remembered his training when dealing with hostile mages. Compared to a standard fighter, a ranger or eggs that the Grey Order employs, the mage was arguably the most articulated of the types of folks he may encounter in Gleesia. They rely on somatic gestures, a focus point a voice command or a combination of what was described. Seeing his hands glowing orange, Reed took aim with his rifle and shot the hand off of the mage just as his spell was about to articulate. A-H-H. The mage screamed as he knelt down to the floor his friends watching in horror, just as Reed was about to order his men to apprehend the adventurers, the SWAT team noticed that the injured mage was now beginning to glow a reddish-orange as the magical energies within him became unstable, no, no, too hot, the mage cried as his body combusted into a blazing inferno engulfing his fellow adventurers and putting the incriminating evidence in the underground room to the torch. Reed's men barely got their bearings over the sight of this extraordinary event. Their whole plan had gone south in an instant by no part of their own. Run, run, run. Reed shouted to his men. Quickly the SWAT team regrouped themselves out of the fluff house just as the building was fully blanketed into flames. Did we get anything? Reed asked his teammates. Anyone? I only got this letter when I searched for someone. I shot sir. Looks important but I can't read it. One of the SWAT officers showed a barely cinched letter with some equally barely legible handwriting in Vigory, a weakness to Iris spell and to the youths on transcription teams. Damn it. We were so close. Reed cursed himself. At the distance, the SWAT team can hear the alarming bells and cries for help. It would be in a matter of time before the Tyrian guards and the Citadel's primitive fire brigade swarm into the scene. Pull out of there. This went too loud for our tastes. The governor reluctantly gave the order. Roger. Inquisitor is exfiltrating. Reed coughed up smoke to acknowledge the change of plans. Jeremy Eckingly closed down his laptop as he frustratingly grasped his besieged head at the failure to yield anything concrete to the plot against him and his regime. All that they managed to pull out from the fluff house's fire were just more questions than answers. Why are you so sad about Governor? Holyfield interjected. We still don't have anything to go by that rumor the blue boys got up, but we were this close. White pinched the air to show his grievances. I say, that is more than enough evidence. Agent Dassard closed his fist. Those plans? Those murmurs? We need to lock down everything from Tyrion to New Albany at once. We use the puffer fish method, especially at Tyrion where our men would be at its most vulnerable. Show them that it will be more trouble than it's worth to tread on us, he proposed. If we do that, we will break the military access treaty with Clovich. White argued. Then how about we just pull out the embassy? It's likely the first place they will target in the Citadel. Thomas Sight suggested. We need to protect our diplomatic personnel at least until we can fully purchase Clovich's allegiances, Polonsky suggested. Again, that will also break the treaty too. His advisors and his sister will start to question all about it and may take it as a sign of bad faith. We cannot afford any more bad faith at a time like this and the Tyranni are our best cards in play, White argued. Again, we also have to take into account Arya's and even Clovich's reaction if we abandon our post in Tyrian now, regardless of their safety. They might think we are about to do something shady and so I go back to not producing bad faith. The governor added, I say, disarm and pat down all the civilians and confiscate their arms. The colonel gave his second proposition. Since when did mass disarmament of civilian populations ever worked? The technocratic Thomas reasoned. Plus, magic. You forgot they exist, don't you? They walk and talk like us. Weapons in a human form. How about let it happen? Then have some of my friends in the bureau spin it. Do we stoke new patriots to the cause? Hell, get even more funding and stuff from the Whigs while we are at it? Dasad threw another bet of his lot onto the table. No, 
too much uncontrollable variables. It can go wrong if one thing doesn't go our way. The party might risk political crucifixion. Try again, Thomas calculated. Then what can we do? Dassard asked. But all of his colleagues stayed their silence. Damn it. The intelligence agent cursed as he sunk down to his seat in defeat. All of the inner circle collectively sighed in defeat with him. They were grasping at straws, smoke even and now these adventurers are going to strike a terrorist attack at their hard work and there was no way of fighting back or mitigating its material and political damages to all parties involved. So. A terrorist attack, right? Thomas asked. Yes. This is but just a cell of them. Isolated except for maybe a few members who can contact another cell. All to maintain the secrecy of this blot mind you, Dasat said. I see. So, in cell theory or whatever you war horses call it, these individuals would be untrustworthy of that outside of the group right unless whoever is the connecting person is to link one cell to another gives the clear that they are of the same side. Thomas said. Go on. White said with intrigue. As I have heard from Polonsky and one Mr. Byongchin, many of the unrecruited adventurers that the Apara Corporation wasn't able to sway to their pockets are walking around right now upset of the sudden new normal. Their motivation being of social disenfranchisement, right? The technocrat reasoned. Why not pretend we are one of these repressed folks? These Grey Order people can't just expect to know all of their members, right? He asked. Undercover work? Dasad asked. I know a little bit of faking a few things it but I am no field agent. Then perhaps some of our more integrated of your men colonel will suffice. Thomas turned to Polonsky. That sounds like a great idea. I have a few men in mind. We can find out what we should have found out by that way much more quietly. The man said. But much more slowly, White interjected. Even if we know how this attack will go, there is the problem of responding to it. The treaty for our forces still stands. Illusion magic, it exists here in this world is it not? Thomas asked. The governor nodded. Then how about we have a select group of our men? Become adventurous? A quick trip to the tailor, maybe a few prints of some fake armor, a bit of help from Asset Sakajuyu and Asset Pocahontas and fake some credentials here and there to walk around the streets and the guards and Kloviches. People will be none the wiser? Therefore, if our men can successfully sell this ruse, our men can have free reign to patrol Tyrian without the fear of any political reprisals. Even better, when at the night of the raid starts, we can reveal our undercover men's true colors and sting them before they can do anything unsavory. Thomas said, yes, we can even use them to scout out what lies ahead of us for the Major's offensive and the pacification campaign. Put them all into the process and voila all of this world's secret bare naked for our designs. Dasat shrugged his shoulders confidently. That could actually work. Polonsky smiled. Thank you for your wisdom minister. He gave his gratitude. As the inner circle nodded in agreement with Thomas' plan, Polonsky noticed that Holyfield was uncharacteristically quiet during the discussion. Normally he would be preaching fire and brimstone from his side of the table but strangely, all was silence as the Major looked at the maps of his projected Operation Haymaker strategies. Major. You have been studying earnestly. Polonsky nudged. Yes I am. There are just a few things bothering me about the plan everyone. I. It's best I share it. Holyfield said. Go on. White conceded. The mountain pass that connects the Principality to the Empire proper is too narrow for an army of the scale we need to ensure the operation's success would be too impractical if we just shove them through, we'll be playing right into the Empire's hands and use Little Hill as a strong point to deter any invasions, we can't hide them and the fortress would smell our offensive literally miles away, in addition to that obstacle. There is also our little entry point that we have just managed to secure through Souville. See here. Holyfield places his map down to the floor. A holographic screen emitted out of the smart pad detailing the map north of Souville. There was a road network that spiked north of Souville that connected the fertile Mediterranean city to the Empire's other territories north of their position. The road was situated between two bodies of water. A swamp situated inside the canyon-like system of eroded rocks by the east and the Dragatoi Ice Coast by the west. 
the red pieces on the map detail the Upfa of Haymaker, the Stla agents while blue is represented as the Ufi forces. Their army is split between two forces, Army Group West lead personally Major Holyfield will be consisting of mechanized marines and armored elements from the incoming 333rd Assault Division combined with the support of Aparo aligned mercenaries and half of the Aurora's airborne soldiers from the 119th taking position in Suville with their objective is to charge towards Herring Point and seize the city. Army Group East on the meanwhile shall be led by the colonel consisting of Polonsky's own colonial defense forces with motorized elements, the second half of the 119th Airborne Marines, the 53rd Engineering's Assault Engineers and a Mercenary Armored Brigade, the Steel Breakers. East's objective is to pincer attack Little Hill so it can be cut off from trying to break out and reinforce the softer but more sensitive strategic targets of Vercourt and New Argonia with the latter being the operation's ultimate prize. In addition to reinforcements, the youth will enjoy a second carrier group to enter the theater of war, Aurora's sister ship, the Tenacity. Scouts reported that this area here, called Mania's Bluff, despite giving the most convenient access and a clear road from Suville to Herring Point is plagued by soil erosion uneven terrain and several impassable areas. Most caravans need a guide to pass through this area safely and it is in the way for our mechanized thrust into the Imperial heartlands. This can also be used as a choke point if the Imperials decide to make a stand here. The Aurora doesn't have the operational capacity to airlift then redeploy my mechanized forces in a timely manner. We would have lost the element of surprise by then. But thanks to the minister, I got an idea. Holyfield said. Oh, wait. When did I? Thomas Sight shivered. The word undercover. Holyfield answered. For our plan to work the element of surprise and speed is key. We need to keep the enemy at places we want them to be so we can easily punch through them. Little Hill Fort is where they suspect us to be but the Empire would eventually know by now that we have a presence in Suville. We need to learn more of the land before we can proceed everyone. Especially if there are any magical surprises waiting for us. He explained. Speaking of magic major, what of Lieutenant Rose? Asset Lefe, have you forgot of her too? White asked. Of course not Governor, as we speak Project Twitchwood is underway and we are making contact with the Dwarven clans north of the Principality for leads on how to obtain Gyronite and Actocolite from them. Holyfield informed. A one Captain Mendozu is leading the expedition north as we speak and once, we can secure supplies. We will send out our engineers and Aparos to the location to build the Hecate suit immediately. Dr. Malona and his team are both eager and wary of the lieutenant's arcane potential can be. Weary? Thomas Sight inquired. His team does not know how much longer or how well they can contain Asset Lefe in her current state and Iris, Eliathro and King Martin can do so much. I say it is time and the party harness the powers of magic ourselves now. Lieutenant Rose will be our vanguard into this. Holyfield closed his fist in determination. So is Mania's bluff supposed to drove into or not? Polonsky raised his hand to ask after a careful observation of Haymaker's battle plans. Drove through, it is our highway into the nerve center of the Empire. Harren Point once with the 53rd Engineering pave a proper road for Army Group West to gun it to the capital in less than a day's tops. So have the 53rd build you. Your road so you can push the rest of the marines out of Suville straight to Herring Point and the rest of the job is to make the enemy think we will pour into Little Hill? White asked for confirmation. Correct. Besides, by the time the enemies have noticed what we just did we would have made it to New Gonia by now and beyond that is open tank country. We just need to make the enemy overcommit to that fortress and when the offensive begins, we trap all of them inside as we despoil wherever we please in the Stla Aegean's heartlands. Holyfield smiled. Impressive. But how do we set up army group east? White pressed. Brute force and containment power are what we need here rather than the speed of army group west. Again, we are not taking Little Hill but trapping the forces inside and slowly choke them out while they see their homes in front of them be eaten up by our forces which are now left undefended. Holyfield said, 
But didn't you say that the mountain pass leading to the Empire's lands is too impractical? Polonsky interjected to bring his point across. Who says we are using the mountain pass? It's obvious already but we are all going to land everyone here. Holyfield pointed to a remarkable piece of land southwest of Little Hill Fort. According to the map, there is supposed to be a thick foiling of forest trees in that vicinity. We can't land an army in a forest. White said. Then we remove the forest. Holyfield said. You are not saying that we will napalm the forest just to have a landing zone for army group east to move in. Polonsky protested. What of the people of Vercourt? That is not some trees we are burning but their livelihood and thousands of plants and animals homes there. Time is not on our side here people. Holyfield flailed in exclamatives. That forest must go or this invasion is dead in the water. He pointed out. But think of the ecological and economical damage we might invite when we do this. Vercourt is a lumber-centric settlement. I thought we come here in peace, not as marauders? Polonsky pointed. You bring good points to you too. The governor placed his hands on the table to mediate. Indeed, you do, Thomas added. We have to make the landing but we must also account what damages we will inflict and, in my experience, I am a believer who must give just as much as he takes. There has to be a compromise between total annihilation of an entire ecologic economic relationship between the natives. The governor defended his position. It would be waste for such flora and fauna to go up in smoke. For what? One empire's hubris? Unfair. From a scientific perspective, is there a way to preserve them while still being able to get our strategic insertion into the empire's heartlands? Thomas asked. Now that you mentioned it sir, Polonsky scratched his chin. I can send some SOG teams there and capture some of those life forms if it makes a suitable compromise. That is within acceptable parameters Colonel, the governor nodded, know this again Polonsky, your team has only one week starting tomorrow to rescue whatever you can. When the time is up, I am burning that forest down until all is just ash. Holyfield reaffirmed. Still, burning it down? I mean, the animals and plants there will be saved, but what are the people? It will still be the apocalypse for them. Polonsky said. I thought you were the people person here. Holyfield asks. Just focus on boxing all of the natives into a safe place and wait for this pointless war of theirs to blow over. Don't even hesitate to use any measures necessary to keep them away from our advancing troops. New Argonia must be captured at all cost. I see, I will make sure of it. You make sure you do your part and keep this mess under control. Polonsky quietly nodded with his own return fire of words. Then it is concluded. Governor White adjourned. Dash. Are you sure we should attempt this once again? Emperor Alden inquired to Grandmaster Owen. We need to find the other three chosen ones and we needed them. Yesterday my lord. Grandmaster Owen. A clandestine congregation of the Empire's top mages in the College of Magi in Herring Point was quietly yet quickly rallying to the Great Hall. Like the last time such a gathering had occurred, taking center stage was the mirror of Ancelus, the artifact with a now personal history for the Grand Master Owen as for months before. He was left visually impaired by its awesome power as he attempted a dangerous spell into peeking through the future. What the last saw was, however, not of a bright new sun gleaming over a glowing new slayer but of its ashen death by the hands of the returning demon straight from the legends themselves. Although his advisors, fellow faculty and even his personal physician recommended against it, the Grand Master volunteered to wield the mirror once again. This time, his objective was much more concrete and his previous experience in conducting similar rituals beforehand. Faith Len, known as Gweninger, the Bane, may be first of the Chosen Ones but the Sacred Crystal Heart says of two more Chosen Ones that is destined to save the world. One known as Istsigol, the Scholar and the other Ranupata, the Shareholder, but they are of unknown name and even likeness to them. The Empire needs, no, must find these individuals and rally them to their cause before all is too late. The other two brands that the heart bestowed flew in such a great velocity that not even the Empire's best scouts could keep up. Grandmaster Rowan, however, has proposed a rather modest solution. 
The plan is to use the mirror of Ancelus again to perform a less expeditious version of the clairvoyance spell. Instead of transversing time and space to see of events forthcoming to pass, he will instead use the spell to scry through his own cerebrum and then focus his mind to the clairvoyance ritual channel to get the answers or at the very least a hint of what Owen desires the most. The identity of the chosenists Ikol and Ranu Pruta. Hope they are much more modest than Faith Len. Alden commented. Emperor Alden shared great optimism for the Grand Master's plan as the discovery and the eventual retrieval of the two other chosen ones will greatly bolster the chances of the Empire weathering this crisis. He needs to address the nobles and the commoners' fears after the rumors of Faith Len's imperiousness was leaked throughout the realm. He was most excited for the Ranuprata, the shareholder as he believes that this individual, whose name is synonymous with selflessness, will be a much more noble individual to handle compared to the plebeian that is Faith Len. No, March of Garmhaik. Even the Istsigol, the scholar shared promise too. Perhaps his wisdom would be invaluable in these trying times for Gleesia. You know, you remind me of that time when I presented Istris and Arthurfa's tutor. Owen badgered. I want them all to be modest to him you said. The Emperor's heart skipped a beat upon the Grand Master's words. Ever since the arising of this demon crisis, he had forgotten to check on his children Princess Istris and Prince Arthurfa, such is the blessed curse of having the luxury of attendants and servants to look after them most especially Istris. There could never be any other better example of polar opposites than Estrus and Arthurfa. While Estrus vigorous, Arthurfa is sedentary. While Estrus aspires to be a great warrior in battle, Arthurfa prefers to be in the confines of the debative forums. While Estrus is impassioned into the now, Arthurfa is quixotic of the future. Nonetheless, the twins were still close to each other when it comes to living within the confines of the palace. They were however of fifteen years olds each due to their twin births, who were born quite later than normal for an average adult at around thirty-five years old when the Emperor and his consort Lysitia bore them into the world. He used to be very busy back in his early reign as the Emperor often neglecting his family. Perhaps Elden should take a break just for one moment to spend with her and the twins after this ritual is over. His men were already working tirelessly to see that the Empire restores to what it should be and paranoia is starting to get the better of him. It would be good for the Psyche to remind him of something much closer to his heart that he is fighting for. Everyone places. Owen announced to the crowd as the congregation of mages scrambled to their assigned seats. The most venerable of mages were closest to the mirror whilst the intermediates with experience in channeling magics were farther away and that leaves the non-mages such as Elden himself, the Cadfriagan Elang and the Argliwadi Cyphraith plus delegates, from his elevated booth. The Emperor can see Owen descend upon the amassed congregation to the center stage where the crystalline artifact, second in prominence to the sacred crystal heart lay for all eyes in the room to see. Upon setting his two feet before its base, the mages insufflate their courage for one hesitated moment before they enact the perilous endeavor. Om. Owen initiated pre-channeling meditation. His vocal strumming followed by the raising of his magic staff was followed suit by the rest of the mages. Glowing blue light of mana began to surge out of the mages' bodies as their collective channeling empowered the mirror of Ancelus to be activated in a luminous white light. After the articulative prompting of one of his constituents, the Grand Master himself approached the artifact and placed his hand upon it. Immediately, the enchantment's energy surged within his body as he felt he had become one with the winds. To tell the truth, he felt like he had the powers of a god. Yet unfortunately due to his human flaws, his power is temporary. He refocused himself as Owen reminded himself of why he allowed himself into this ethereal state. To begin with, he began to think hard within himself. The one or in this case, the two things he desires right now. Ranuprata and Detzisi Gol. As the idea conceptualizes into his head, the mirror of Ancelus clairvoyant abilities surge and new Ashenic energies bombarded his mind. Once he was with the Ethereum, the winds of magic now he feels he is one with all living beings. Already, like a hound's nose perked to hunt its prey. Owen scry far and wide for the chosen brands of the shareholder and the scholar. It was however, 
Despite expeditiously searching every inch of everything's and all's minds he had a hard time finding them. He can hear the heads and thoughts of his mages within the room they share tenant in ranging from doubt, hope and anticipation. As he scries outward of the capital, he can hear the thoughts of merchants bartering, mourners crying and children frolicking. The Grand Master, as time passes can feel his cerebrum starting to get overwhelmed by the bombardment of thoughts flooding into his mind, but Hoin willed himself to persevere. He needs to find these chosen ones before all is lost again. Pushing back the noise of the insignificant rabble of the world, Owen reached out east, past the farmlands and granaries of the Empire's hearth, past the trading hub of New Orgonia, past the rolling hills and waking seas of Suville until finally, he had reached his limit, but as all hope began to feel lost, Owen heard a faint, a small speck of dust of the two words he is familiar with. I am Ranu Pritta, the shareholder. I was given magic. A faint feminine voice lulled Owen, almost relieving him for a second of the mental overload. At Zisigol, meaning scholar, I will unlock the secrets of the ether. A deep masculine voice echoed. Owen tried to reach out to these voices but the closer he tries to wade through the sea of thoughts, the more his mind reached its breaking point. Owen in desperation, reached out to the neural synapses of the source of where this Ranuprata woman and Astisic old man, upon touching each of their synapses, his cerebrum reached his limit and Owen's psychic line with mirror of Ancelus was broken, the neural feedback snapped back like the returning recoil of a stretched band as Grandmaster Owen collapses under the floor to the alarm of all of the congregation. Several of his colleagues held him up as Owen mumbled incessantly with a drooping lip. Emperor Alden descended to the stage as he pushed aside the mages to reach his trusted confidant. Owen, were you able to find out? Alden asked pleadingly. Ranu Pritta, Owen yelled, saliva drooling from his fractured mind. Samantha Rose. What? Alden asked. Estacy Gull, Owen yelled again now bumbling like a mad beggar in a slum. David Malona. Are they? Alden pressed further. Was he speaking of the brand holders' names? Ranu Pritta. Samantha Rose. Estacy Gall. David Malona. Owen repeatedly mumbled. I, I see. Alden concluded, now in concert with what Owen had discovered. The Emperor of the Slaeagen Empire then turned to his right hand. His Prime Minister, set up a bounty for all. Whoever can find me and bring to my palace these ones, a Samantha Rose and a David Malona will be blissfully rewarded. They are the chosen ones, Alden ordered. Yes my lord, but forgive me, how can we find these names? I do not recall any of these names being something within our own or any other tongues I know of, the Prime Minister said. Well, in my experience. The one named Malona is an eastern desert name by the sound of it. I know of the root word of Mahail meaning plentiful from those deserts so maybe try searching east. The city states there do favor a scholar such as the Astisigal's caliber. Alden said. What of this Samantha? The shareholder? The prime minister asked. The southern frontier where our colonies used to be. The word Samhain is an uncommon name for the women there so we could try to focus our search to southeast of us beyond Tyrian. Alden searched his inner library of knowledge of Zanigrad's history into action. Beyond Tyrian? But that is where the demons are located, the Prime Minister exclaimed. Then how about we motivate the searches with this? 100,000 ducats for the one who brings me the two chosen ones. Emperor Alden decreed. The room gasped. One hundred thousand ducats was enough to buy an entire castle and a township for oneself in comparison. It can also buy a fleet of galleons, a half decade's supply of mana crystals or even the services and production of some mythically hard to craft weapons and armors, specifically of the materials of gyronite and dactocolite. Each, Alden added. There was no hesitation upon hearing the Emperor's words after that. Like fire, his decree from the sanctums of the College of Magi began to spread about to the Empire. Now there are the two hopes dangling upon the names of Samantha Rose and David Malona. Dash. Ranu Prata and Astisi Gull, I wonder what they may look like? Olera wondered. She was bubbly upon the early part of their excursion out of the capital after a very flower-covered parade through its streets as well-wishers blessed them for a fruitful heroic quest. Faith Lengarm Hayek, 
The bane of demons, still couldn't get over the fact of his newborn status. He fancied and basked on the glorious images of his accompanying retinue that he was blessed to receive. The silvery armored legionnaires, the majestic knights, the opulent mages, mercenary skirmishes of various forms of reaches and all the rest were at his side. By the accounts of Marchog Fawn, Faithlen's retinue is over 500 strong of combatants with about over 100 of support workers ranging from doctors, surgeons, cooks, blacksmiths, armorers, foragers, hunters, camp followers and alchemists to provide all the items and services that soldiers cannot live without. There was also money left within the allowance that Emperor Alden gave to Faithlen to allow expansion when the need arises but from that point on, the rest of maintaining his finances was up to his own merits. Olera was assigned to be closest to Faithlen's side about two formations from the vanguard providing academic counsel and soothsaying to the chosen one, the small army's destination to is the city of Mountson, a human and dwarf and influenced city below the Rock Mountains base, there they will meet a contact from the miners guild of the dwarven clan Kerfold her who will hand them over the gyronite and actocolite materials that Faithlen and his men will need to arm themselves properly for the fight against the demons. They do not sound too exciting. Their scholar and the shareholder, Faithland scoffed. I am the one with the will and the bronze to defeat all of the demons. So, you should stand back and let me take all of the fightings, he flexed. Oh, don't be so cocky. I may be glad you are at our side now but if you are to combine your strength with the bearers of the brand of Ranupata and Astisi Gol our forces would be able to bring down the invaders. Olera counseled. Pa. A scholar is too weak to fight a damn cub with what? His pen? The sword is mightier than that. Faithland spat. And their shareholder? What kind of name is that anyway? What can he share? If it is not power then it is no use to me and this army. After all of Faithland's hubristic boast, Olera began to feel upset being under the young man's presence. He doesn't know how to count his blessings well and yet he still boasts that he needs no help from the other two missing chosen ones. You do realize I too am a scholar like the Astisigal, Faith Len, Olera reprimanded. Knowledge can be used to help people and improve society. Be silent Lufi sad. What can you do but speak in tongues and learn to write? You know nothing of us common folk. All you do all day is read 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 and talk talk talk. Fury rise this and concept that. Faith Len mocked. The world needs more hard strong men like me where might, will and bravery prevails. Wars are not won by words, but through blood and guts. Scholars are only good as scribes to record all heroics and romance. You dim-witted peasant. Olayra lunged at Faith Len. Quiet children all of you. Carly intervened. The white mage gently pushed the two quarreling young ones away from each other just as Olayra was about to claw Faithlen with her ink-stained hands. How dare you try to assault the chosen one? Faithlen scornfully shouted. How dare you belittle me and people like me little fish? Olayra stuck her tongue out and walked off. Little fish? Faithlen was left dumbstruck by the scholar girl's statement. It had been a long time since anyone had called him the nickname. About around the time he was still yet to have the first strands of puberty hit him, among his circle of friends, Faith Len was for a long time, was the first of his generation of children from Clairvuyite to learn how to swim. Most villagers his age and even grown adults have a hard time swimming around the lake and river nearby his home. That is how he was called by everyone for a while the term little fish for his aquatic prowess. Visolera. A girl just about his age was one of his old playmates, Faithlen. Chosen one, you do not behave like that. Carlyle scolded. I, I, Faithlen crumbled. These people that have rallied under your banner deserves some respect. Besides, the scholar girl is right. By the time we finish arming our army here we need to find Ranuprata and Astisigal soon. These men are fighting with you so they can see their families and homes tomorrow and you are just there belittling them because they aren't chosen like you, Carlyle said. The boy's pretentious attitude was getting into her nerves being struck violently like an archer in the heat of a battle. I know. Faith Len sunk his head. You are right, Hua. 
Meter the crow halted her horse. She had been galloping from the opposite direction from where the scouts of Faithland's army were busy studying and then immediately reporting upon the terrain. Crow master, something to report I assume? Marcher Grashinus asked. Indeed, I just heard from a nearby Grey Order office that they have a quest that should test Faithland's metal for the first time. Meter bowed. Oh, a quest? My very first quest. Faithland smiled. Indeed. The quest giver, the town's sheriff said that there is an evil sorcerer that has been giving a plague curse to his town and you must help him get rid of him and he will pledge some supplies for us and some brave men to our army. Meter nodded. Sounds perfect for you to get some action. Grashness nodded. Maybe just have you, me, Petcher, Findrum and Carlyle accompany you to the villain's lair and let's see what that brand of yours can do. Shall we boy? The old knight proposed. He had always been a great mentor for the newly dubbed knight as Faithland can attest. Teaching him the codes of chivalry, wearing plate armor by himself without the aid of a squire and teaching him how to ride the very white horse he saddled himself atop of. Still, that Ole were a girl that he belittled, he couldn't get out of his mind. He never recalled a girl named Olaira in his childhood, but there were several girls back in Clairvuite who shared her chilly personality and brunette hair. He will have to when he has the time to spare, walk up and apologize to her and make up, dash. Upon the stately halls of the Royal Elven Palace of the Eth Island on Daunt, a gathering was organized, but instead of the sophisticated tunes and nightly party chatter that often give the man suppressedigious honor if one is invited to its legendary balls was instead the antithetical description. No colorful banners. No flowers raining lively like the spring rising nor the attendees came in a rainbow palette of party wear. Instead, the palace held a more melancholic aura. Visitors and tenants of the opulent manse remained silent as they dressed in mono-ebony robes to pick their aching. For starting today, as the Luther's decree shall be a month of mourning for their youngest child, Princess Aliathro had died officially by being killed by the demons. Outside the royal palace was no different as the Eth Island capital's streets, once alive with activity had effectively ceased operations for the duration of this time of lamentation. Aliathre's funeral took place at the palace's private dock where the Lethar's personal galleon, used by the family for tours across all of Gleesia, was made room to accommodate scores of nobles and visiting dignitaries who wished to pay their respects and solidarity to the bereaved family. Under traditional funerary rites, Aliathre's hyperbolic corpse would enjoy a public wide visitation with incense burnings and mummification, but due to never founding her body, the secondary funerary ritual, one designed for such an occasion would suffice. Aliathre's personal belongings ranging from dresses, a few of her childhood trinkets, a saddle, articles of jewelry of both magical and non-magical nature, her academy uniform and finally her first magical staff. In addition to the princess memorial service, King Aslinidor was generous enough to also allow a collective memorial service for the dead Sapphide Liad staff who died in Suville to be sent off with military honors in the same vein how Aliathra's sent off is constructed, a large makeshift galleon filled with all of their cherished belongings with Aliathra's spot taking the frontmost point of the ship was made with a haphazard not seaworthy structure in addition to being pre-doused in flammable oil. The reason being that the ship was purely symbolic as the rite intends that after getting a good distance from the gathered mourners, an archer, in this case, Prince Valorian, Aliathra's brother would shoot a flaming arrow to the ship to set it alight. The boat heading off to sea and its ignition has two meanings, the former, being the journey onwards to the afterlife for Aliathra, the deceased Sephide Liad. Ambassador Thelanil and the embassy staff, while the latter is to help purify the soul, clean of mind and clarity of consciousness. As for the standard cremation rites of the elves, officially as the story goes, Aliathra's death alongside the Sephide Liad, rainbow helms and elite warriors that were sent to Suville had died at the hands of the demons. However, only the royal family, Marxian, Lindis, and a select upper echelons of the Eth Island's ruling class know the true story. Aslenidor swore that he will, to avenge his daughter. 
expend as much as he can to the slay agents once he has been given the time to shed a tear for his loss, and it is rare for him to even express any emotion outside of stoicism as his close confidants can testify. The two surviving siblings, Aliathra to them, despite being a darling to the public they knew she was ultimately a pawn in the grand scheme of things. Her destiny, unlike Valorian, becoming the new patriarch with a prestigious position in the Earth Island military circles and the Athel becoming the new queen of all of the Earth Island elves. Aliathra's fate was to be married off to House Cyanidal to bear strong heirs and assist in the ruling of their entitled lands. But for Queen Elisvn, the most intrepid and the eldest of the Lethra family, she was all at fault. Aliathra, my sweet Aliathra. The Queen Mother wailed as she blew her tears and clogging from her napkin. I shouldn't have let you go to Zanagad to perish and be damned like this by forces of darkness. I am so sorry my poor daughter. I killed you. I damned you. She cried unceasingly for all of the elven nobility to see. Enough Elisun. No number of tears from you can bring our Aliathra back. King Aslanidor said to his queen. But it was your idea to send her out in the world and gain some worldly experience before you could accept her back home fully as a mature and proper lady, Elusivn argued. Well, it was your idea to send her to Zanagrad when he could have sent her to the border, King Aslanidor, very publicly, argued back. She should meet new peoples, see other cultures, there is more to life out there than here. Elusivn returned fire. Mother, father, stop this now, not here in front of everyone. Ithiel, also known by her human nickname, Lune from Mediated. Now is not the time to argue on who is at fault and it's neither your fault. The demons, the other world as they killed Aliathra not you, she pointed out. Either way, Aliathra was incredibly reckless to go confront these demons on her own. The Sephid Liad aren't meant to be fighting armies out in the open like that, as much as mother's fault for sending dear sister to the belly of the beast like that, Ali is equally to be blamed for allowing herself to be killed when she should have easily succeeded. Valorian interjected. Well, well, an ominous voice echoed above them startling the Lethas and the funeral attendees. Who is there? Show yourself, Aslanidor challenged. It's me again. Ambassador Razor at your service and in your presence once again, the voice said. A humanoid figure appeared before them by the dock's windows and with a grand spectacle that was an entrance that resulted in the window's destruction that he appeared before the gathering of elves, the royal guards, the rainbow helmets immediately formed circle to protect the surviving members of the Lythra family as the uninvited figure readied his voice. You never cease to entertain me and the Midnight Camarilla, Razor said. A funeral turned into a family squabble, between the royals no less. He scoffed at them. The Black Tree Pact, the ruling class of the estranged kin of the Earth Island Elves are run by a council of twenty individuals known as the Midnight Camarilla due to their physical table that they hold their in-person meetings on was made from the same ebony tree that the Black Tree Pact was formed on. Each chairperson of the Camarilla controls a certain aspect of the Black Tree Pact's nationhood ranging from the military, the navy, agriculture, industry, and etc. The Camarilla's seats are descendants of the original twenty elven lords who broke away from the Earth Island Entente many centuries ago. Officially, there is no ambassador for the Black Tree Pact due to the bad blood between the two conflicting elven nations. Razor, was just only accepted into the Earth Island society barely by the fact that he is the messenger between Earth Island and the Black Tree Pact hence is an unofficial title as the ambassador, although for Razor's own insistence, the term he prefers is the more frightening mouth. Why are you here Razor? How dare you come here at such a hurtful day especially as you are not invited here? Aslenidor said to the Black Tree Ambassador. Why should I need an invitation? Razor shrugged, as the mouth of the Midnight Camarilla. I am merely doing my duty as the Camarilla says to pay final respect to the royal princess whose life was oh so cut off prematurely because of her not so proper combat skills against the demon horde, unlike her very own daughter Valtara. Do not compare my daughter to that bloodthirsty whore. Queen Elisivn curbed the messenger. I am just saying the hard truth. Razor defended, 
Don't be so tense your highness. Our way is obviously the stronger way compared to your softness and so-called enlightenment. The humans were fools to not request our help. We are the conqueror of many lands so we know to exactly deal with these barbarians. The human and other races like the dwarves would suffer dearly against these so-called other world as if they didn't seek our help instead. The nobles began to rumor monger at this slight crack in the royal family's aura of prestige. This failure, brought to light by the Black Elf, was now a stain to Athilan's honor. In their shared history, the Black Tree Pact was the more daring of the elven demographics. Able to keel over many lands and peoples through intimidation economic might of several world-breaking strategic resources such as the majority of Alphalnora's star metal and Steinef wood, their charismatic leadership that allows their core people's loyal cohesion and their intimidation through economic charisma. If that wasn't enough, they can always send their armies of heavily armed and well-versed in the arts of mass slaughter soldiers, assassins, archers and monstrous beasts to your lands to demonstrate their superior ways. One can ask the Yejgung and the Nagada for their first-hand experiences with the Black Tree Pact. What do you really want Razor? Valorian asked. Sit back and watch as we, the Black Tree Pact wash you all away like the waves eroding the stone. We will prove to you that the humans and other younger races need to be grateful to us not to you, he boasted. Your nurturing ways has only made the younger races fat and decadent, too kind-hearted for the burdens of the ruling. Take a look at yourselves. Your princess fell to the demon because she was not strong enough. If she was every little bit of a warrior like Valdara and you King Aslanidor and Queen Elisivan was as assertive as the twenty she would never end up dead. Razor smugly smiled. What makes you think the Empire would listen to you of all people? Queen Elisivan asked. As we speak, the Midnight Camrilla has already sent an expeditionary force of our armies with the help of Tavai mercenaries to Zanagrad right at this moment. We will offer our blade to the kin of Kuldelst Lae just as the pact's forefathers that your grandfather had oh so denied their duly reward centuries ago. The army will best the demons so well in combat that the Empire will prostrate to us in our superior ways. They will choose as their new patrons and the elves will finally claim their rightful place as shepherds of this world, unlike you soft guts. He belittled them. Get out. Queen Elisivan flailed her arms wanting to see this condescending messenger be banished from her sight. Her heart cannot take it. Talk so proud all you want black and one. But tell your treasonous skin and their armies that based on the report of the Cephyliad, the other worlders must not be underestimated. King Aslanidor raised his fist. Be yourself Ethylan, at least I struck a nerve today and that is all that matters today. Do not come crying to me when the Empire and the rest of Gleesia comes to me for patronage and not you. I shall take my leave. Razor disappeared. My lord, we cannot allow the Black Tree Pack to humiliate us like this. Valorian said. Indeed, we should allow the give only our best might to the Empire in fighting against the demons. Queen Elisivan pleaded, Aliathra may be dead but I personally volunteer to lead the finest regiments of rainbow helms, sword sinners, glade hearth knights, war dancers, and rangers to assist the empire and end this demonic threat both to avenge her and our family's honor. Valorian palmed his hand and saluted with a bow. My son, you must not. Elisivan tried to stop her maverick child but her husband cut her off. If we do not stop them in Zanagrad first. Then they will come for us next my dear. We must remind the world once again our might. Aslenidor said. Indeed, we can stay here and continue to watch our traitorous kin to the west lest they may be opportunity to ignite old vengeance. If Eel supported her father. Please before you go. One of the nobles pushed his way through the royal family only to be stopped by their bodyguards. But the Lethors weren't alarmed for the man that haphazardly rushed towards them was someone familiar to them. The Lord of Cyanidal and Aliathras would have been groomed to be Sir Linda. Cyanidal province where the city of Aiagroth, nicknamed Arsenal is situated in. Famed for their arcane smithies and woodworks creating the elves' best weapons, armor and ships across the land. Additionally, Sir Linda was a childhood friend of the royal scions of the Lethors. My lord, 
I feel like I still owe you something despite our arrangement together being unceremoniously broken due to extra fortuitous calamity, I gift you this, Linda presented, it was meant to be my dowry for her, presented to him was the file of potential, only very few of these items existed throughout the world and House Cyanidal closely guards its secrets from even the Sapphide Liad and the royal family, it is said when induced with certain kinds of liquid, the file's magical properties can transmute the liquid into something much more useful for the intrepid user, for example, water can become a stamina potion, wine can become a healing potion. The extract from a healing plant can become a cure-all antidote plus many more. The file of potential. I thought you cyanidals keep this for your best warriors only. Valorian's eyes widened. I wanted to give this alien through myself at more sanguine of days as I believe she would use it for good when she comes to my side in ruling cyanidal. But now, I believe you need this more than she does. Do it for her, in memory of our friendship together. Linda said. I thank you. Valorian nodded. You can also count on my support too. Sheila, the wife of the late ambassador to Suville, Thelanil stood up. She too was joined by the families of the deceased elves who perished in Suville. They were no warriors or soldiers but they would gladly give material support if it means vengeance as Valorian can attest. The elven prince turned to his family, now seeing the fire in his eyes and with cold determination gave their blessing to him as soon as their eyes locked. The young prince, the only son of King Aslenidor and Elsivan, middle child of the three royal siblings is a young-blooded but accomplished in his own right general of the elven armies raised his sword to the ceiling to salute to the conquest god Yu Idol and to his twin sister the defender goddess Kana for their blessing. He specializes in drilling his troops to compact themselves into tight and impregnable formations ranging from circles, squares, tortoise, and shield wall formations for infantry, wedges and diamonds for cavalry too in addition to the arcane force multiplication of his mages. Rally the houses. Valorian roused. The F Island elves march for war. To Sena Graduigo. He leads. Dash. Tokyo. The capital of Japan was a city of contrasts as Clovich can testify, there were similar crystal spires that littered the metropolis streets, yet there were also these regional styles, in low of the traditional Japanese style as his guide pointed out also inhabiting the city streets. According to Miss Isabel's explanations, although the Japanese were a modern thinking people, there were still some remnants of their olden days that they keep around and maintained for centuries. This resilience of traditions yet still progressive thinking that these islanders display intrigues him. As he disembarked the Hanjin Shibuzawa ultrajet that he had boarded with his entourage he was gifted with a flowery welcome by the locals with warm welcoming smiles. They waved a flag of pure white with an oversized crimson dot at its centerpiece and no more wild banners that say welcome, otherworlder. From up above him. Some of the people who greeted him wore robes similar to the style of the Yejgung or Fox Folk as he remembered dealing with a trader from the region but of a more compact result to form fit their bodies as the difference shows. The Imperial Herald, Sir Masa Nakamura guided the prince to an awaiting vehicle that paraded him across Tokyo streets triumphantly. He had never seen such jubilation for the arrival of someone such as himself could see. All eyes were on him as he arrived to his destination. A great white castle, surrounded by a moat with black tiled roofs were before him with a bridge similarly designed by one other bridge in connects the main entrance between him and the actual castle. Upon crossing the bridge, he find himself at the castle's entrance door, it was not grand nor functional in terms for defense but was merely for show instead. Does this emperor not care for his own protection? As he stood there to think about what this meeting with this silent emperor could entail for him and Tyrion's future, the gate slide sideways opens revealing a man and a woman dressed in more opulent versions of the traditional robes apparently native to Japan. The male wore a bicolored robe that flowed down to his knees. The garment's color is of orange and white made of shimmering silk. With the betrayal of light had a few faint designs that tickled the prince's eyes. 
The male also wore a headdress that grew a slight bump on his short black hair with what looks like a needle or two nails hammered across opposite sides of a large tongue like appendage reaching out a few inches upwards. For the female, she wore a much more sophisticated dress, one of a thick, baggy and longer length of garments compared to the male with the contrasting color of red and orange being her choice of wear for this occasion. She wore her hair back to accommodate a three-pronged golden tiara that reached out several inches adorned with smaller separate pieces of gold too. Strangely enough, only the woman had jewelry on her person. Was the woman the emperor and the male her consort? Was Japan a matriarchal society? The male walked forward, while his female counterparts stayed behind in reserve. The orange-dressed man humbly bowed down to Clovich as he finally stood face to face with the otherworldly prince. I am Emperor Shinaru. Welcome to Japan, the man said. He rose back up from his bow and briefly looked at the Tiraiani prince with his own two eyes. You have my ancestors' eyes. Emperor Shinaru complimented. Chapter 39, Branching Out Miss Kadahagan. A pleasure to have you here again. Colonel Polonsky welcomed the vampire witch to his office. It was a modest room with spaciousness and tranquility in mind for the Colonial Defense Forces commander. A pleasure for summoning me. Iris smiled. You brought me here for some new issue that requires my attention? The vampire witch wasted no time getting to business. Of course, let us focus on the present, shall we? Lieutenant Samantha Rose, has her training reached satisfactory achievement? The colonel asked. Indeed, La Dewey Rose has proven to be a prodigious student, able to diligently practice her techniques with discipline and this is coming from someone like myself, Iris answered. Unsurprising for a West Point graduate, they have taught her well. The colonel remarked. You are no teacher though. Polonsky cross-referenced Tyrus. A slight chide from his tone reverberated on his frugal chamber. I mean as a such air fill. Iris corrected. So, Polonsky furloughed his eyebrow. That is what we are called, at least by the Inquisitors. Our vampirism and our extraordinary gift of magic and all. It means they whose blood has been gifted. Iris explained. Oh, I get it. So that's what you are called. Polonsky nodded. He remembers the details of King Martin, Iris Lich of grandfather's efforts on attaining power for himself and his next of kindred. Artificially bestowing the power to be able to cast magic, a fitting but marred name due to its malicious origins. That does remind me. When is the happening with La Dewey Rose's special garments coming together? She asked. Right now, I have some men obtaining the materials for Samantha's Hecate suit as we speak by the Asterix. He answered. Hecate? What does Hecate mean? Iris asked. From our myths actually, Polonsky chuckled. You know, you are about to say again, but you are like gods. You gods can have myths? I would have said that. Iris chuckled back. Hey, everyone is getting used to it now to you Iris. Me included. He clicked. But anyways, about Hecate. She is the ancient goddess of our world or at least from a place called Greece whose domain would fall into magic witchcraft, nighttime, moons, ghost, and necromancy. I mean, we barely have a box for appropriate names to label everything you know and Hecate has a kick to it. The colonel explained, how come I wasn't called Hecate? This mythological goddess of yours would be a more appropriate name for me than Sacagawea. She humored. Well Hecate didn't translate in entire languages to some people who didn't have a clue or context to the language. Your name Sakagawea was more than a match for your uses for us, he heartily answered. Who is this Sakagawea a woman you speak of so much about me? The witch inquired. A lady who in our history guided a group of adventurers through a foreign land which that she was a native of. You are like her because you are doing exactly the same thing she was with those adventurers, Polonsky laconically explained. That is a most intriguing tale. Iris gave her remarks but was Saka a witch like me? She asked. Touche. The colonel wiggled his finger blithely. Two of what? Iris asked. It's a word when we say that someone gave me a good argument over something. Basically, you have a point Iris but we can't change it no more. Just stick to being called Saka for now oh, okay my dear? Polonsky asked. I can live with it as long as you can guarantee me and my grandfather's protection. Iris reaffirmed. 
Of course, your skills, are most welcome to us. Which reminds me of the other reason why I have called you here. Polonsky removed his reading glasses, but just as he was about to divulge the subject, his office door was barged open as a frantic communications officer carrying with him a rugged military-grade laptop on his person. Explain yourself, officer, Polonsky soured his voice to address the unexpected guest. Apologies Colonel, but I got an urgent call from Captain Mendoza and Jaguar Group. The officer explained his intrusion. The Astorok team? Are they in trouble? Polonsky asked. His face paled into concern. No. They say that they have discovered something that requires immediate attention. The officer then proceeded to lay the laptop on Polonsky's desk as he flickered with the glowing buttons to open up the computer's windows. A flurry of images of rocky mountainous terrain lay bare before the colonel as he studied the recordings of various mediums, ranging from video, audio and visual yet strangely no live person-to-person -person talk with the Jaguar group's leader. Previously, the captain was a sergeant but after a few brief instances of exceptional leadership skills he was promoted to the current position he has held now today. Jaguar Group discovered a caravan of gyronite and actocolite being shipped down the mountains heading west to where the Empire is, the officer explained. I see. What if Captain Mendoza and Jaguar Group? Polonsky asked, questioning the lack of live communications. He went dark but the laser designations are still live so it's best we can presume they are still combat effective. They request a strike team deployed with Super Ospreys to take down and steal the merchandise, the officer said. Merchandise? Stealing Gyronite and Actocolite from the Dwarves and the Empire? That is a declaration of war. Iris exclaimed. The other two men in the room ignored the native woman's consideration as the elephant in the room was still yet to be fully addressed. How was Mendoza able to find this? Polonsky asked. Mirian's old home clan hold, or city, as we would call it of Nankarim, has many interconnected mining guilds across the Isleroks, as you know. The mountain range is a rich mineral deposit with gyronite and actocolite being one of the most lucrative resources in the market throughout Gleesia. With some coercion, we were able to know the location of the caravan and have already taken a position following it. They even got how much of the stuff is being shipped out to, the officer informed. How much? Polonsky asked. About 200 ingots of each sir, the officer replied. Polonsky deliberated for a moment. He knew that this is an opportunity to secure said resources that Dr. Malona needs for his experiments with Samantha but he also knew that going forth with this plan means no going back for any means of peaceful dialogue with the natives. But then again, as Polonsky can detest, 400 ingots of gyronite and actocolite are a lot of materials and Malona only needs just a dozen kilograms worth of each of those two minerals to make the Hecate suit. These ingots had no other uses for the common Gleesian outside of outfitting master-crafted weapons and armor. It was already an obvious choice the moment you had heard of the volume of cargo being shipped. You heard the captain. Get me the next available strike team with a Super Osprey wings to fly off at Jaguar Group's location. Orders are to secure an entirety of that shipment. Tell Captain Mendoza he will get the help that he needs. Revive live communications with him at the stat now, Polonsky ordered. Affirmative sir. The communication officer saluted and made his exit. Sir Polonsky, do you know of the consequences of what you just ordered your men to do? Iris charmingly giggled. It's called asset denial back in the academy Iris. I know of the consequences and I will take it. He sighed. Ms. Kadahagan, you do know that the Slay Agents and their allies are gearing up to come here and slaughter everyone in Tyrian for this stupid prophecy of theirs? The vampire which confirmed quietly. Me and the rest of the high table with the governor, the major and the minister have decided that a good defense against them is a good offense to stop them permanently. Which is what I was about to ask you to help us do the opposite, Polonsky said. I beg your pardon? Iris couldn't believe what the colonel just said, the opposite of what she had just said. The Federation wants to march their troops to the Empire. I did not stutter Iris, 
the Federation is planning a grand offensive against the Empire. Remember what Thomas Sight said about what they do to threats. Polonsky reminded, what they cannot control, they will destroy. Iris repeated the minister's words. Exactly. Polonsky nodded. Let me spare you the long story as you probably know by now that we can have men swarming the Empire's heartlands in about a week with their legions dead or scattered, the colonel said. In a matter of days? How? The Empire is vast and has many soldiers in garrisoning many forts and settlements. Iris asked. It's called Blitzkrieg or Lightning War Miskodahagan. It is the military doctrine to describe a method of offensive warfare designed to strike a swift, focused blow at an enemy using mobile, maneuverable forces, including armored tanks and air support. Such an attack ideally leads to a quick victory, limiting the loss of soldiers and artillery. Believe me, the party knows conflict is inevitable and they wish to start it and end it fast hence the name of our grand task is called Haymaker. Polonsky explained. That is an odd title. A haymaker is just a job as serf does to cut feed for farm animals. It lacks challenge, some charm to it. Iris furloughed. In our world, haymaker, named after the scything motion that those serfs do mean a punch that is struck so hard that it is the potential to knock someone out in one swift blow, Polonsky explained. Interesting. Iris nodded with an amused smile. I can imagine that motion. Many others tried to fight the Empire and failed miserably. The Dawson, the Suzerainities, the Southern Tribes, the Orcs, the Tavai and my grandfather included. But knowing you and the Federation, well, I have no reason not to believe you for a people who can create miniature suns and cross the world in one day. She chided. You're getting the picture now? Good. You should have no love for the Empire are you not? Polonsky asked. They killed my father and forced me and my fellow such airfield to hide for their lives. I have no love for them for I wish to see the Inquisition be destroyed in its entirety. Iris asked, can we also count on your kin too for help? Polonsky asked, when they see the Inquisitors, who had tried to hunt them into extinction disappear from the streets and when they hear my grandfather's clarion call, they will know it is time, they may be scattered right now hiding in the shadows or in plain sight but I know of the location of a coven of them. Iris informed, I will keep that in mind Miss Quidahagan, but let us discuss your role in during Operation Haymaker just so you know what is expected of you when the day arrives. The colonel takes a deep breath to ready himself to divulge Haymaker's designs. I will need you, Samantha and Dahlia threat to conduct anti-major operations with the rest of Strider team for both theatres. Take down mages, destroy chats, maybe getting more of those rare magical artifacts that Dr. Malona wants to get his hands on. If it's arcane then you have to get it. My Recon teams will be painting the targets for you and Strider to eliminate as soon as they report so all you have to do is just search them out and destroy them all, Polonsky explained. A theater? I thought we are bringing down the Empire, not putting on a show for them. Iris questioned. We are putting on a show. A show of force Miss Quidahagan. All I just want to know that once this war kicks in I can count on you three to do your part and fight off whatever those Imperials would throw at us. By any chance do you know anything about the Empire's battle tactics? Polonsky replied before returning with another question for the Vampire Witch. If I and the rest of the Sochefil no longer have to hide in fear no longer then I will gladly accept this great task. However. For your other question, I may be a reclusive scholar but army strategies is something beyond me I am afraid. My grandfather might have some experience but that was centuries ago, they likely have changed over time. Iris answered. That is disappointing to hear, but I didn't expect much from you on that. Forgive me if I offended you, he apologized, none taken. Iris smiled. One last thing Iris. How is the new house that the party provided you? Polonsky asked. Oh, around the same size as my old home. I just ordered some things from Apara Corporation to be delivered to my home to be much more homely. Speaking of that, Corporal Mudwin, Ken has been oh so very helpful warming my new home with his help yesterday. Iris licked her lips daintily. She can still remember his taste. Although, the vampire which added, I am still 
a bit wary of sharing it with another person. Iris commented about her housemate Aliathra Letha. Rest assured that Miss Letha's cooperation with you is in her and her country's best interest, regardless of your historical grievances between your Vam. I mean such Ephil and the elves, he gave his word. It's not her cooperation for our endeavor with La Dewey Rose that I am concerned about, it is her composure. Dash. Outside of the footsteps of her new in Aliath, her new home, Aliathraletha twiddled her hands as she made the flower seeds, she had found scattered wildly on its native verdant river valley biome, she wallows over the precious green earth that surrounded the plot of her new shared home with the unholy creature that is Aris Kudahagan, but alas, fate dictates that she must live together with the vampire which let a fate worse than death befalls her loved ones. But even then, she can still imagine her funeral, likely happening miles away from her at her native Alphilnora where they mourned her damned doom. She used to be a beloved figure, the role model elven maiden, quintessential to her rather peculiar sister who displayed a few tomboyish behaviors. But even then, she was still the Lytha, the most arcanically gifted household in all of Alphilnora due to the existing elven culture of magically focused eugenics. It is said that the firstborn child of elven couples will inherit the best possible arcane inheritance from the two parents. Ithiel was the most magically gifted of the Lethe siblings, displaying a pantological affinity in all schools and modes of teaching for magic. As for her brother Valorian, he has an affinity for the application of wind magic to liquidate the maneuver and range of his troops' movements specifically a line infantry of hybrid spear and bowmen with cavalry on the wings. For her parents, her further Aslenidor was a famed bladesinger of the dragon style during his youth, fighting off savage monsters, pirates, tournament opponents, and the occasional black tree skirmish. As for her mother, she has got to say that she had inherited more from the most recent outsider of the Lethe family to help maintain the royal lineage's arcane supremacy throughout the land. Queen Elisivan's affinity in the arts of healing and alteration was a trait passed down in its entirety to Aliathra as she can attest. O oh goddess, why am I still alive just to suffer? Aliathra prayed as she made the flower seeds bloom on the naked palm of her hands. The wind suddenly began to pick up as the fragile flora on her palm was blown off away by the wind's titanic force. Their lack of a foundation, unable to withstand the wind's breath. Aliathra covered her eyes as leaves, loose dirt, and dust kicked around her as an encapsulating shadow hovered over her in Aliath. Upon her investigation, by looking up there she saw the very thing that became the symbol of her journey, one of the Federation's many flying boats. At least six dozen of them of varying colors and shapes flying past her as they made their approach to New Albany's spaceport. Her heart sank again, Governor White. La Dewey Rose's and Major Holyfield's words are indeed true. The Federation is inevitable. More ships just like those will come and go, flooding in a tide that not even the strongest of dykes can withstand. Foreign people, alien materials, and eldritch technologies will arrive and be there to stay in a virginal world for better or for worse, yet for her own native sorrow. A great irony was realized for the elven princess. Every time her own accumulated background of knowledge, traditions and preconceived ideas were challenged, she saw a whole new world beyond the realms of Gleesia's politics, mundane designs and squabbles, a world iridescent and plump with opportunity, liberty, individualism, collective harmony and prosperity, a world that people like Samantha, Diaz, and a Bidi are able to live their lives without fear and with a golden purpose. Even Iris, a being of darkness was more than elated associating herself with these folks than anywhere else for her hated kind for they valued her as a person of talent and not for the blood beneath her skin. They even shared amongst each other, including Samantha a fondness for indulging into their curiosities and sense of wanting to build a better tomorrow. It had come to the realization that as she and her people the villains in this tale were they in the wrong to cling to their old ways? Was the prophecy of Gleesia's destruction a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yo! Dia's voice disrupted Aliathra's reflection. The Dare Runner himself, in his signature, 
rose-glittered jacket and horse stood before her at the house's front yard carrying with him a large box. R. Nice to see you here Ailey. Could you just help open the door? Vincente requested. R. R. Of course. Ailey Aethra swallowed herself pity to regain her composure as she let Diaz inside her home. What is inside that box you have there? She inquired. Stuff for Aris to play with and a few papers she wants to read. Diaz answered. She wants to earn some money on the side and mule boss. Don Aparo is letting her create certain dot specialized products. You know, the stuff she does best yeah? Ailie Aethra remembered that the vampire which his career path of being a rune write quite fairly. She would write down runic symbols on items she had created to bestow various effects on the object in question. Fairly lucrative with a high demand but very few practitioners outside of the dwarven clan holds where they hold a monopoly on. Somehow, Iris must have been able to learn rune writing from the dwarves somehow. I understand. The elf nodded dispassionately. You seem pretty glum, Ailey. What's up? I hate it when you're sad. Diaz asked. What is up? The SKK, oh I. Yes. I am feeling sad, she admitted. Maybe I can help. Can't stand it when pretty ladies like you are sad. Diaz enlisted. So tell me, what's on your mind? All of the collared thoughts within was now allowed to be free of Aliathra's inhibitions as she begins to confess. You, what will all of the Federation do to us? Aliathra asked. Do to you? Diaz pressed. All of Glee easier? Aliathra asked. Well it's simple really. We move in. Colonize this planet and it becomes a part of the Federation now. Diaz answered. But what will you do after you make your mark on the land? Defeat the Empire and the Entente? Aliathra asked. This world is doomed. Humbled down by the tremors of your steps. Now, what will you do when the land lays bare, naked before you? Honestly, I don't know where we would go from here. Diaz confessed. You do not No. Aliathra recoiled in confusion. Yeah. I mean right now the wigs upstairs, the governor and all of his friends are just focused on making sure nobody attacks New Albany. After that, it's pretty much just going out, explore the world, make new friends, meet new creatures, all that shit. Diaz shrugged. I worry for the future Sir Diaz. Aliathra forewarned. Again, with that, why worry over something you cannot control? Do these people owe you anything? From all intent and purposes, you do not owe the jack shit. Nothing. Diaz exclaimed. I owe them. Nothing? The elf asked. I mean why owe yourself to a society who can't seem to figure out that you are still you Ailey? As soon as you become corrupted they call you what? A monster? An abomination? A freak? What of those Cephid Liad who likes to puppet people and make them dance to their tunes to do things that will lead them to their deaths or worse? That is no society I want to be a part of. And are you not a princess? Diaz lectured. I am. And I was. I was. For most of my life. My parents had decided everything for me from the moment I could walk. Aliathra said. Decided what for you? Where to go? Who you meet? Who will you marry? Diaz inquired. Aliathra nodded confirming Diaz's assumptions. Shit, damn. Again, do you want to be pushed around like that for all of your life? Where your will and desires are controlled by someone else? Diaz asked. No, I do not. The elf came to the realization. I never thought of it that way. Aliathra stood at a loss for words. She remembered how her family had arranged all of the decades of training, grooming and social visits for her. Being the youngest child of the royal family her fate, unlike her brother, she was to be married off to some far-off nobleman to strengthen the alliances between themselves. Her scholarship into the academy was guaranteed on the essence of she being a Lethra. Although she had enjoyed her overall education, she never truly felt like she belonged with any of the social cliques at the school of fear of reprisal or just being her friend for the sake of being associated with a member of the royal family. Lastly, the strict vows, sacraments and rules for her is what had caused her to flee in fear of her inner self being modified to something unnatural. Compared to being with the youth, she may be indentured to their servitude, other than fulfilling her duties and not actively hindering the Federation in any way. She was allowed or at least do not feel like she was being observed closely, 
to indulge in a few decadent activities such as her romanticization of diary writings for all of the times she would have loved to be handled with the fictional bardic hero Bandle Thunderhand. It was Aris and Cairns' fault for making her transgress back to those smutty pieces of literature that she and her sister Ithiel would read behind their guardians' backs. Which did remind her something. Ithiel would have loved to meet Agent the Sardit. Despite their differing genders, Lunafra might catch a refreshing breath of fresh air upon an introductory conversation between them if she could only just reach out her hand to her groomed elder sister. But still, all of these thoughts she was allowed to indulge upon felt all so wrong to talk about. You are freer here than you could have ever been back there Ailey. Diaz concluded. Free? I don't know. I, still don't know how to go about this. Ailey Aethra said, trying to deny herself. Well let me loosen up your buttons babe. Diaz clicked his mouth with a charming smile. For a start, look at you. Diaz pointed to her. What do you want? What do I want? Aethra asked. What do you want in life? Like do you wanna do something? Be someone? Get some things to sit your ass on forever? You can tell me. I will tell mine back. Diaz said. Well, I always enjoyed helping people especially when it's healing them of their wounds and maladies. The elf answered, to see them smile and return to health again. That is the greatest happiness one can live through when you are cleric of Nenith. How noble. You wanna be a doctor, I can easily agree with that. Diaz smiled, as for me, I want to retire rich early. Diaz said, is that is why you are so roguish? Aethra tittered, you don't stay in my position being chivalric, although then again, you don't stay very long being wholly roguish too, it's a balancing act really, you have to know when to lie and when to honor. Diaz comments about his corpo agent career. Like Bandle Thunderhand? Oh, you remind me of him. She smiled. That bard character you like to talk about with Sammy, and Iris? Must be one cool son of a bee. Diaz laughed back. A bee? He isn't a. That's one of those. Ah. Uh, metaphors, right? Aethra raised slang, shortened language. But yeah let's go with that. Diaz scratched the back of his hair. Anyways. So if I am like Bandle Thunderhand I must be good at music? No, I am afraid not, but I do like good music. Diaz says. You mean those drumming beats that your horse Mustang can play? Aethra asked. Hey, champion racing horse. Diaz loftily corrected. But I also like to listen to some sexy music too. Diaz smiled. Sexy music? Aethra asked music to sit around and smell the flowers with. Like relaxing music really, that gets your heart beating. In a healthy way. Diaz smiled. How so? Aethra asked. Well for a start, when I am tired or just need something to blow some steam then I listen to some of Ibiza. He pulled out his smartphone, turned up its volume to the maximum range and hit play. A most peculiar melody erupted from Diaz's gizmo for Aethra's leaf-shaped ears hearkened. It had an accelerated tempo for its rhythmic beats whose reverberations were like an expediated version of merry making tavern singing with the aid of drums, chimes and an occasional string plucking. Diaz himself was working his body left and right as he listened to the music enthusiastically. Show me your moves Ailey, how do elves dance? He invited. Dance with you? Ailey Aethra questioned. Her cheeks blushed with both apprehension and excitement. Apprehension of the fact that she was being taken for a wild ride with her equally corrupted peer and excited in the fact that she was unbound to have this decision right now be laid bare before her without any external sway or governance. She pushed her limbs forward, and began to follow as well as she can discern and her two bladed limbs can keep up with the music's rhythm to the vulpine smile of Diaz. Her dance was essentially a more rigid form of the Quaraffel Vander. What she practiced for April Root's fairy tale themed birthday, unlike the luxury of having an open field to skip her feet upon, Aethra struggled to maintain the traditional rumba's aesthetic integrity as she took more care trying to avoid the newly moved furniture that Ken and Iris had earlier worked so hard to move in. Her dance degraded to horrid display of ungraceful articulation of the body much to Vinny's disgust. What are you doing? What are you doing? Diaz complained as he stepped forward and halted Aethra's embarrassing form. I was trying to. 
trying to do the Quaral Falvanda, the dance of my people from my memory. Ailey Aethra started to explain. That's not the point of house music Ailey. You're free here. Dance what you want to dance. Diaz explained. What I want? Ailey Aethra asked. Shake it all off. A pretty girl like you has some baggage that needs to go out. Loosen does buttons of yours. Shake that hip. Take off that gape. Let go and enjoy it. Diaz encouraged her. I will try. Ailey Aethra nodded. She worked her head back into the rhythm of the music from Diaz's phone. Her body began to beat up and down to match the drum beats. Her hands gracefully flow sideways like waves of the ocean tide when the strings were heard and to complement both. Her pacing quickened as the temper stimulates, and an arousing stimulation is what Aethra felt. A new form of arousal as if something hidden, locked, abandoned inside her arose from its obscurity and yet hijacked her mind as pleasuring hormones dulled her mind and made all of those years of strict adherence to the Earth Island rules of being a proper lady fade into irrelevancy. Latent mental restraints had their chains broken as the elf's body flow sensual with the music. You're getting it. Diaz smiled at Aliathra's form. Still despite the mental restraints being broken, Elf's body was still held prisoner by the cloth of her old ranger wear. Adrenaline and dopamine flooded her body, heating up her skin that sweat uncomfortably reeked around her skin as sensitive nerves alarmed her mind that her current choice of apparel was over-encumbering for her royally soft body for such a steamy act. She first took off her green cape and playfully tossed it aside to a nearby sofa unfurling like a revolutionary flag atop of a triumphant conquest. Diaz's heart skipped a bit when Aliathra's lithe hand seductively began to unfasten the clasps of her leather bodice, venting out her buxom built that was hidden away from the prying eyes of sinful folks. Cheek, cheeky, Diaz wooed her further. The euphoria was intoxicating to Aliathra that all other senses of self was sidelined most especially her sense of direction and the shivering sensations of balance based around her fermented footwork. The elf tripped over the coffee table just as she was about to sublimely release its confines at the fullest, making Aliathra fall over to the living room's carpeted floor and tossing over a vase. Oh shit, Ailey. Diaz rushed over to the elf. I, I am okay. Aliathra snapped herself back to her senses. She then proceeds to notice her risque tone and she was shocked by how much of herself losing control, or perhaps how much her previous facade had been absconded to branch out what lay dormant beneath her. From a prim and proper elven princess to a lively blonde lass, Aliathra blushed when Diaz's male gaze pinpointed to her exposed cleavage. Her mounds were quite a sight to behold. The vase, Aliathra shouted in alarm to break the amorous scene. She pointed at the shattered pieces of home decor that lay on the floor and it was as unsightly as it was dangerous to lay your feet atop on. Using Midge hand, she swept the broken vase aside safely away from any likely footpaths within her and Aleth. You know Ailey, that was hot. I mean, that was sexy. I mean, that was fun to watch. Diaz praised. Wish it had gone further. He smiled dotingly. Yes, I wish it did too. The elf blushed. She had got to say to herself, in that one moment, for the first time in her life, she wasn't alive to survive and glee easier, but instead, she was alive to live not of her parents or society's dictation but her own accord. Like a prisoner allowed jubilation from his internment, Aliathra truly lived the day and it ironically, she had to die to achieve this. All of her teacher's guidance tutored corrections, maternal indoctrinations she had known beforehand eroded the chains that incarcerated her metal heart, metaphorically. Seeing Diaz in the eye, reminded her of the salacious prose of Bandle Thunderhand of how he charmed all the ladies with his wit, prowess, and physique. Her heart raced faster than her own volition as her thoughts were besieged by the repressed feelings left imprisoned by her own unknown volition. One of high-flying electrochemistry and of the whimsical inland empire. So, do you want to take this somewhere else? Aliathra proposed, her voice percolating her covetous surge that took over her now indigent notions. Her eyes widened in excitement for Vinny's answer as she teasingly began to unclasp the rest of the fasteners of her leather bodice, 
an approval to be taken would mean the world for her at this moment. Nay, Diasna rejected. The corpo lightly grasped Aliathra's chin to articulate her face towards his direction and he smiled out of his tongue. I like to take you slow first, he said. He then looks down and lightly caressed Aliathra's form with the back of his finger, passing by her neck down to her breasts, abdomen, and thigh. Let's get you something nicer to wear Ailey. I know a nice streetwear shop that just opened that got some nice bling. My treat and you can choose whatever you like. Anything I like? Ailey Aethra asked. She is starting to be reeled into Dias's exciting lifestyle now. He nodded as the Aparo runner whisked off her feet and with his hand clasped to hers, opened a new door for Aliathra that she could have never had fathomed as they made their tryst to downtown New Albany for a day of reimagination, relaxation, and rediscovery. Dash. Samantha Rose was elated today. She was given nothing but good news according to Dr. Malona's optimistic reports. Firstly, her training program has shown insightful, promising and optimistic results according to how her mana readings were observed by the science team's monitors. Dr. Malona has all the prerequisite data he needs to fully optimize the intrinsic builds for the Lieutenant's Hecate suit. It was going to be a weaved bodysuit with a nanocarbon thread that is amplified for her powers needs by several strong points located on the suit's hand areas with the help of Agtocolite. Gyronite would be also used to help her store the mana that she collects and stores within her. However, these brand new substances would require surgery for Samantha to undertake. Attaching the Gleesian minerals at key meridians around her body so that she can best wear the suit to its maximum effect. Such a prospect was initially terrifying since she had never gone under the knife throughout her life up until this point. But Samantha knows she has no control over this and the latter option was the cold bullet from a justifiably afraid political officer. Besides, she couldn't back out now after all the new discoveries she and Dr. Malona had found together. First was that with the application of modern chemistry and the teachings of her instructor Zyrus and Aliathra, Samantha was able to enhance her magical powers to new effects. For a start she, to everyone and her own amazement had Zyrus and Aliathra can testify, invented several new magical spells. One such spell that she can cast is the Plasma Bolt. In the description, she with some difficulty would conjure on her hands a blue-colored fire which is much hotter and more potent than your average tangerine-tinted version. With enough, albeit risky charging of her inner cores, the lieutenant can cast magic able to penetrate some of the youth's own armor much like the experimental plasma cannons that the youth had demonstrated once in a recent military exercise. Still. The red fire was easier and less cumbersome to cast so each has its own pros and cons. Outside of combat, the most amusing thing Samantha discovered what she can do is when she, taking inspiration from an old classic show called Avatar was to cast a constantly rotating ball of Gallic wind and riding atop of the ball to create a sort of air scooter. It allows unimpeded running speed through all but the toughest of terrain that got the Aparo engineers inside the science complex jealous by how up to par she can move to their own rapid movement boosters. It wasn't meant to be initially tested during the tests but Sam and the rest of the science team wanted to do it for the fun of it. Still, she had to get a few stitches and bandages on her body after crashing headfirst due to the nostalgic fact that the air scooter spell is like riding a bicycle and the last time Samantha rode a bicycle was when she was 12. Perhaps a refresher course is in order before she attempts the spell again. Speaking of Avatar, Samantha couldn't help but indulge in fanon of the similarities in the situation she finds herself in with the cartoon's characters. She is like the fiery warrior of a Lady Korra who is proud of her powers but is ultimately on the grand scheme of things just a symbolism of peace and prosperity to Republic City. Aliathra, with her gentle nature, is like Katara the waterbender being able to nurture and slowly grow Samantha's proficiency whilst in stark contrast. There is Aris who is a mix between Zuko's seriousness with a few snarks and rough but effective mindset of Toph's innate affinity for the elements. Hell, speaking of fictional influences, 
Samantha realizes she is just like the old classical heroines who have powers that they use to heroically protect their loved ones from danger like Wonder Woman, Zatanna, Scarlet Witch, and Alita. For all of this power, however, Samantha had to hit herself when its ugly head reared in her mind that she is ultimate to the eyes of everyone in New Albany. The party and the Federation are tool that can be disposed of at a whim when its use is deemed obsolete or against their collective interests, at the very least. The obsolete part is at worst an honorable discharge with her exploits classified in some government vault to be declassified after several decades has passed. But to go against her nation's interests, well Mr. Rose would perhaps be the most disappointed to see such a promising individual of unique talent use her abilities to such counterproductive effect. Ultimately, as the lieutenant concluded that her great power comes great responsibility, using her powers for the utilitarian good of all. As the saying goes, people are judged not of what they have, but what they do with what they have. For heroes, villains, and all sorts of influential folks, historical or otherwise are not born, they are made. If that wasn't a burden enough, Samantha can now fully understand why her superiors are so concerned and fearful for her as her powers could if she either gets too greedy in absorbing too much mana or exhaust herself too quickly she could risk dying in violently spectacular fashion or at an inopportune moment respectively. Hopefully, the Hecate suit and the big plans that Dr. Malona and Bobby Bianchin have in store for her should help alleviate these burdens for although her mind is willing to take the powers of the Ranuprata to the next levels, her flesh was weak. The backing of years of the youth's scientific industrial might rest by those two men. If those weren't troublesome enough, her commanding superiors are now intending to use her talents to pacify the rambunctious natives of Gleesia to the submission due to hearing the possible rumor mongering of war happening across the horizon. It disgusts her of these natives' insistent talks of accusing the Federation of being the demons of their old legends when they had been nothing but angels that descended upon a barely functioning world where they brought peace, prosperity, and hope from the ashes of famine, want, and poverty. Her powers are likely going to be used to shock the natives into surrender judging by how Colonel Polonsky mentions that she will be taking several special operations planned out by him and what intelligences he can gather. She may be a figurative tool for the common state party's propaganda pieces much like Avatar Korra being a symbolic personification of harmony and prosperity in her animated world, but even then. Deep down Samantha wishes to not only be a hero for the Federation but a hero to the people of Gleesia. This branding of hers was of the planet's making after all. She looks back at her late father, of how he won the Medal of Honor for his bravery of evacuating his entire platoon from a doomed assault that although violently and ungracefully ended an insurrection, managed by going out of his way mitigate the horrendous damage friend and for like when she had heard of what her father had done. Oh how she wished she can be like him, valiant and true to himself. That is why she had enlisted as soon as she had reached the minimum age of entry much to her mother's protests. Maybe one day, she can escape the shadow of her father and exceed him in a way worthy of her lineage extending to all the way to her ancestor Leo Major. But enough of those worries, for the last good news is why Samantha was so eager to leave her containment cell. She was about to be given the go-ahead by the Whigs at the common state party to be discharged from her internment and it could have been a better time. The day she leaves her cell is also the day of B. Dyer's daughter, April will be celebrating her birthday at the Drunken Bastard Inn. She had heard nothing but praises from everyone but her about how exquisite Leah Root's home cooking is. She had also heard about Iris and Aliathra providing entertainment to April and the rest of her preschool classmates. The lieutenant yawned after reflecting upon the happenings of the present as she lay down on her cell's cot. She couldn't wait to finally see the sun or Malinari's the golden lady as the natives call it. Dash. Clovich enjoyed the hospitality of the Japanese greatly. In contrast to the hustle and bustle of the Tokyo metropolis surrounding the imperial palace, Emperor Shinharu's home was a tranquil retreat, so familiar yet so foreign for the feudal lord of Tyrian. 
He enjoyed pleasurable activities such as a tea ceremony that sampled some of the island nation's finest hot beverages, feeding the pet koi fish and even a demonstration of the imperial family's android butler. In addition to all of the photographed social formalities that Klovich and his entourage enjoyed, whenever he finds the time that he can, he would inquire to Emperor Shinharu about his famous ancestor, the former Emperor Meiji. Smiling happily at the prince's curiosity, the Emperor of Japan was simply amazed and scared by how much passion the other world had. Amazed by how similar he had according to the history books every imperial scion reads about his lineage, but also equally fearful of what Klovich's reaction will be like when he finds out about the tumultuous obstacles that Meiji had to face in order to turn Japan into the modern powerhouse that it is today most especially the radical reforms he had to enact and or abolish. This tea, my lord is absolutely astounding. Klovich complimented the emerald beverage, called matcha as he sipped the local drink, his tongue reverberating the sensations of a pleasant tasting, smooth drink with a few vegetal notes in between. It was like drinking the sweet nectar from the breast milk of a nymph. Indeed it is Prince Klovich. Emperor Shinharu nodded happily. How did your ancestors achieve so much in such little time? They say you took only a few decades in what took your peers centuries to achieve. Klovich asked. Ah. My least favorite subject to be honest. The emperor uncomfortably gulped. Least favorite? The prince asked. I assume that the prime minister himself had told you some unsavory truths that for someone like you may sound radical, revolutionary even. The emperor inquired, I do. Klovich sunk his head. He recalled Bowskit's harsh words about the flaws of the current system of governance and the technological background of his people back home in Gleesia, most especially the concepts of feudalism, chivalry, slavery, and the adventurer guild's uneven policing power upon the populace to tear down what the Gleesians had valued for centuries uncounting to a new road forward of an unknown future ahead was terrifying to behold for a vassal lord, let alone someone who is at the lower midpoint of the empire's ruling class. It was essentially destroying the only world that they know of. At first, the prince couldn't believe the prime minister's words but Bowskit wisely believed that the words of Emperor Shinharu, the current scion of the imperial Japanese line, much idolized by many intellectual of native folks who have made positive contact with the youth, would have more sway in persuading Prince Klovich to take the road less traveled compared to his stagnating countrymen. Look here at this one. Emperor Shinharu guided Klovich's attention. They darted over a miniature tree that sat at a grandiose pedestal in the emperor's parlor room. Despite its size, the pygmy wood stood opulent and imperial as Emperor Shinharu himself. Its leaves were like olive needles that pointed upwards from its branches. The wood itself showed signs of veneration from darkened spots and a few lumpy pushes of bark flesh that gave the miniature tree a venerable feel. This is one of my family's greatest treasures, passed down from generations whom I, is its latest caretaker. How long did your family have this? Klovich asked, the Sandai Shogun Nomatsu over 700 years. Emperor Shinharu wiggled his fingers to count. It is said that, that this little tree grows a new branch whenever a great crossroads ever happens for Japan. If this tree were to ever die. There is a saying that the land of Japan will die with it. He recalled, all living things like trees die eventually. But tell me, how did you keep this tree alive for over centuries? Klovich asked. Basic botany and the law of conservation of energy. The emperor answered, such lessons that you can learn something about your country yourself. It is what my great-great-grandfather Meiji learned to when he branched himself out to the western powers. The emperor said. He walked towards the ancient bonsai tree and, opening a cupboard nearby, a steel box he pulled out of the compartment and from the box he pulled out again a pair of small secateurs. Grasping the shears, Emperor Shinharu began to Klovich's astoundment, cutting up the ancient bonsai tree, taking out several branch systems, defoliating several leaves and thinning out the overall size of the bonsai tree's crown. What are you doing? Klovich exclaimed. That is hundreds of years of history you are cutting, he said with alarming disposition. 
It is called pruning the tree Prince Clovich. Emperor Shinharu explained. Whilst multitasking the maintenance of the famous Sandai Shogun no Matsu Bonsai tree, the emperor paternalistically demonstrated every cut and rationale of actions upon Clovich. Your society, a medieval feudal society of Gleesia is no different than the society my great-grandfather Meiji came from before the arrival of the West. Shinharu grasped a section of the bonsai tree whose branches were rubbed against each other which unfortunately allows open wounds, unsightly gashes, and broken branches. Bazke told me a lot about your society. So many troublesome problems and pests that plague your homeland and you deep down wish to end it all not for your sake, your sister or but for your people. You may not hear it, but deep down, if this bonsai tree could talk, it is in deep anguish. Pain basically and I am helping alleviate its pain. The emperor cut the parasitic branches and scraped off the troublesome wood away from the tree as a whole. He then proceeds to fall down upon the leaves shaving off much of its verdigris mane from its swavy crown. There are many people that will hold you back, of the good old ways. They are ultimately like parasites that seek to stifle your potential to see a better future. Such as those adventurers and some chivalric samurai of yours. Don't you see that they are holding you back when it comes to protecting your people from the terrors of the world? And for what? Money? What is money compared to the value of an innocent person's life? Samurai Clovich asked. Knights? That is what we call knights in Japan Prince Clovich. Shinharu explained. When Meiji returned from his travels to the Western powers he had to fight for his reforms. Many people thought he had become corrupted by the otherworldly barbarians overseas but deep down, Meiji knew that if Japan were to survive the next turn of his time, the reforms must happen whether they want it or not, he said. I see, but him fighting his own countrymen must have been very terrifying to muster the will to persevere. Clovich nodded. Indeed it does, the Japanese emperor said. But by the time he had triumphed, Japan had successfully transitioned itself from a medieval society isolated from the world to a technological powerhouse in Asia. The key here is that sometimes, to grow you need to let go. The emperor rhymed. He then proceeded to apply a healing balm onto the wound areas where the troublesome parts had been sheared over whilst he also applied water and added a light sprinkling of fertilizer to the bonsai tree's roots. My pruning of this bonsai tree should be like how you will enact those reforms Prince Clovich, closing certain paths forever to allow the opening of new growth is like what you have seen me done today. My country, my Japan had gone through so much ever since Meiji reformed every corner of the country but we all didn't regret it soon after now that we enjoy so many new things that we didn't know we would or could have if we had stayed like before. Shinharu concluded his lecture. Tell me one more thing, tell me one more thing Emperor Shinharu. Clovich raised his hand. How will I know what path I should lead my people to take? He asked. The one where the most amount of people benefits the most. Listen to them but don't be afraid to intervene yourself lest the straight to a path that will lead to their self-destruction. When you do have to inevitably tear down a tradition to build a new one in its place, make sure you replace it with a tradition that all peoples can progress with. I do not understand, Clovich pleaded. Never stop learning Clovich. Never ever stop learning. To know the price for the progress you need to be able to stomach a few mistakes, hiccups and bumps along the road. The emperor said, must I be the only one alone to build this future? He asked, not really. There are likely as many people who when they hear of this, will gladly reach out for your hand to build the future that you envision to seek. You've Gleesian, it matters not where they come from, just that they share the same vision. Now tell me prince, what kind of future you wish to build in Tyrian? I dream of a future where the people of Tyrian are free from the plagues from want and fear. Clovich answered. That is noble but quite broad. Tell me what you mean of these plagues you wish to eradicate so badly? The emperor asked. Raiders, famine, banditry, and fire. That is what plagues Tyrian before the arrival of the Federation. He explained. You are a smart one. How would you fight about it if you had no limits to what you can dispose of to defeat these plagues? The emperor asked, my army, they could use the weapons that your federation possess, with those weapons they can be able to protect all from the raiders and banditry. For famine and fire, 
Your peoples possess a mag. I mean technology where infernos and droughts are trivial to you, he said. That is something my great-grandfather had seeked the Western powers for. The emperor gave off an amused laugh. I believe I know several people that can help you with that. The emperor nodded. Oh? I'm willing to learn everything I can from them. Clovich asked. Of course, you would. He smiled. Their names are Oza and Hanjin Shibuzawa. The emperor nodded. But I fear that you are not ready, he muttered. Not ready? Clovich asked. He had come so far that he could not fail now. Are you ready to pay for the price of progress, Prince Clovich? Are you ready to prune your tree to see it grow? The Emperor asked. Yes, yes, I am ready. Prince Clovich decisively vowed. So, you are ready now. Just like my great grandfather Meiji. The Emperor smiled. The door to an unknown future lay ahead for not only Clovich nor Tyrian but for Gleesia now. On this day, as Clovich had inwardly decreed, the beginning of the Clovician amelioration, the advancement of Tyrian has begun. Chapter 40, 130 minutes in Tyrian. All is quiet in Tyrian just as Malinris had finished passing over this side of Gleesia so she rests herself for another day as her younger sister Calariel arose upwards. However, she was feeling shy that night so her naked self of lustrous glowing snow white of skin was clothed in shadows. The city was about to call itself night and the only people who would be out in the streets at this hour were the local drunks drowning in the various watering holes, citadel guards assigned on night duty, and the street walkers who cater to the formers. This night, however, was more perfect for about over 1,000 individuals of diverse backgrounds converged in Tyrian today as Radrid had hoped from his networking of associates can muster all of these Grey Order adventurers. Silzords, and mercenaries had risked themselves for this journey into the crossroad citadel of Tyrian for one common purpose. The promise of extravagant pay and fame as Radrid had charismatically proposed. Many of the nearby regions heeded his call either by admiration, desperation or a sense of adventure. The citadel's gates are still theoretically open to late-night arriving mercantile caravans whom some adventurers used the cover of being merchant guards to insert themselves within Tyrian's walls little by little. It takes an early announcement and a considerable tariff to be allowed entry. For the rest, they inserted themselves either within the outskirts of the city by various hamlets that surrounded the Verdun River Valley or had snuck inside on their own many emotions of the Radrids followers or by their street name as the flagrant used on the grapevine to attract the more devout of followers into this expedition, the Salvation Crusade, were mixed as the leaders were called forth in a delegation within a safe house inside Tyrian that the semi-crooked adventurer had sent an invite to. Each leader represented a particular interest of collectivized individuals who are participating in this auspicious quest that the flagrant is at the helm at. Some were confident, brandishing themselves with a smug distinction as they psyched themselves for a good fight. Others were nervous as they grasped their weapons to comfort their mental stability whilst the rest are agitated as the time stretched further jittering their hands as they wait for the fateful hour. Speaking about arms, Radrid was glad that his contact from earlier, one named Madame Quaithron came through with the arms he needs to stand a chance against these other worlders. A cache of holy weaponry ranging from holy water dipped conventional weapons of steel and iron, silver relven swords in all of its graciousness, a crate of demons been poison coating and a handful of master crafted actocolite forged arms that the more senior of his retinue helped themselves with. As Radrid sharpened his new blade, he looks over the companions he had brought over from across the realm. In terms of groups he noticed several Orc, Feline Mstari, or Leonidkin, and even some Eastern Desert warriors amongst those gathered alongside several familiar faces from the Adventurer's Guild, such as Sir Elmo Uthwisk, the adopted bastard son of a blacksmith specializing in crafting some of the best Q irises in all of the land. He carries on his chest quite literally his family's honor, a Scandinite Q iris said to stop even the heaviest of blows. The next one, who at the moment is quite literally playing with fire is the notorious pyromancer, Sun Tanglid, 
an individual known for her excessive use of her specialization and association with rogue mages. She was actually a former College of Magi student who was kicked out for torching a professor who gave her a failing mark in a class that did not involve the material deletion of said target of spells. To mirror her was the calm fencer of reputable tournament renowned Stefan Ahadid, whose dueling capabilities was a match for his provocative tongue. Another familiar sight was the holy symbol of Nenith with the virginal white robes of her Hippocratic domain. Radrid saw a paladin and a cleric who are both girls, by their young faces they were likely newly ordained, perhaps at the same time as the sacrament is often done in groups across all domains. It was also not uncommon for clerics and paladins to become adventurers too as they believe that they can best fulfill their holy orders of protecting the gods' creation by venturing around the realms as wandering heroes like the stories told. And what better way to fulfill their ordainments than a crusade? They all know why they gathered here tonight with the flagrant, whether for gold, revenge or just the desperation of Radrid's good words. They gathered around the influential individual incessantly. Is it true then? Are these other world as you speak of other demons of old? Elmo inquired. Indeed, based on what the local guildsman said. They were practically kicked out with the demons doing all of the work for free. Radrid answered, for free? That is outrageous they surely must have asked for some price. Maybe their souls. Elmo blinked. Indeed, it has gotten worse than I thought. Already their invasion is creeping upon the streets of Tyrian itself. I am glad and I cannot also believe we managed to gather here at this moment. The gold starred adventurer confirmed. My worst fears. The blacksmith's son humbly lowered his visor. Everyone should get behind me when I lay up my shield. These demon attacks should be no match to my armor. Elmo chest pumped causing his Scandinite Q iris to bang heartily. Its robust nature providing a sense of reassurance to the rest of the raid's leaders. Demons feed off of them, right? Sund raised her hand. She was a bit absent-minded due to her rural nature but when set with an objective she becomes focused on its completion, no matter the cost. The larger the dragons the more it must feed. They feed on the Tyranny no? I burn them, right? Likes burning farm field. Sund exclaimed. Yes, that is the plan. You all remember what is the plan I have discussed right? Radrid reminded. Stefan raised his hands gaily. He was surprisingly laid back for someone who is about to commence a daring endeavor. We divide our thousand forces into two, one to the demon stronghold and the rest stay here in Tyrian. Stefan said, we fight, kill off as many demons as we can before daybreak and then leave before the entire city realizes what is happening, he said. Stefan nonchalantly dismissed him. His interest being here was bragging right over taking the head off of a demon and nothing more. He will charge to the most intimidating foe his foe chasing I can lock onto and challenge him in pitch combat. With the help of his magical sword he should be able to stand a good chance against the demon he will challenge for the honor of his dueling prowess dictates. Make off with as many of them and their otherworldly arms as you can carry. Under the cover of night surely we can catch these demons off guard especially with the reports I have gotten. Radrid smiled wickedly. I will personally lead the men going to the demon forces and Uelmo will lead the ones attacking Tyrian. Burn as much as you can for the demons and deny them their food. How sure are you of your informant's words? Elmo asked. She is with the crows. She showed me her ring and was with Mita when they first spied here. The demons may be strong but they have their weaknesses and we just have enough to land a serious blow onto them. Radrid answered. Where is this outpost you say the demons have inside the citadel? Surely that there is a captain of sorts who lives there. Stefan inquired. The Tyranny adventurers, or the sole survivors of them I am afraid, had said that it is at our half square. It's very easy to discern it from the rest because of their flag. Look for a tall house that is a blue flag with many rings locking themselves together on it. Radrid said. What happened to them? They are supposed to be our guides into the city. Elmo questioned. They were discovered but they managed to destroy any connections before the demons could get their hands on them. The sole survivor, coincidentally the man I had entrusted to recruit the Tyranny adventurers will do. The senior adventurer reassured, I burn them all. I will raise them to the ground. Sun laughs maniacally. 
She needed to warm herself up before she released the innate inferno within her. No, focus first on the houses. The demons may rush to tap to their power sources when they realize what is happening. Once they are weakened, we reap as many as we can before we make our escape. Calariel's cloak should give us the best element of surprise. Radrid corrected the mad pyromancer. Burning houses? When did we become ravagers Radrid? Stefan asked. These aren't people anymore. They have sunk deep into the hearts of the otherworlders and they cannot escape. They are all eternally damned. Radrid reminded. The room felt silent upon the gold adventurer's dehumanizing words. There was a hesitancy that emitted in the air upon the prospects of burning a home down in no different to the terrorist acts inflicted on bandits and step raiders. Most people were content with fighting a few ne'er-do-wells and exploring a long-forgotten tomb but arson was such a tall order. Look, everyone, listen, Radrid raised his voice. What we accomplish here tonight will echo down the ages. People will sing of our daring heroics, shower us with gold and we will be all remembered as the people who stemmed the demon tide. Tonight, the demons shall know that they will never again breach our homes and take our souls ever again. Radrid boasted. Well then, it's death or glory now? Shall we all? Elmo stood up and rallied the rest of the gathering. Everyone nodded, stood up from their seats, and with their marching orders in hand, they dispersed quietly. Radrid and a few of the non-human mercenaries quietly exited Tyrian under their guise as mercantile caravans, their cargo being other warriors smuggled in with their weapons at the ready to avoid suspicion. Elmo, Stefan, and Sund led the other half of their cobbled together army and led them to our half square where the demon outpost is. They quietly ran around the citadel activating and mobilizing the various hidden cells of those disenfranchised, desperate, or feverous who held a mutual animosity against the Federation who had as they claimed wronged them. Armed to the teeth with conventional and exotic weapons they quietly slaughtered any of the Citadel night guards who they encountered to prevent discovery of their hostile plan. At a certain point, Sund and several mages broke off with a contingent of a hundred plus men at arms to head towards the residential areas of Tyrian to ready themselves for their own designs whilst Telmo and Stefan continued on towards the rest of the dormant cells. They awaited the signal to commence the assault when the insurgent force reached critical mass and then arriving at their final destination of the demon stronghold, the Federation's embassy, formerly the bandit Lord de Vico's manse. Little did they all know that their element of surprise was all for naught as an invisible raven read their every move. Dash. Sentinel, you have over 500 unknowns moving towards your position. Isaac's monotone voice informed the chief of the youth embassy's security detail code named Sentinel, dosed off from his half sleep to grab his radio. Tonight was a quiet night inside for him and his men. Most of the embassy's lights have been turned off to conserve power to the generator until their next shipment of goods that will be used for the final push to retrofit the youth embassy into a diplomatic compound much to their suited standards. This leaves the former Divico mansion to be no different in outward appearance than the many padlocked establishments and residentials across Tyrian tonight. Say again? Sentinel asked the combat AI Isaac known as the Intelligent System Analytic Computer to repeat himself. You have approximately 300 unknowns approaching your position 50 meters at Herald Doors 9 o'clock. Isaac added as he displayed a live feed of Isaac's UAV spying on the approaching mob in front of Sentinel's computer screen. It was dark tonight and the UAV had to tint the screen emerald in night vision mode to allow the voluminous view of the large group of unknowns menacingly approaching the Federation's embassy. The mob was highlighted in red by the AI's smart design as Sentinel looked on with horror. He saw the natives walking stealthily as they could through the streets in an asymmetrical fashion. No heraldry or tags to identify who their attackers are, and worse of all, their primitive iron weapons openly drawn out to taste the cold night air. Sentinel had heard of the possibility of an attack on the Federation but the intel wasn't sure of the location or who is their target. To his dread, whomever these conspirators were, they are going to attack the very domain of the Federation's power in Tyrian, the embassy, or the mansion as joked by himself when he had first arrived on his contractual assignment here in Gleesia. 
They did outfit the embassy with several security features such as a reinforced perimeter wall, a new security gate with magnetic locks that is, theoretically, impossible for any of what the Gleasons have to breach through conventionally, double-layered security glass that's resistant to impactful penetrations and some elemental intrusion, and lastly to put the cherry on top a .50 caliber auto turret fondly called the teacher. However, not all of the embassy's security features are at full operational capacity. The security glass only partially protects all the windows in the mansion and the full shipment of ammunition for the auto turret wasn't scheduled to arrive until tomorrow morning. There are at least 21 guards, Sentinel included, plus a few overnight staff members of the diplomatic detail inside the embassy tonight. Everyone, defensive positions, front now. He ordered his men. The armory lit a bus with activity as the embassy's security guards armed themselves with rifles, LMGs and shotguns as they from the first to the third floor manned their positions as the menacing mob of warriors approached our half square. Shit just got real. Sentinel cursed. Ear dot ear. This is. This is. The lethargic voice of Colonel Jan Polonsky echoed on the security chief's earpiece. This is Shield Father. I was just told. Of the sitch. A. He spoke, his loose lips betraying his still half-awake state. That raid is for real Colonel. I got hostiles approaching our position as I speak. Sentinel briefly explained. Can they see you? The Colonel asked. No, sir we got night vision on. Sentinel said. Rules of engagement sir? He asked. Sentinel, they are at Mirian's tavern now. One of the security chief's men added. The mob, crouching down or going prone, slithered their way past the abandoned market stalls of our half square as they continued their sub rosa approach at the embassy. Shield father, do we engage sir? Sentinel asked. Hit them with the floodlights when just about they are to attack. Draw them in. Let's see if we can just scare them, Polonsky ordered. In war, it is not enough to just slaughter more opponents than your enemy based on the colonel's experience but it is to sap their will to fight any longer is how one can win the fight. If one puts themselves at an advantage to raise himself above his adversary or the opposite of removing the advantage that tipped the scales back into your favor is enough for the opposing forces to fold then he has won not only the war but also the socio-political intrigues behind the scenes who scour with merciless subjectivity on one commander's choices. Getting these conspiring adventurers to realize they lost their element of surprise can possibly cut the head off of this conspiracy once and for all. Roger that, Sentinel said. Nathaniel, get the lights now. He ordered one of his men. The soldier named Nathaniel quickly dashed towards the power generator at the back where the switches for the floodlights were kept. Don't shoot unless fired upon, Polonsky said. Hit it, Sentinel ordered. Nathaniel pulled down the switch as the floodlights drowned the night's blanket away, exposing the adventurers who staggeringly covered their eyes from the sudden illumination. This is the United Federation. Drop your weapons and raise them up. One of the embassy's security guards shouted. Their element of surprise and their hearty excitement for blood was instantly liquidated in a span of a few seconds as the Grey Order guildsmen either froze in fear or tried to hide from the Federation's gaze. At that moment none of them know what to do except for one man, dressed in an ostentatious silvery blue armor etched with glowing runic sigils along its contours. The armored individual raised his shield up to the air, his fist defiantly towering above the otherworldly challengers. You will not take our lands or our freedom. The imposing man yelled. Shield wall. He rallied. Those adventurers, over thirty of them who armed themselves with the sword and the board gathered around him and locking themselves together on each adjacent side formed the shield wall bent backward to accommodate whatever skirmishing fire these demons wished to spit out at this brazen act of rebellion. Several of the more fragile of his companions, ranging from roguish archers, feisty mages, and just about anyone who can throw a rock really far upwards, began to pepper the embassy's facade with a mixed barrage of magic handcrafted and improvised projectiles. Sentinel's men lay off a cold sweat as they hugged themselves to their fortified positions. Big mistake, Sentinel smirked. Nat, turn on the auto turret now, 
He radioed in his subordinate once again. He reached into his pocket and grabbed his tablet, turning it on. He assumed control of the now online teacher. He needs a few precious seconds before the new turret is fully boots itself up. Face us if you dare. My armor and the shields of these brave souls draw our line in the sand. The armored individual challenged. Lay down your arms now. Sentinel gave his final warning just as he managed to attain full control of the turret. Come and take them. The armored individual taunted. The rest of his protected accomplices continue their childish assailment on the embassy. Your choice. Sentinel cursed. With a flick of his fingers, Sentinel roared the turret to life as its scattling barrels whirled away unleashing a millennial counted lash of .50 caliber rounds upon the insurgents. Upon impact, the bullets easily pierced the primitive shields and armors of those insurrectionists sometimes piercing through their bodies to their more fragile but ultimately insignificantly protected compatriots. For the armored man himself, his special armor of Scandinite only partially absorbed all the blows at the first barrage, as he looked on this fellow shield brethren. They lay dying aside him much to his shock, but he still refuses to relent. Coughing up the dust, the armored individual leading the assault continued to issue his challenge from his exasperated state. To his bewildered dismay, he peeked over the handguard behind the protected from side of his shield to see that there was blood, the crimson red blood blemishing his silvery blue gauntlets and a hole from his exotic scale shield that was designed to stop nearly anything that Leesia had to offer for it to be sanctioned with, magic or not. The otherworldly magic of these demons had pierced through his shield and his armor, striking a mortal blow at Elmer's heart. A capacious rupture on his breastplate mixed with chunks scrapped metal, flesh and his own blood grisly clarified the arrogant armor smith his own mortality. I, am, possible, Elmo collapsed as he drowned dryly on a pool of his own blood. What kind of magic was capable of piercing through Scandinite armor so effortlessly? The rest of his surviving retinue scattered away from the embassy's lamination, retreating back to the darkness of Tyrian's shadows. Much to the relief of the embassy's security detail. I think they got the message. Report this mess. Fuck. The security chief sighed. Was that the whole conspiracy already? It's best shot cut down into ribbons so effortlessly by the auto turret's breath. He doesn't expect much from these dissidents due to how primitive their communication lines were with each other in conjunction to their crude means of defiance as displayed earlier. What the hell? Sentinel commented when he caught a faint glimmer that tore him away from relief's sweet embrace. Looking over the far side, atop the rooftops of our half squares architecture, a faint orange glow arose above them. It was warm yet ominous appearing at several differing instances from his half-circle view of the Tyranny city center. Having his own suspicions, Sentinel quickly turned back to climb the stairs leading out to the rooftops of the youth embassy where the .50 caliber auto turret rested, its heated barrels, fresh from slaughter. To Sentinel's horror, the orange glows weren't just some luminous phenomena he had never seen before that the natives say can occur spontaneously at nights, but something much more sinister, he saw. From the reflection of his Google's tongues of fire that arose volcanically above Tyrian's skyline, the scent of burning ash and the distant screams of terror besieged his senses as more of these blazing eruptions sprouted forth at even more distant areas covering the citadel of Tyrian. Shield Father. This is Sentinel. The security chief gulped. This is Shield Father. I know. The colonel bluntly confirmed. I can see it from here and they are here too. He answered. A dissonant background static of firefighting and loud crashes of shockwaves echoed on the radio speaker. Dash. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. A booming voice dragged Lieutenant Samantha Rose from her sleep. Ah, wah. Samantha kicked and screamed as she was violently awoken. Normally there would be a gentle bell ringing that signified 8 a.m. which she would start the day with a quick morning exercise routine before breakfast. That followed by her usual day in the science lab doing tests or magic lessons with Eliathra and Iris. Lieutenant wake up. Major Holyfield opened the door to her quarters. 
quite unusually amusing enough wearing in a pair of purple pajamas with white stripes whilst carrying with him two pieces of luggage, an elongated briefcase with the Arsenal fabric insignia proudly being displayed and Samantha's own tactical backpack complete with her own personalizations intact. If Samantha can historically recall, that company is one of the controversial CSP-owned weapons manufacturers owned by the military-industrialist faction of the party who are disenfranchised by the megacorpo's incessant price gauging. He placed the briefcase over a nearby table and opened it quietly, to the lieutenant's non-surprise, a rifle come out of the briefcase, it had no speck to its aspect and gave off a sort of factory fresh scent based on the straightforward magazine. It's slightly heaving faint from the Major's old arms and its elongated barrel, this nightly rifle hit Sam Stockdrivia in her head on the courses of the Afif's arsenal. The FBR-97? The Lieutenant guessed. Close Lieutenant, but not quite, the Major rebuffed. The fabricated battle rifle 20. He excitedly smiled. He held out the gun in front of her with his two hands showcasing the rifle to the young lieutenant. Arsenal made a new model? Samantha asked. Holyfield quietly nodded. Indeed, the specs are that this FBR is the heavy variant, capable of shooting 7.62 millimeters of from the Stenags. He pointed to the magazine receiver. Following that is a next generic coil mitigation firing system making it shoot accurately at a range of 900 meters at a firing rate of 750 rounds a minute. Shooting wise, it's capable of pushing the limits of the 7.62 to be able to punch through 20 millimeters of anything solid. He playfully cocks the rifle lastly. All the plug and play all the army boys know and love from the seals to the colonial guards. He caressed the upper rail sides of the battle rifle as if his hands were cradling a delicate babe. That is all nice Major. Samantha nodded with an embarrassed smile, not for the seemingly humiliating occasion she is in but more of the fact that both of them are wearing their pajamas together and the lieutenant has got to say, the intimidating spearhead looked cartoonishly goofy in his purple with white striped pajamas, but why disturb me at this hour? It's like, I don't know. 1 a.m., she asked. In the vein of this new world and its culture, I am essentially knighting you. For in ancient times, kings would often knight brave squires if they have shown exceptional skill or shown to be ready for battle rather than all of the frilly ass formalities. That I could kill for damn poor crib right now, he muttered. But that's beside the point. I am knighting you know with the sharpest spear in the United Federation's grand arsenal to you Lieutenant Samantha Rose or Asset, Meetner as the Whigs call you to take up the banner of the Federation and lead us forward in this time of war. This FBR-20 shall become your sword, Holyfield said with a hint of prose. So, it is really happening, Operation Haymaker? Now, Samantha asked. Not yet, but the natives are tenacious. Much more tenacious than we thought, Holyfield said. Just as he had said those words, the emergency siren blared outside of Samantha's room as the blinking and wailing red had turned the serene underground facility into a perturbed rupture as the sleeping scientists and their support staff scrambled out of their beds in the wake of this unexpected emergency. Are we being invaded? Samantha exclaimed. Indeed. Sergeant Crocker is awaiting you outside of the facility with your land cruiser. He will fill you in the details but to spare you some thoughts, you're off to Tyrian now. Lock and load, gear up and do whatever magic stuff you did and beat them back. Holyfield stood up and passed Samantha several clips of 7.62 magazines onto her. You are now stride a lead again Lieutenant. What about you Major? Samantha asked. I will head to the command center and coordinate the defenses of New Albany by rousing the masses, Holyfield said. The attack is too pronged, Samantha asked. Yes, me and your CO, Polonsky will radio in soon once we get our bearings right. My call sign is Spearhead, Jans is Den Father. Get out there and teach these barbarians a lesson, Holyfield said. Roger that, Samantha saluted, and Lieutenant Holyfield paused her. Do take care that Polonsky had to pull some strings to get you back to where you were before and the rifle you have now. Do not make us regret this choice. 
he said with stern tone. Holyfield then dropped the backpack at top of Samantha's bed and left her to get herself dressed. Inside the bag was her old combat gear from her chest rig, beret, fatigues and boots. She quickly geared up in only a short span of a minute as she dashed towards the elevator with her new battle rifle and her magic powers in hand. On schedule Lieutenant Crocker tapped his wrists as he greeted her upon reaching the entrance. Inside Strider's land cruiser was everyone else of the squad, Diaz, Cain, Clay, Iris, Abed, and even Aliathra. It's good to be back, the lieutenant said. Clay, Citrep. She gave her first orders. Gladly. The radioman nodded. Tyrion is on fire right now and we need coordinate rescue efforts. We will be the front vehicle on a convoy to relieve the defenders of the embassy. Remember Devico's mansion? Crocker asked. Yes. I have some fond memories, Iris smirked sarcastically. Anyways, the security detail dug in and we need to relieve them and hold the place since the road around it is vital for the evacuation strategy of the native civvies in Tyrian. We are already coordinating with the town guard in evacuating everyone out of there whilst also taking out the fire with some of our Holodak crews. Crocker said. How big is the fire? Samantha asked. Multiple fires, several dozens of them sprouting out all over the city, caused by adventurers by the reports coming from the embassy's chief of security, Clay said. We are on. Adventurers? Why would the Grey Order do this? They are burning. People, Ailey Aethra jumped out of her seat to express her dismay. I don't know Ailey. Samantha differed, but we might find out today. Iris, when an opportunity presents itself. I need you to take a bite out of them. Eat up their memories and find out what they know. The lieutenant ordered. Ooh, I will find the most delicious of them to sink my teeth in. The vampire which sensuously acceded. Hey look over there. Crocker pointed out. Across the night sky distance, Samantha peeked over the land cruiser's windows to see the protective wall that made up New Albany's perimeter lit alight with activity. Gunfire and black powder bombardment from the combined arms of the colonial militia and the Marine Corps, decimated an infiltrating force of these mysterious attackers who despite their bravery were simply no match for the Federation's superior firepower. Their bodies dropped by the dozens upon the impregnable bastion of Colonel Polonsky's defensive formations. Damn it. This needs to stop fast. The lieutenant cursed. No time to waste. We have to hurry to Tyrian now. Ken informed her. What's our opposition's edge? How many of these people are we dealing with? Isaac came through. The Sarge dropped Clay's radio that he had held onto during the start of the trip. Approximately 1,000 of them split into two groups of 500, one here in New Albany and the other at Tyrian. Isaac says that the former is already being rooted as we speak but the Tyriani for is the most problematic. Crocker said, what is up with their madness? They just keep coming but our guns simply tearing them apart. Abidia sulked. He kind of felt sorry for all of these marauders. But then, he remembered how he protected his family upon hearing the sirens blaring on his neighborhood as he hid his wife and daughter on their underground shelter before he grabbed his guns and reported to Crocker back at the militia headquarters. He cannot feel sorry for people who would try to slaughter his family, his community and his nation even if they are unknowingly involving themselves in a lopsided affair. Samantha felt sick in the stomach upon gaining her bearings upon the situation. These attackers must be very daring and very malicious if they are to attack the New Albany and Tyrian. Especially to also cut down the good people of that citadel to burn their homes, slaughter entire families who were only living peacefully with the colony astounded her. Whoever dared on this has no idea who they just awoke from its complacent slumber. So, keep the corridor open and stop the fires, Samantha confirmed with her second in command. Yes, we will need to take out the fires and prevent more from sprouting up. You and Iris can easily use some of your magic to put them out quickly. Aliathra can heal any injured that comes our way and the rest of us boys will kill anything that ain't one of ours. Crocker said. Affirmative. Strider group. Lock and load we are going in hot. Samantha bestirred. Literally. Diaz chuckled to himself as he cocks Ruina. 
The land cruiser entered the Terian gates not a moment later as the quick response force sped through the streets upon the weary evacuation of the local Tiriani, from bewildered nobles, overwhelmed guards and confused peasants. These people kept to the sides as emergency workers and lawful enforcers converged to bring order from chaos. There were several buildings who were either still on fire or whose inferno was quenched thanks in part to the valorous townsfolks or the innovative industrial might of Federation firefighters. The many folks were grateful for these golden knights who braved the infernos to rescue their loved ones and prevent more material damage to descend upon the hapless citadel. But even then, these infernos were like a hydra. Extinguish one and two more will take its place somewhere else in the city. As Strider arrived at Ahaf Square, they disembarked from the land cruiser as the embassy security teams were fighting off another wave of their assailants. Their dynamic entry sent several of the abandoned market stalls and even a few of the attackers flying as their forms disintegrate upon the timely arrival of their mounted reinforcements. Slop these bastards quick. Crocker roared as he unleashed suppressive fire from his machine gun. The timely arrival of their cavalry relieved the beleaguered embassy. Security as fresh supplies, men and solace enveloped their position from their fellow countrymen. Great timing. I was told I was given special forces. Sentinel cheered. Special? Oh. Yeah. I am. We are. Samantha humbly smiled. She kind of liked the lilt on that title for Strider Group. Anyways you must be Crooker, the British accent, right? Sentinel turned to the sergeant. Yeah, tell me what did you and your men see? Crocker asked. These people with their swords and magics just came up to the embassy and started trying to scale us. Thankfully we fought them all back. But then I noticed that there was more to this attack than just the mansion. Yeah the fires. Who are these people and what are they hoping to achieve from this? Sentinel asked. Grey Order, Iris said upon a considerable distance. They turned to the vampire witch who was rather greedily and sloppily licked the fresh blood off of the dead invaders. Iris, don't eat blood like that. It's dirty. And adventurous? From the Grey Order? Samantha asked. Yes. This ring here? Iris pulled out a blood-stained ring from the corpse of a blue-armored man that Sentinel had killed earlier. This ring is only given to Grey Order who have reached the gold rank she informed. That's intriguing but more troubling. Why would they invade New Albany and Tyrian, let alone burn it to the ground? Samantha wondered. Is it because we drove them out of business with your mercs? Crocker nudged to Diaz, pulling his serene red jacket to provoke an immediate response. Maybe. I. but to be so pissed off that they would literally kill their potential employers just because we drove them out of business. Diaz defended. I agree. That doesn't make sense. Something else is going on here. Clay nodded. Well whatever the hell is going on we need to stop those fires. I can handle the evacuation from here but we cannot allow these burnings to continue any longer. Sentinel passed along his commentary. The city continued to be set ablaze as eruptions upon flarings upon outbreaks of infernos continued to bring hell upon earth on Tyrian. Aliathra, dismay with disgust couldn't believe that the Grey Order, a guild of prestigious adventurers who took up the Selzord to be the intrepid enterprise it was today be capable of causing such a brazen display of nihilistic cruelty. To think she had considered them a dignified institution. They cannot just be using torches to cause this much damage so fast. They must have a dozen or so pyromancers at their side. Likely rogue mages. Iris pointed out. That explains how they can cover so much ground so quickly. Sentinel nodded. People like them tend to not draw attention to themselves and only sell themselves for tasks that require a minimal to just don't destroy everything too much use of their magics whoever these pyromancers are must be uncharacteristically unhinged iris said i can see so they are just mages like you who don't fall under the college right or practice forbidden magic such as your necromancy samantha asked not exactly aliathra interjected it's a broad term to describe not only those who are not part of it but also those who are kicked out of the colleges too. Aliathra explained. Oh? How can one be kicked out? Ken asked. Well, the college, outside of being one of only two legal institutions to house, train and control the powers of mages, 
They are also quite competitive. As in cutthroat competitive, the elf explained, you could also get kicked out for violating their rules or simply failing at your lessons. Many of students can avail certain dot services if it keeps them from being allowed to practice their magics legally. That and joining the Grey Order, but most prefer if they can help it to stay with the college than the dangerous life of an adventurer. There is a sort of elitist inclination the higher you go up the hierarchy of the college. Aliathro expanded. Let me guess, it's pretty corrupt outside of the sparkly stuff, right? Samantha confirmed. She and the rest of Strider walked up to Samantha's side readying their weapons. Most of them stoically awaiting their next orders but listening intently nonetheless. Indeed. I have seen firsthand back at even my own college back home what some students are willing to do. I, rather save it for another day. Aliathra stuttered. B but what you need to know is that some of these mages go rogue so that they can practice their magics unimpeded. They tend to be wild than the more refined colleagues. She added, well that just means we need to stop them right now rather than later. Samantha psyched herself up. She held her new FBR-20 and conjured some ice magic on each of her hands. Neutralize these flames by any means necessary, Samantha said. Iris help me with your ice powers kill out those fires subdue any of these pyromancers that we can find. Clay be ready to coordinate the hull attacks on the fires me and Iris cannot reach. Alia throw if anyone you see gets injured. I want you to heal them, the rest of you boys, support all of what we are doing and take out anyone that tries to stop us, she ordered, remember your training La Dewey Rose, Iris reminded, yes, the party is watching, Crocker added, Strider group moved out upon the heel of their leader as they braved the streets of Tyrion once again, their heroics amongst the populace escalating to new heights as they encountered more of the ravaging Grey Order adventurers who cruelly put many of Tyrion's homes, property and establishments to the torch before disturbingly cut down any inhabitants that managed to escape in time upon being flushed out of their shelters. There was a mix of both humans physically imposing feline folks, orcs and even a few dwarves that are participating in this contumelious carnage with a side of infernal incitements. With their hearts beating with anger, their rifles emitting their castigation and their aura upon the winds of disgust, Strider group cut down the marauders mercilessly to the point that they almost forgot that they were encouraged to capture some of these adventurers alive. As Samantha had said, she and Iris went to work blasting cooling ice upon the raging fires that were left in the attack's wake, a reinvigorating steam brushed along their faces upon the fires quenching. Meanwhile those other fires that the more magically inclined members of the squad couldn't cover was dealt with the coordination of Cain and Claire as they radioed in the Halitax to spray their fire extinguishing sprays on those bonfires. Meanwhile, Diaz, Abidia and Crocker rescued as many civilians as they could, even personally getting their hands dirty with the Grey Order which was a very cathartic release for those three. As for those injured or maladies with burns, Aliathra, when not assisting Lieutenant Rose and Iris would heal upon her own two hands, take away their pain and urge them to flee to our half square where they can be much safer. For the elven maiden, seeing the Grey Order mercilessly kill maim and burn the innocent people of Tyrion upset her to highest degree. There were just too many injured that she was overwhelmed by their anguished cries. She saw burns, blood and bruises from the youngest to the eldest, the poorest to the eldest, human and dwarf and alike die in front of her in droves. There was just so many she could tend with her healing magics that she froze upon the sight of the corpse of a young girl's charred remains who was held closely by her equally smouldered further who tried to protect her from the raging blazes of their now ashen home. Kill all of them, praise to Nanith's name that we gave these infidels her mercy. One triumphant Grey Order guildsman blasphemously cheered as he proudly brandishes the decapitated top of a defenseless boy before Aliathra's distraught A's, his face frozen limp in the mean of horror life force sapped away in from the guilty swipe of a blood dripping blade, drenched in the essences of the innocents. You, she gave an accusing finger to the blasphemous adventurer and his posse of apostles. 
You have no right to say her name. The elf unsheathed her bow and with her superior reflexes and ranger training, humming a magic word to her bow, six magical arrows appeared above across the curve of her bow and chanted and now magically locking onto the six malicious men before her. Upon the release of her string, six arrows found their marks upon the hearts of the same six men who were hastily shot down before they could even take the initiative. There was fury. A righteous fury burning in Aliathra as she wasted no hesitation taking down the marauders with her bow. Her eyes maddened with grief, anger as she wishes to clear this sacred temple off of the filth and make way for all that is wholesome and good to be able to live another day. Through this nightmare where the cleric of Nenith swore to herself that night she will be their shield from upturning every corner whilst still keeping up with Samantha and the rest of Strider group. Aliathra would passionately rescue as many innocent civilians as she can whilst cutting down those Grey Order who dare a finger on them. Like a guardian angel, her holy fury knew no bounds to those who fell by her hand that day and those few insurgents who had the fortune to witness but not be caught by her saintly gaze. Meanwhile, it was a shooting gallery for Diaz, Abidiah, and Crocker who with their own respectable marksmanship skills kept their tallies of kills going as they suppressed the insurgents through the thunder of their guns. Foul demons. An assertive voice reverberated on Abidiah's ears. You there, the one with the long beard who cuts down many of these brave souls by the mere sight of your gaze, I challenge you. Abidiah turned around to see a short-haired man with a pointed beard challenge the marksman with his sword tip pointing towards him. To his disgust before his feet were the sliced corpses of even more innocent civilians of Tyrian. My blade hungers for the blood of you demon folks. I grow tired of cutting down your sick offense and now I wish to test my mettle against you for I am Stefan Ahadid. The greatest swordsman in all of Sainagrad shall be your vanquisher and the one of the many salvation crusaders of the Grey Order of Gleesia. The swordsman introduced himself. Salvation? You call all of this salvation? Is this some sick joke? Abidiah questioned. Be silenced. I will kill you. Then find the rest of your kinsmen and slaughter your entire bloodline forever. Stefan galvanized. You wouldn't dare hurt my family. Abidiah growled as he ready to draw April from his pocket as he tensed his knees to ready to accept the trial of combat of this worthless excuse of a man to his challenge. I will when I mount your head on my estate's wall in guard. Stefan decreed as he charged towards Abidiah, but it was a fatal mistake. For the swordsman brought a blade to a gunfight. With dead eye accuracy, Abidiah shot Stefan's sword hand off, causing a torrent of blood, a fracturing of bone to detonate from its furrow. Stefan collapsed to the ground as he grasped in vain his other hand to stop the bleeding of his severed arm. Abidiah walked closer to him as dreadful tears and an angered frown paint itself on Stefan's visage. The ironically disarmed swordsman, who was dishonorably bested by an equally dishonorable armament, the humble revolver, spat on Abidiah's boot as the ground quake as his adrenaline-addled senses reverberate on his slowly dying self. Well, what are you going to do demon? Stefan asked. This. Abidiah cocked his revolver. He may not be a soldier or would be a willing participant for a war but if anyone were to come after him and his family, he will show them a whole new meaning to the phrase bite of more than you can chew. But just as the bearded huntsman was about to squeeze the trigger, Crocker intervened. A bed. We need him. Crocker intruded. We need this so new verbiage to dice edge. Abidiah protested. He will after he tells us. Crocker implored. Iris, come over here. The sergeant called out to the vampire witch who was busy extinguishing the last embers off of a once proud tailor shop. You call for me? Iris asked. Yeah. Do your thing with your teeth with this fuck. I want to know everything he knows. Crocker ordered. Oh, with pleasure. Iris happily obliged. She teased her fangs to the dread of the injured swordsman. Stefan noticed those fangs. A cold death by the hands of a blade was preferable to the deathly fangs of the vampire kind, whose birthplace was where Tyrion's lands lay upon on. He tried terrifyingly tried to wiggle away to keep his living blood away from the vampire witch. It is said that vampires grow more esoterically powerful the more blood they consume. No, stay back foul creature. You truly are monsters just as they say. You and your Sochefil are all monsters. 
he cried. Hold him down Diaz. Crocker ordered Vincent with both of their weight pinning the desperate and defeated man to the ground giving the vampire witch ample room to enact her profane ritual. She lustfully caressed Stefan's nape with her snow-white fangs and upon savoring the scent of his blood from beneath the thin layer of skin, Iris unleashed her fangs upon the swordsman's neck, gouging his arteries and sating her sanguine thirsts avariciously. For one agonizingly long minute, Iris helped herself to the healthy blood of the fine specimen before her. Stefan's blood, as vigorous as a prized stallion was delectable to her. Vampires of her kind had their tastes on what blood they prefer to consume but the general consensus is no different to how one would select which cattle is best consumed for slaughter, not too fat, not too lean and healthy without any ailments or maladies that can disrupt the taste of the blood upon his such a feels macabre appetites. Ah, Iris released her straddle upon the now dried prune that was Stefan. The accelerated blood loss causing him to expire as his body rails as rigor mortis and the warmth passion of enjoying the heat of battle has turned frigid. She convulsed with an electrifying jolt of her body as the memories of the man flooded her mind for her to see. She sees visions of the truth of the matter. To her utter animosity, the people that swayed Stefan and the rest of these marauding horde into Tyrian was none other than the Stlaeetan Empire. Under the guidance of the prophecy of Jeltagar's comet, they wished to preemptively attack scout and despoil the Federation's boons off of the Tyriani out of envious fear. The Empire, wanting to hamstring the Federation or demons as they insist, they call the other worlders by famishing them off of their soul feed who are the very denizens of Tyrian itself. Under the orders of a Madame Gwarthan which means to a nomniglet such as herself, in much more refined victory for the word shadow a code name disguised for an anonymous mastermind. This salvation crusade led by the gold-ranked adventurer Radra the Flagrant are the perpetrators of this heinous act, that in all official terms, such a ravishing attack on an empire city would have been an illegal quest in all sense of the words. The vampire witch was disgusted and aching beyond any sensation as she wobbled clumsily, barely able to stand upright as she her back by a nearby lamp post. Iris, what did you see? Crocker asked. So much so much I know. Iris muttered, what do you mean by that? Diaz asked, it is Suthiel all over again. Iris summarized, the Empire, the College, the Grey Order and the Elves too. They wish to be rid of you because the stupid prophecy they believe that you are the demons returning. Them bollocks, the sergeant recoiled and cursed. Why, I ought to show them what real demons can do. He cracked his fists. Hearing upon Iris' revelations made the blood of the other men of Strider group boil furiously. All they ever done to Tyrion was help and aid them in their day-to-day -day struggles and this is how the Empire responds to their own subjects even? You know what this means right? The sergeant implicated. What else do you know? Crocker pressed forward for more answers. Stop. Iris placed her hand to buffer distance between her and the sergeant. I need a moment. The vampire witch massaged her temples to soothe the workings on her still dizzied brain. All of the stress of putting out the fires and sudden running over of her cerebellum has taken Iris to her mental limits. She was not so used to inhaling the fumes of burning buildings, nor was she prepared to see the panging anguish of the people of Tyrion's terror over this catastrophe blazing around them literatine. In all of her dual centuries of only reading such events in her encyclopedic collection, it had not prepared her for any of this. A sympathy, something she never thought she could empathize was how she felt for the mutilated people of Tyrion that day and a newfound respect for the valiant local volunteer fire brigades who shoves buckets of water from the well to quench the fires in support of the Federation's efforts to contain the inferno. With a new paradigm innately recognized within herself, Iris Kadahagan looked on to her companions, who gathered around to make sure she was okay. A familial warmth she had lacked all of her life finally being experienced genuinely from first hand of the first true people she can call her friends. The vampire witch began to lighten up as she took a moment to take a breath. Damn, remind me never to take you out on an all-you-can-eat buffet for a date. Ken who sprinted to Iris upon seeing her stammered condition commented, 
he did saw a glimpse of Iris' interrogation of the swordsman on orders from Crocker and how she savoured the man's blood every moment as she took her sweet time draining him. Not, as well as I regaled on you, she smiled with a flirty lilt, Stefan's blood dripping out of her beam much to Kane's embarrassment and chaff date, you a thing now Kane? You and Iris? Abidaya asked, gesturing his fingers pointing to both him and rapidly back to Iris. Yeah, you can say that, the Nigerian scratched his head. I am happy for you too. Don't be embarrassed. Diaz smiled. Where's Samantha now though? The LT? Crocker asked. Last I checked she was with Clay who told her that the drones found some tangos that are causing most of the fires, Kane said. We got a hustle up now. Crocker rallied. All of Strider nodded as they followed the sergeant to Samantha's last position, though a dire before he sped off with the rest of his squad, unloaded a round of his pistol at Stefan's corpse before spitting at him just to satisfy his familiar Lana and his own manhood. Meanwhile for the lieutenant, Samantha was sprinted past more of the charred remains of Tyrion Street scanning down all that she saw participating on this bonfire. The fires around her soon broiled Samantha's skin that instinctively the lieutenant casted a ward that was taught by her from Alia Thre that helps her body withstand being near scalding temperatures and allow her to press on through with less difficulty. As soon as she did cast that ward, Samantha soon realizes she is now turning over the very sources of all of the fire being invoked upon the citadel. Lo and behold, Samantha saw a dozen or so pyromancers setting fire to all of the buildings until all are ash, the screams of the trapped inhabitants crying in anguish to the skies which made the lieutenant's fist clench indignantly. You, stop this! Samantha pointed to one of the pyromancers she assumes as the leader. A literally fiery-headed woman turned around her, her dual-wielded magic staff spurning brightly with her Azumano crystals to contrast her cardinal blush. An aura similar to the flame golem Samantha had fought so many months ago was what this woman presented herself to the lieutenant. Look at all of this, can you see them all scream? Hear the fire crack as all is made pure. Once again by fire? One of the pyromancers said. Silence neophyte. The leading woman ordered. She stepped forward and showboated her blazing visage to Samantha showing how the flames harmlessly decorate her dress. It disgusted the lieutenant that she is seeing a dark parody of herself within that head pyromancer. Holyfield and the party were right, if she were to lose control, she might as well end up like her. You must be one of the demons Radrid speaks about. To be honest you don't look too much, but then again. You I have never seen a demon before so who am I to judge? She said. Whoever you are, what you did is unforgivable. Samantha raised her fist. Suntanild, pyromancer extraordinaire. The lady introduced herself with a playful bow. I have been waiting for one of you demon lots to show up. Grilling all these damned souls have been such a bore after a while. It is like burning insects. It's satisfying at first but gets boring soon after. You're insane. Samantha accused Sand. The pyromancers collectively laughed in response to the lieutenant's denouncement. Insane? Yes I am. But even I know that destroying Tyrion will also destroy you with it. Sand laughed along. The pyromancers soon began to charge themselves up with their magical implements to ready for their next spell. Now then, burn in cleansing fire like the rest of your cattle, Sun declared. Upon a quick reaction, Samantha conjured with her newfound powers an ice wall knowing ice beats fire, a direct counter to what she anticipates an infernal barrage from these hot-headed pyromaniacs. Her training with Iris and the years studying in West Point dictates how she can easily predict an opponent. For such an empathetic set of individuals such as the pyromancers, they were fairly not that hard to discern that all they could do was attack. Attack and attack with fire-based magics. The ice wall arose from the ground about a few inches short tall of Samantha's chest when the barrage of fire magics converged on her position. Samantha doved down and hugged herself upon the safety of the ice wall. Steam and melting snow were all that was created from the pyromancer's spells as they impacted the wall. Upon Discovering their attacks were negated. The pyromancers looked on dumbfounded upon the sight of the demon warrior that came to confront them was also proficient with magics too. Instinctively seeing an opening, 
Samantha took a page from the old classical show of Avatar, specifically the earthbenders on how they would manipulate the very structural bending attacks to give off rock solid offense and defense. With her defense secured, it was time to fight back. Rallying up her powers again, Samantha willed herself to shatter the ice wall with her mano-enhanced fists, shattering the barrier to glass shard pieces before sending them flying like a buckshot of razors towards the pyromancers. Several of them were killed instantly upon their bodies being punctured by the ice spikes that the lieutenant produced. The rest took cover. Take this, Samantha cheered as she aimed her FBR-20 at the hunkered down pyromancers. She managed to shoot down all of them except for the leader seemed, for she casted an auric fire cloak on her person that negated Samantha's non-magical projectiles. Impressive. But playtime is over now. Sun shimmied her ignited hand. Flaming bull, the pyromancer shouted, sprouting forth from the mad firebug's hands, conjured in a tronoc. As its name suggests, a life-sized bull articulated by magic and constructed through fire charged straight for the lieutenant. Samantha tried to shoot at the infernal construct but at the worst possible time. Her FBR-20 clicked out, indicating that there was no more 7.62 mm in the magazine left. Alarmed, the lieutenant's draft right with a well-timed dodge roll just as the bull was about to gorge her with its magma glowing horns. Using her magic to feed more mana to her flaming bull and controlling its movements, the construct grew further in size until the heat it gives off near sun-like temperatures. The artificial animal turned around back upon missing its target to attempt for the kill again on the lieutenant. As Samantha stood back up, Lieutenant Rose realizes she needs to think fast otherwise the bull or the pyromancer can get a drop on her. As she dodged the bull's charges, Samantha begins to think fast. The lieutenant knows that she will need to kill Sund quickly less she continues her mad arson spree and destroy more properties and lives too. Seeing all of the bittersweet flames engorge itself on her surroundings and her own exhaustion due to still being left naked without her proposed Hecate suit made the lieutenant sense that she was slowly losing out on her mana. The corpses of Sim's fellow pyromancers whose frames were ruptured to allow once stocked mana reserves to leak out made were starting to become appetizing for Samantha to siphon. An idea popped into her head as she decided to lead the bull towards the corpses of Sun's dead accomplices knowing she will need a considerable sum of mana to pull this gamble off. The lieutenant quickly raised her hand on each of the pyromancer corpses and ripped out all the spilled mana their corpses could take. Having siphoning the mana she began to charge her hands readying herself for a great release of energy. Electrical bolts and crimson heat gathered around her hands that made the lieutenant's hands carom with excitement, not just for the excitement of her high risk but high reward plan but literally she is making the mana energy particles she discharges from her hands. Carbon began to fully burn out amongst the superheated energies as the crimson fire she conjured turned to a brilliant blue ball of light with electromagnetic magnetic energies sparkling slightly around. By the gods, Sund commented as she observes the demon which she faced. The pyromancer saw how Samantha desecrated the mana energies off of her dead comrades, a disgusting but pragmatic act that only the most skilled of sorcerers can do since mana dissipates rather quickly without a suitable means of containment. For example, a crystal or a person. At first, Sun thought the demon witch was like those sorcerers. However upon an observation of her right hand, she noticed the symbols on Samantha's hand. It was written in ancient Viguri, a language she had studied during her collegiate days. It was Ranu Patur or the shareholder. One of the chosen one brands the sacred crystal heart bestows upon people to bless them with great power. Why why you? She pointed a libelous finger on the lieutenant. Ranu Putra ad interim. Samantha careful footwork managed to lure the bull to align itself unknowingly with its controller, it was aimed just right that the bull was trying to charge straight at her while the still flabbergasted pyromancer was directly at her construct's six o'clock, with the ball of siphoned mana at her hand reaching to super critical point that if it stayed any longer in her hand, she would implode. One shot was all Samantha needed as she went all in. Have a taste of your medicine you bitch, Samantha yelled as she unleashed the superheated mana energies from her hand. In one brilliant cerulean ball of azure fire, 
The enthusiastic mana energies blasted through the flaming bull, obliterating it from existence from sheer demoniac power. Nonetheless, the bull was virtually nothing upon contact as its power soon became one with Samantha's as the sphere pushed across the battlefield and on to Sun the pyromancer herself. I I am possible. Sun screamed as her frame disintegrates upon contact of the blue fire Samantha struck her with. In life, she always lived like passionately flame and ironically, the way she goes is through the fires and flames of another. As the battle concluded, Samantha collapsed to the ground as the rest of Strider group rallied towards her. LT, Crocker fretted as he caressed Samantha's head and lay at the top of his collapsing knees. Sadge. Hee hee hee. Samantha chuckled lightly. Guys. I did it. She turned to all of her squad who attended her. You did what? Clay asked. Wait. Hang on. Yes. Medivac at my coordinates. It's Asset Lefay. She has been injured. Yes now. He radioed command. Samantha turned her eyes to Iris and Aliathra lay on her side. The former wiping of the blood she had siphoned off of that swordsman from earlier and the latter applying soothing energy of her restoration magics upon the lieutenant. Iris. Ailey. I did it. She smiled. I know you did. And I am proud of you. You have to tell me how you did it soon. Iris acknowledged. Save it for later. I need a damn nap and maybe a banana milk smoothie. Samantha smiled. The thunderous vibrations of Super Osprey became the only thing that the lieutenant heard as Strider group taken her inside the medivac and extracted away. With the pyromancers, the main driving force of Tyrion's incineration eliminated the infernal contagion was stopped dead in its tracks. The firemen able to completely extinguish the rest of the fires that still burn through the night without worry of new ones sprouting their destructive aspects somewhere else in the citadel. The Halita choppers sprouting out their innovative weapons against the flame, a cooling foam and most peculiar to the natives a strange gun-like device that gives a sonic wave that although harmless to any humanoid folks, was fatal upon the flames making contact with the invisible energy. As metal dragons hovered above onto Tyrion's smoldered remains a lone figure watched above the skyline. They are stronger than I have thought, Lindis. The Cephid Liad spymaster muttered to herself. She had observed the battle in all of its details and to see how quickly and easily these other worlders disposed of several adventurers, mercenary warriors, and sellswords of respectable renown. Normally the Empire would have trouble dealing with them more often to complement their royal weaknesses in the legions to hire several of them as auxiliaries or eight Goliani, but all were irrelevant to the might of these other worlders. It was little wonder how even the elite elven warriors back in Suthiel were so handily defeated by these other worlders that she was almost impressed by their prowess. But as Lindis can conclude within the context of this upcoming war, a direct attack from Little Hill would be suicide for the Alliance of the Light, the alliance between her people the Eth Island Elves, the Slay Aegean Empire and Dwarves of the Asrix. As Lindis concluded, they will have to draw the other worlders out from the Empire's strong points and protract the conflict under home territory if they are to stand a chance. However, this doesn't yet explain how to actually defeat the demons. They possess both superior physicalities under their humanoid guises whilst wielding mighty arms and beasts that thunder upon every strike or step those machineries make. If Lindis can somehow gather her hands on some form of research material then perhaps the Alliance of the Light might be able to reverse the means of being able to genuinely fight back when they had so far failed to. There were still no events of the demons devouring the souls of the humans they held in bondage over here in Tyrion, but it is likely they are saving them for the big assault against the Alliance once they make the trek over the mountains and into the Empire proper. Upon her own reasoning, the other worlders might think that this raid conducted by Radrid their flagrant might have been just their one and only time opportunity to attack them before they could fully mobilize so security should lacks just enough for Lindis to finally move inside the belly of the beast and extract some useful bits of information to salvage her little failed experiment. Those little demon imps that some of the larger ones often escort around might work best for an acquisition of as Lindis had initially observed on her few scouting missions. The demons must have their own growth cycles to further saturate their numbers and they start with these tyke-sized imps. 
Additionally, it was much easier to bring home a live subject that she can easily carry on horseback without too much of a fight if she were to capture one of these whelps off of Tyrion than one of their fully grown warriors. She and likely the rest of the College of Magi will have many plans for experimentation and dissection upon acquisition of a live test subject. It wasn't much but it is a good start to base their plan of fighting this invasion upon. For one of their demonic arms however, that can be a bit of a challenge but the Sapphire Liad Spymaster is ready to improvise or abandon the prospect of acquiring as she believes know how to hurt the enemy might be more important than how the enemy can hurt them. She stood up and then turned around, still blanketed by her invisibility cloak but just as she was about to leave. Lindus caught someone familiar with her owl sharp eyes, a familiar blonde maiden with leaf pointed ears traveling in concert with the otherworldly demonic warriors and a such air fill. Princess you are truly one of them now, I will have no choice but to see to end your life as your family. Your former family's honor dictates who knew you were such a weakling after all. You treat the demons and that vile vampire like they are your friends much like how much of a pampered little puppy you were and really are, to sell your soul for worldly companionship, Lindus mocked and one final comedic laugh for the night. She then promptly disappeared, dashing back to her secret camp in the Verdon River Valley forest to acquire a certain stock of something she managed to smuggle into Tyrion's borders that might be just what she needs to pull this mission off. She will also have to send one more tweet a bird message to tell to Emperor Alden and Mita the crow of her findings. Though due to some limitations to the spell, she will have to speak in code to relay the intelligence and her suggestions as the spell has a limited capacity to hold enough words in. Soon, I will know every little secret of yours, Linda schemed. Dash. Radrid the flagrant awoke sluggishly upon the combined sensations of what he can discern is a light becking on his head and Malinari's gaze finally arising to greet her subjects in her naked self once again as morning began, the jostling of a few scratches of his face plus the blinding radiance of Malinari's made him realize that he was very much still alive and also, he was being pecked by a vulturine murkrow, coming to peck a few pieces off of him for an easy meal. The dark green bird flew off of Radrid as he slowly rose up from the soft pile of Ah, Radrid gasped as he realizes that what he lay upon was a heap of corpses, corpses of those brave souls who followed him to the gates of the demon stronghold in Tyrion. Their faces were frozen in either peaceful calm or petrified terror that neither sight of which comforted the gold-ranked adventurer. The corpse pile was laid upon a dug hole as if they were about to be ready to be buried en masse to the soft earth that was Nenith's flesh. Radrid hurryingly climbed out of the pile of corpses but unknown to him he was greeted by a more macabre scene. There were more mass graves of his fellow adventurers stacked high in their grisly remains of exploded body parts and shredded flesh as the scent of death and dried blood filled his lungs with terror. He saw human, orcs, mstari, and dwarf dead lay messily atop each other like bundles of hay as great iron machines that belch a disgusting smoke ploughed them like dirty to the mass graves that awaits them. Radrid's ego was offended to no bounds. He had never failed a quest in his entire career ever and all the reputation, the riches, and associates he had fought tooth and nail for would fall away from his fingers now that he comes home empty-handed. Earlier that night he would rather die in this god's forsaken ground than face the music of humiliation. Earlier that night was an absolute disaster, upon chancing on the first patrol of otherworlders he and his men encountered. They were absolutely torn to shred by their black-colored staves and crystal towers that thundered flashes of fire that flickered their forms into the dark new moon last night. All of his adventurers tried as they might to fight back but their combined arms were simply too overwhelming to bear like a flood that crashes down upon a village. They decimated the Salvation Crusade. Last that Radrid remember was the ground erupting before him before he fell into unconsciousness. But just as the adventurer was about to commend his spirit, he had heard some footsteps that trembled the ground not too far away from him. 
laying still to pretend he is one of the dead but not certainly among them. Radrad looked on as a man in a blue clothed waddled his way up the mountains of corpses. H.H. help me. A feeble voice of another alive but much more injured adventurer that had accompanied Radrad in his salvation crusade grabbed the blue clothed man by his feet. The strange man didn't respond any words only picking up a small and unsteely shaped sidearm holstered on his waist and aimed the gizmo like a wand of sorts to the injured adventurer. In one loud thunderous crack of his strange wand, the injured adventurer collapsed now finally amongst the dead. In the wand's wake, the murkrows flew away fearfully upon the sound of the blue-clothed man's wand. Radrid wondered, that perhaps that wand of his is a powerful weapon of sorts as he has seen last night that his fellow otherworlders like him wield to decimate his men. He quietly followed the man until the otherworlder stopped to overlook the desolate scene before him, his wand holstered at his side whilst the man covered his eyes from Malinry's glare with his two hands. Sneakily, Radrid grabbed the wand from the man with the skill of his sleight of hand and dashed away. Or you, the blue clothed otherworlder turned to yell, realizing he has been pickpocketed. The chase is on as Radrid, with a dozen meter head start, tumbled down the mountains of corpses of his fellow adventurers. Leon, he skipped along with the bodies of his comrades whilst weaving past more patrols of similarly blue clothed men as he finally makes it to a green glade where he can easily hide amongst the trees. After getting some distance among the trees, Radrid observed the treasure he had obtained it an L shaped wand of sorts with very intricate steel engravings. Upon closer inspection, the gold-ranked adventurer notices that the wand is actually composed of many separate components that are connected together by joints and some screws, the sort of craftsmanship only the most advanced of blacksmiths can replicate that perhaps if given to them, might be able to indeed reproduce these ones for alliance of light's mages to use against the demons. Radrid felt smug upon realizing he can still salvage this mission by returning back home with this single loot, he can demand a significant premium to compensate him upon turning in the strange one to the mage's college for research since he is likely the only fruitful survivor of this ill-fated attack that was more of suicide mission than anything else. If he ever encounters that Madame Gwarthen again he will show her a piece of his mind and the vengeful scorn of all of his fellow dead adventurers. He fiddled with the wand a little but he unknowingly pulled down a thin strip of metal that activated a mechanism within the device's intrinsics whilst the wand's shooting tip faced him. A bright flash of light and a loud bang immediately followed as Radrid limply crashes down to the glade's grass-filled floor as his spirit expires. He was never destined to ever complete his quest. Dash. Damages? Governor White asked solemnly. 581 deaths. 600 or so injured and about half of the city burnt down, Thomas reported. Lord Almighty, he sunk down to absorb all of that information. The governor with the Ministry of Education Wick was with Major Holyfield and Luther Amirian observing the post-disaster disposal of all the debris and waste throughout the citadel, both material and human. There was the wails of widows, mourning orphans and distraught other folks throughout the citadel as the local temples declared just this morning a full week of lamentation for all that was lost. Any significant damage? The governor asked. I am afraid we do. Luther raised his child's length hand. I was told that Princess Aria, Clovich's sister has been knocked out when she was attacked by an ogre that one of those raiders brought with them. Try to protect her family herself but she and her bodyguards got more what they bargained for. Thankfully some of your men came in and managed to save her and her retinue before something horrible happens. She is alive but needs to sleep a lot according to your apothecaries. I think they call it a comma. The dwarf merchant said. Damnation. That is still bad either way for the prince's sister. Thomas tightened his fist in frustration. Clovich's reaction upon hearing of all of this can go either way for us to all of this, he will not be happy no matter what we say. What are our options? He said to Jeremy. I can put a good word for all of you that you managed to help out many of the folks here when the fires happened when the prince does return back from his long journey. Mirian butted in. That is welcome. The governor gave his gratitude. 
At this moment, all of their previous engagements in diplomacy to the contacts they have made are now put to the test. A friendly gesture of commitment and acknowledgement to a few influential token pieces on the grand strategic board is priceless right now. Well Holyfield, looking at all of this, I say we have our casas belly now are we correct? The governor turned to Holyfield, Major, you are quiet right now. Thomas Sight turned to Holyfield, for Major Benjamin Holyfield, he only stared blankly at all the destruction that Tyrion had endured last night. From the safety of his command bunker, he still had night terrors of all the barbarous and cruel acts that were happening during those 130 minutes of sheer anxiety which was the duration of the entire attack on both the Principality and the colony. He could only imagine not just the screams of terrors but the marauding laughter of power the savages had done to all of the good folks of Tyrion. It made his blood boil that these people would be so daring and so cruel enough to do such a misguided thing. From the reports of Aris Kadahagan's findings, these savages wanted to deny the Federation their soul food before they could commence their second demonic invasion upon the Empire. But for all intents and purposes, they have just guaranteed it. Preferably, if it were up to the governor and his inner circle, he would create a false flag operation to generate a much more controlled incident with a few manipulations and calculated gambits at the right place and time to gain the green light they need to push for the Holyfield's grand pacification campaign of Gleesia. They never wanted the Casas Billy to be from the results of what they see before them. However, knowing the Federation's public, an attack on innocent civilians that are considered friendly to the Federation with a simultaneous assault on one of their colonies does curry more political favor to be seen at the frontier of the Federation's territories. This time, there will be no shortage of volunteers, no shortage of patriots, and no shortage of vengeance engraved deeply into the hearts of them all. For today, the real demons have shown themselves, and it is this so-called Alliance of the Light. Yes. The horrific scene here at the frontier today as the citadel of Tyrion, a native settlement friendly to the Federation was barbarically razed to the ground last night. Witnesses report that a group of hostile locals killed and tortured many dozen of establishments and peoples that were amiable to the colony of New Albany. Let's see if we can get a statement from the governor. Governor White, a newscaster and his camera drone reported before the journalist spotted Governor White amongst the attending crowd of Federation personnel coordinating the rebuilding efforts. He walked eagerly towards the governor and placed his microphone next to the governor but Major Holyfield shielded the governor away from the mic and stole it himself. It's those goddamn Slaegians and their Dungeons and Dragons lackeys. Every last one of them should be rounded up and shot. Holyfield fumed out. That is quite a statement. The newscaster recoiled upon the Major's controversial quote. And his camera drone was doing a live broadcast in front of many of the Federation's attentive gaze right now. You need to have you and every one of you couch potatoes at home. Wipe the shit stain out of your eyes and look at all of this. Holyfield flailed his arms back at the devastation in the background. If these savages want to have a war then let's give it to them. Holyfield lambasted under the camera before speeding off. Major has several preparations he will need to finalize with Polonsky and the rest of all the able-bodied men of the youth beef in this new theater of war. Soon, the Federation will respond in kind, for unknowingly to the Alliance of the Light they have just awoken a sleeping giant, and gave him a thirst for the sweet wine that is vengeance. Chapter 41, A Demon in Plain Sight, A Resplendent Malinries ascended towards the amaranthine sky over New Albany today but the usual peaceful bird chirps, howling livestock, and the yawn of awoken peoples did not greet that day. Instead, the day's first melodies were the thunderous swirl of six super ospreys that made their final approach to the new Albany airfield where Colonel Polonsky, Thomas Sight, Lulia Amirian and Dr. Malone awaited idly by at the tarmac. They had heard the news of this wing's arrival and they were very eager to see its cargo with their own eyes. Earlier a few days ago, Colonel Polonsky had authorized Jaguar Group, with additional elements from some Ufif Marine Corps to intercept a shipment of exotic minerals that was destined to go to the Empire whom war has been formally declared upon by the Federation who are now roused and preparing for a fight. If word of these Actocolite, Scandinite, 
and Gyronite were to be believed by Iris, Martin, Lua, Aliathro and every other folk they talk of this subject about, these minerals promised vast amounts of possibilities ranging from fully harnessing the power of the mana crystals and in contrast negating any harmful effects caused by it. According to Captain Mendoza, the raid was an astounding success with no casualties and the maximum damage for the caravan who didn't know what hit him. Absolutely no survivors and all the precious cargo that they transported is now the Federation's. There was a bit concern from the Colonel's part about if all of the Ospreys can fit all of the minerals in their holds as Mendoza had stated that they can barely all fit inside, but the rest of the journey back home was only met by minor turbulence caused by rogue gale winds. Additionally, Jaguar Group was authorized to confiscate any other unidentified materials for study. As the strike teams safely disembarked from the Ospreys with their precious cargo, Dr. Malona excitedly bolted to the containers carrying the minerals with the dwarven merchant Luya a following suit with his stubby legs to help authenticate the haul. David marveled at their curious brilliance and smiled amusingly on how convenient they were all molded into ingot bars too. Actocolites were the warm reddish bronze ingots that is reported that when forged into bladed weapons or bows their mystical properties can be much more easily bestow magical enchantments into the object it will be formed upon to last longer and become more potent in output. Additionally, weapons forged in Actocolite significantly dull less often than more conventional materials. Scandonite in contrast with its cooler purplish blue ingots that is incredibly dense and heavier than the other two minerals hauled in. It is also quite flexible upon cutting down the size of it to form more acute shapes. It shares the similar ease of magical enchantments that its sister Actocolite possess but due to its heavier nature. The mineral is best used to forge adamant armors, blunt weapons and even sometimes weapon components. In Dr. Malona's experience, scandonite is similar to the Federation's synthetic plasteel compounds. Lastly, there is the dark jade ingot known as gyronite, also known as the anti-magic mineral. Its application is much more niche but is very much just what the war effort is looking for, an effective magic countermeasure. It is used to multi-compound armor to make very magic-resistive protection much as a bulletproof vest. Additionally, if you can form the ingot into something that is enclosed such as handcuffs for the magically adept or a containment room to hide off one's mana signature from magical detection then in conclusion, Gyronite is the most purposive hole among them. Ah! The little voice in my head is telling me to do so many great things with it. Dr. Malone joyously hugged each an ingot of Actocolite, Scandonite and Gyronite like a little girl would cuddle her dolls ecstatically. What kind of stuff? Polonsky inquired. Well, the quad weave Hecate suit for Samantha for a start. But I only need like a few ingots to make them. For the rest, I am seeing new armor plates for our personnel and vehicles, some new blades, and finally, I can experiment with that trophy system. The doctor rambled. His excitement was like the mountains rising upwards as he couldn't contain his cavalier mood on being the vanguard of progress, likely a side effect of his chosen one brand, Astigol, the scholar. Meanwhile, Lunar Amirian's eyes widened at the extensive hall that the other worldly warriors had brought back and he was left aghast. Do you know what and how much of this did you steal? Luna turned to Polonsky. Not really, but if it was meant for an army of 1,000 then I say we put an effective stop to whatever their plans were. Thomas Sight shrugged. You don't understand this. How us dwarves live? Luna muttered. You barely talk about your homeland. Polonsky turned. Is there something you want to say? Nankarim. The southernmost dwarven hold of the Astorux was my home. It was the closest to the south and it's unlike most holds. The dwarf said. How so? Thomas inquired. The four great holds, Kerfaldur, Tyler, Darbadi, Merlirum, they are the cities you think of when you think of the dwarves of the Aslrix. Great mines, bejeweled roads, and sophisticated tunnels are how the whole dynasts through the strength of their bloodline continued to rule until this day. Luna explained. Bloodline? Are they mages? Thomas asked. Indeed. 
they produce many exceptional geomancers of great power, one whose job is to dig the mines for more great minerals that the dynasts control. However, Nankarim, my home hold is unlike those great holds. Luya a voice dropped melancholically. Dwarven society is split into two parts, the noble hold dwarves who sit opulent upon themselves at their thrones within the mountain holds whilst the terraced dwarves are the commoners, farmers, labourers, shepherds and all that. Nankaram is ruled mostly by these terraced dwarves and me and my family descended upon them. The mountain I had once called home is more suited to grazing livestock, a war terminal, a stone quarry, and nothing else. It's poorest of the holds due to not having as rich mine as all the rest. Luya stared wholeheartedly to the youth. There was not much opportunity to do much of anything there so that is why I and several of my kin moved to Terian and became merchants, forwarding trade between the dwarves and the citadel for decades if I recall. I had an old friend that once taught a young lady by the name of Aris Kadahag and Sigilry for her budding talent in enchantments. I see. But how does this explain that look on your eye? Thomas asked. Hold and terrace dwarves don't really see eye to eye often, and even if they do, it is not quite amiable. Most often or not, dwarven society is that the terrace serve to the magically empowered hold dwarves, specifically at the mines. Luther said. Oh, I see where this is going. Thomas tickled his chin as he began to piece together Luya's story in cross-reference to the fabulous loot they had acquired, but go on. The Actocolite, Scandonite and Gyronite ingots you stole is, in my experience over two decades worth of toilsome deep mining under the earth, and the fact that you had stolen all of this is not going to sit well. Not going to sit very well for the dwarves and the empire when the latter finds out, Luya said. How hard is it to harvest these minerals anyway? Dr. Malona butted in. It is no secret that some miners die just to obtain them. The dwarf bluntly answered. Cavens, appalling conditions, low wages, being separated from their families. The mining guilds will be very unpleased about this, the dwarf said. Why are you divulging this information? Thomas asked. Because I am one such terrorist dwarf and from what I have seen with you, you might actually be able to help my kin up at the mountains with all of what you have done here in Tyrian. Some of my kin tried to make things better for us terrace dwarves but the hold ones always put a stop to it, Luther said. Let me guess? These steam engines you speak of once? Dr. Malona referred. Yes. I am not the inventor but I was a silent supporter of the inventor. I honestly don't know much about how they work but the inventor told me that he was trying to harness the power within the earth. I think it's best I just show it to you when the time is right, Luther said. We will see to this. But no promises at least until after we deal with this empire. Thomas brushed his chin. In Thomas' experience, such an exploitative existence breeds impending revolt amongst the UN-empowered working class. Magic and the genetics resulting from a magic-tocratic social hierarchy unique to Gleesia can be a vicious cycle as the minister studied. Most often than not, the magistocracy of Gleesia literally have the power over those who aren't blessed. It is a self-feeding system that also breeds decadence and stagnation. Back in youth, many of the labor related to traditional terrestrial mining from extraction to refinement is all automated with as little human risk as possible. Even then, there were still many innovations in recent history that made mining less risky without sacrificing output. These terrace dwarves will indeed be scolded back into the mines once the transaction has been found to have an unexpected complication, perhaps an exploitable angle to cut off vital resources for the Empire post-Operation Haymaker. A few well-placed words and perhaps a shipment of contraband could plunge the old order into anarchy that the Federation can move in and take in for themselves once the time is right. Thomas would rather have he and the party-owned corporations managing the Astrox than Aparo or even the likes of Martian Maximoff Heavy Industries. A potential crisis should not be put to waste. This is all indeed sad. Thomas nodded, hiding his impartiality behind the cold LED irises of his artificial eyes. Dash. Life was trying to revert back to normal in Tyrian in spite of the recent damages on over half of the citadel. Youth mechanized construction workers, 
armed literally with their constructor meshs muscled through the heavy debris whilst working in tandem with local labourers in rebuilding efforts of their homes, business, and establishments that were once stood proudly by at the titular crossroads that is the citadel. Most of the vulgar paraphernalia, corpses, ash and debris and layabout weapons, had been discarded to be either buried or recycled to rebuild from what was once been torn down. Some of the outwardly charitable volunteers from the Federation's colonists passed off candy, healing gels and other various emergency goods to help alleviate Tyrion's collective suffering for those who had lost the most. As for Governor White, he and his inner circle were already working with the rest of the Principality's administrators in coordinating the rebuilding efforts and the sweat-dropping task of informing the Prince, the news of the attack by the Grey Order and the connection that traces back to the Empire, Tyrion's liege lord herself. They are already bracing for the Prince to implode on their faces. Jeremy was already stirring his composure of what he will have to do, at least. Prime Minister Bowska will be at his side to help mediate the prince on the situation but it was insisted that he, as the governor of New Albany plus the Principality's administrators personally say the grave news to Prince Clovich, but outside of politics, the people of the youth and of Tyrian could never have been more in solidarity than ever trying to smile through and enjoy through this trying time in spite of this setback warm daily eighth res heart upon looking out of the window of the drunken bastard tavern and in where April's eighth birthday was being held and she had just finished her enchanting choral Vander dance in front of April Root and her kindergarten classmates. Luya's establishment had to be temporarily renamed for the duration of the party to avoid offending the sensitive minds of the children that the tavern and inn were to be called the Dancing Bogey to fit the parties of a fairy tale princess ball theme as hosted by Mr. and Mrs. Root. It was quite endearing for the elf to be participating in such a very fae-inspired gathering. At first, she thought such an idea for a party would have been parodical a mockery of true elven culture but just seeing the smiles of the children enjoying the festivities dashed her doubts away. You couldn't fake such jubilation if you could. In description to her dance that was passed down upon her through generations, the elf wore a flowing light blue toga that exposed bare legs while adorned with glittering sparkles giving the one who wore it a very fae-like appearance. Aliathra's graceful twirls, breathtaking leaps rhythmic sound and the aid of some visually eye-catching illusionary magic on her part gave her a standing ovation among not only the children but also the adults and a few of the bar patrons who have never seen the sight of a beautiful elven maiden dance such enchantingly. They did question Aliathra's prosthetic legs but were brushed off. That is also in addition to Aris magic show where she dressed in a feminized version of a magician's clothes that was quite frankly not as colorful as most show magicians but did give quite a look on Iris' creamy white legs imprisoned in netted stockings. The vampire witch's performance too was just as equally well received. Performing relatively safe spells from destruction and conjuration school meant to visually captivate onlookers in a vein like an illusion-based spell. Seeing such smiles lightened up for the former elven princess and the vampire witch as they exited off of their stage costumes. They soon caught their eyes a familiar red-headed maiden that has just arrived from the ornate toak door the drunken bastard greeted all patrons to. La Dewey Rose. You have come, the elf hugged the red-headed lieutenant as she stepped foot inside the tavern. Ailey, she returned her embrace. How is the party? I am so sorry I am late. I had to take a detour heading here. Samantha informed. Oh, this party is great. Actually, the first party I have actually enjoyed being in. Knowing me and all, she tittered. Come friendy ow. I resurged Samantha through the occupied table of merrymakers. The rest of Strider group, drinks, and party snacks at hand approached Samantha as the lieutenant gets herself into the rhythm of the party. The men were concentrated with a bee diet testing a mix on their iron stomachs all the ales, beers, and liquors the drunken bastard had from top to bottom. 
the women were closer to their children near the stage that is rented out for a few instances of entertainment such as the earlier performances of R.S. Magic Show and Daily A Throw Enchanting Dance. Crocker and Obediah were having a drinking contest on who can down the most rounds of a certain very fiery brew straight from the Aslericks. There was also a scent of a few herbal blunts being ignited by no part by a cigar chomping Diaz who lit himself with the fumes by the smoking corner of the tavern away from any tyke's prying eyes. Clay was busy helping himself with the food, specifically the berries and meats served as local delicacies rather than some of Leah's own home cooking. Ah, LT. Crocker smiled haphazardly with the goofiest grin from an otherwise mostly austere sergeant. He was really letting himself go after all of what had happened yesterday. Hello Sarge, you boys are all enjoying themselves. The lieutenant smiled. She, Iris, and Aliathra were greeted with babbling coos and gazes of the other men on the table, Federation and Native alike. Samantha was a fairly attractive individual at her ripe old early half of the twenties age. With her short ponytail red hair and petite face but not as eye-catching as the snow-white skinned and raven-haired iris or the exotic eared and golden mane Aliathra, they do make a cute trio nonetheless. Crocker. These are the girls you are with all the time in your squad with a bee there? One of the bee dyer's neighbors who was invited to the party asked. He was mostly there for the wanton abandon of free drinks being served that day and was loving the samplings of the native craft beers and spirits the tavern has in stock. Yep, Crocker drunkenly confirmed, his breath reeking of spiced spirits. You lucky SOB you and Obaby. He playfully slapped the sergeant in the back in congratulations. I see you're all enjoying yourselves everyone, Leah Root, wife of a bee dyer approached the man smiling like the sun. Indeed, we all are Miss Root. Samantha nodded. Oh, you must be my hubby's commanding officer, right, young lass of the Crimson Top? Fresh from West Point? Leah asked the lieutenant. Yes, she confirmed. I have to say that to be told me nothing but praises about you. You are doing a damn fine job and the Lord's work out dear Miss Rose. Leah smiled. Thank you that I am doing so well for my first post on my military service. She smiled back. Post, post. That word struck Leah like she had seen a ghost. Oh my, the post. Leah stiffened. Did you forget something for the party? Iris asked. Yes, April's present. We have been saving up for it for weeks to get it in and it was a go-down miracle that it made it to the post office by the embassy across the street. Leah said, thank you for reminding me. Ababy, can you go across the street to get April's present? She winked to her husband. Ah. Shit. Ah. I can't. Sorry. A bee dyer, wasted in alcohol nade. Well can you at least wash up before we personally give April's present outside? Remember it was your money for this. Leah requested. But it was your idea. A bee dyer argued back. But his wife didn't budge. Ah. Fine. Give me a second. You go get the kids out of there. A bee dyer conceded. He muddily stood up from his chair and walked towards the tavern's comfort room to expel the drunkenness from him. As she sees her husband makes his leave, Leah Root made her way to the stage and called for everyone's attention. Everyone, friends, and fellow well-wishers, I would like to guide you outside of the tavern for an extra special gift from Mommy and Daddy for our sweet little princess April. Leah smiled. April? Wearing a pink and sparkling princess dress appropriate for her size leapt into excitement. There wasn't much she could expect to receive on her birthday this year unlike before due to how stretched the logistics it was for many Federation raid to happen but she knew that her parents were very resourceful of folks worthy of a name the roots. If she were to believe in her wildest fantasies then it was likely that her wish that she wanted from her parents to get her was coming true and she couldn't contain her excitement as she her classmates, and all the party attendants exited the tavern onto our half-square, forming a semicircle in between the facade walls of the drunken bastard to a nearby cart carrying several barrels of dried fruit that shaded some of the sun-sensitive of folks. April stood in front of the congregation eagerly smiling for what great gift she will receive on her very special day. Close your eyes sweetie. Leah lulled her daughter as she scampered off to the embassy. Leah excitedly followed and covered her baby blues with her little hands as she waited for her great prize. The rest of the party attendants were behind her, 
surrounding the Root family's only child ready to sprout a great yell of happy birthday upon Leah's signal. Are you sure bringing some of them in is a good idea? Samantha asked. She pointed to a particular group of children who were, at the last minute, allowed into April's party on the insistence of Leah. They wore rags or hastily donated clothing that covered with ash and dirt, their demeanor happy but deep down in their eyes. They had seen horrors, the horrors of the past days of where their previous carefree world was burnt down, their loved ones killed, and their lives forever changed. Native children now turned orphans. Leah wanted to do her part in helping them. She grabbed as many of these poor kiddos as she could and gave them food, new clothing, and of course you girls, Crocker explained before clicking back to Aliathra and Iris. Wait, hang on a second. What was April's say on this? It's her party after all? Samantha asked. Oh, she was such a sweet little thing. When little April heard about what had happened to those poor folks she wanted to help out too. It was her idea to bring in as many children to her party as she could get and have them play with her. She wanted to make new alien friends. Iris explained, that's very charitable of her and Leah. Samantha blushed, her heart warmed by April's act of spontaneous kindness. But why here, in New Albany? You could have moved it back to New Albany where it's safer. Samantha said, in my experience, and this is coming from a guy who had his fair share of humanitarian aid. Real charity begins on the ground rather than an internet click with bank transaction from the comfort of your home. Crocker quoted, Nenith preaches charity to those who are in pain. I see all of your kind doing just that. Helping these poor folks rebuild their city and healing these children. Even after all of this devastation, now is the time that Tyrion heals, especially those children. I have seen their smiles and laughter when they played with April and her friends. In her teachings, children learn to give thanks to the goddess of life for they thank their birth due to her hand. Nenith has strong regard for those who are weakest and most vulnerable in life who are like these children. She spoke once let the children come to me. For my creation belongs to those like them for all those that I give unto you will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Those who wish to serve the goddess must have a childlike humility, faith and simplicity when it comes to praying and acting for her. Aliathro exhorted softly. She dangled her cleric's rosary necklace showcasing the symbolic base of her faith to stride a group. That makes a lot of sense now that I think of it. Samantha acknowledged. The symbol at the center of the elf's breasts was an intricate trillite carving that optically speaking, seems to keep continuously sprouting out like the pathfinding way how nature and life always finds a way to thrive even at the most desolate of places. There was also a faint jade glow of restoration magics that beat like a heart faintly. I can say amen to that. Diaz smile. Hey, after this Ailey you wanna have some fun? Diaz asked. Hey, sure. You do wish to show me more of New Albany soon. Ailey a through accepted. Leah came rolling in with April's present. A loud clicking noise tickling the young girl's ears like the light gallops of a healthy pony made its approach to her. It was another such of the Federation's contraptions, a wheeled steed as most natives would describe a bicycle or a motorcycle, all of the utility of a horse, less of the majesty and none of the unsanitary trouble of maintenance. Happy birthday sweetie. Ope, Leah greeted but just as she was about to tell her daughter to open her eyes, but a great thunderous crack exploded from the cart next to Leah where several other civilians, you for native alike were caught in its wake. Smoke from the resulting fireball fogged everyone in our half-square disorienting and knocking down everyone. Shit. Another attack? Samantha coughed. Aliathra stood back up to recombobulate herself. Her five senses reeling to realign themselves that she could barely take note of her immediate surroundings. Her now artificial eyes were much easier to resist the irritant effects of the explosion's smoke clouds compared to everyone else. Just as the former elf princess got back up on her two feet, a great force pushed her down. Someone, a hooded figure, had rushed past Aliathra, knocking her back to the floor. Likely a panicking person. But why was she running towards the explosion's origin than away? Mama? Ah, let me go. 
A girl's scream echoed in fright as the hooded figure grabbed the little girl and carried her away kicking and screaming before dragging the impudent little imp onto a sack. She was being kidnapped and the elf, recognizing the little girl's voice knew who was being taken away. April Aliathra cried, reaching out her hand she gave chase to the kidnapper. But in her haste, the elf tripped over a charred obstruction underneath the camouflage that was the clouds. To her horror upon recognizing what she stumbled upon made her recoil oh so vehemently. Nenith's grace Aliathra shrieked when she looked on face to face with the melted corpse of a person in front of her. Its eyes blanketed in white horror, its skin charcoaled with a few specks of medium rare flesh that melts off of its frame from the slightest of touch and its limbs forever frozen to depict him trying to shield himself away from explosions blast. She clambered away, not wanting to lose her focus in April but she too found her hands grasping the charred flesh of even more victims of this great catastrophe. Dozens upon dozens of people littered where she plodded to her abhorrence. The elf almost froze catatonically if it were not for continued cries of April off in the distance. Let me go. April shouted as the stranger stuffed the petulant brat on his hands onto the sack behind him before continuing to dash off. Aliathra's maternal instincts surged within her mind as she re-steeled herself and regained her footing. Swearing wildly. The conquest god's vengeance upon the villain who would dare commit such a heinous act, the elf, with added fatiguelessness of her bladed legs drapes her way across the field of corpses and laying injured in hot pursuit. Ailey, I am coming with you. Samantha, regaining her own footing shouted. Using her gifted powers, the lieutenant conjured up a ball of Gallic winds upon her legs, with her self-patented spell air scooter. An osmosis influence from certain cartoon shows that the lieutenant watched as a child, Samantha mercurially dashed forth but not before taking a good look on the many corpses left in the explosion's wake. Scattered around our half-square, she could discern about fifteen or so corpses at first glance at such varying states of mephization to the explosion's recent wake that is hard if some of the dead were actually melded together like the wax of two candles flickering alongside each other until they became one. To see such visceral death before she made Samantha's stomach churn restlessly. Seeing corpses on photos back at West Point was one thing, but to see them with her own two eyes and to be near the place that had killed them was a forever changing experience that darkened the bright green face of the young lieutenant. These lie agents were really not going to stop until all of them were laying on the ground broken, defeated, and scalded, not on her watch. She will allow such a caitiff to get away with this whaley. The two girls tailed the evil duo through Terry and semi-seared streets fighting their way past confused rescue workers, beleaguered townsfolks, and loose wreckage yet to be disposed of. Seeing one of their own, the famous Lieutenant Samantha rose giving chase to a cretin carrying a sack that kicked and screamed frivolously. A few dozen of the Ufif soldiers sprung up to their feet and aimed their rifles on the malefactor. Stop right there, one of them shouted, but instead of stopping heed, the hooded transgressor tossed on his person a fused bomb set alight and broke upon impact off of the Ufif soldier's feet, a purplish gas that airburst a song of squeaking cacophony that fell upon the soldiers as all of them release a salvo from each of their lungs a maniacally jovial guffaw. They lay down their weapons and allowed the panting runaway to pace through unimpeded. What happened to? Ha, ha. Then, Samantha covered her mouth but she too fell victim to the gas the smoke bombs furrow. An alchemist bomb? Of their hideous laughter spell, Aliathra said. They will get over it unscathed in a while, she reassured. Hurry now, that man is going to reach the gate, Samantha pointed out. They scampered off past their joshing comrades as the walls of the Terrian citadel loomed over the horizon. Nearby the walls were one of the citadel's famous iron gates that lay open widely as people and material passed by in and out of the city. Additionally, there was also a stable where mounts were parked, fed, and allowed to discharge themselves upon. One such mount was perhaps the most out of place, a magnificently grey ghost of a stallion that caught many equestrian and riding aficionados to pause from their walk and marvel at. 
His saddle was adorned in an ethylent silk laced leather and its tall majesty gave an air of prestigious royalty that those who looked upon it would question who could afford to travel in such style. Out of my way, the sack-carrying villain yelled at the crowd gathered at that horse, by Samantha's notarization, the voice was distinctly female. She climbed atop of the mount and with a great kick of her feet the stallion sauntered off a due haste past the guards. Lay, Sam. You cannot let her get away. Aliathra cried. Oh no she won't. Samantha said. Shifting herself into high gear, the chosen one dug her heels onto the Gleesian earth and with the training, she was given by her teachers. The lieutenant burst off with their scooter in a blazing sprint, expeditiously hightailing the fleeing kidnapper with all of her arcane might. Yet still, despite her effort, the horse was simply outpacing her for every knot she covered. Two more would the steed gallop. To make matters worse, Manu exhaustion was about to wear Samantha upon every flashing second in this pursuit. It was only a matter of time before the lieutenant quite figuratively loses steam and the villain escapes with the young child at her hand. Now was the time at that moment that fortune favors the bold. With no other way to stop the perpetrator, Sam unholstered her pistol that she keeps on her right thighs and took aim. Her target was the mount's center mass, her trusty Militech Gladius pistol, named after ancient Rome's famous legionary short sword. It is the standard sidearm of the Federation's armed forces, firing .45 auto rounds with great reliability, accuracy and generous ammo capacity, often treasured by criminal gangs and mercenaries for such features since the gun is meant for the hands of the armed forces only but even that is debated as it might give Militech an air of exclusivity when they wished to sell them within the black market but any time this was exposed they said it was stolen shipments, the spiritual successor to the Glock and Sig Sayer series. The pistol almost never, if at all jams and can fire accurately with 90% reduction in recoil at an effective range of 70 meters and at a muzzle velocity of 400 meters per second. Halt by the name of the Federation, Sam yelled as she squeezes her gladius trigger with a dead eye glared at the villain as she loosened twelve servings of .45 ACP under the speeding horse's torso. Pierced by these otherworldly arrows that struck its frame like lightning, the horse fell limp to the earth mutilated with apertures of entrance and exits littering its grey skin and being tainted erubescent with its blood. The runner fled fell on sideways and luckily not atop of the sack that April was kept captive in. Furthermore, her hood fell off, releasing a streamer of auburn hair and emerald eyes that met with Samantha's turquoise. Upon closer examination, Samantha can discern that she wore a very light leather armor beneath her cape that held a utility belt's worth of tulle and she saw that her ears protruded out of the bushes that were her ears with a pointed end. The perpetrator was an elf likely from those vexatious Cephyliad. Both women's legs were weary from their pursuits as each of them straggled gawkily yet stubbornly with the former still trying to get away whilst later tries to apprehend. A slow paced chase but a tense one when one carries with them a hostage. A child hostage. Release the hostage immediately, Samantha demanded. She shoved her pistol forward assertively as she maintained here pressed conviction for justice. You think? I will listen to you, the chestnut-haired elven woman be damned, we will go easier on you if you let the hostage go right now. Samantha gave out her terms. Enough of your lies demon spawn. The elf spy screamed as she pulled out from her right hand a pistol-shaped object. It had a small but elongated limbs that stretched backward like crossbow but made into a miniature sized. It was a handbow. Damn it. Samantha cursed as she weaved out of the way of the elven spy's handbow shot. She reflexively returned fire but, in an effort, to further intimidate the damaged individual to consider yielding than trying to fight any longer. They go about this for several tenses and oh so agonizingly lengthy five minutes as Samantha continuously weaved and applied pressure on the Cephyd Liad spy. Soon enough, 
They made their doddering steps towards a great cliff till called Ayu Aja Hill or the Hill of Oath taking that is also where the nearby the Terian Citadel connects itself to the mountain passes leading to the Slay Each and Empires just a few statutes away lead to. The elf woman's feet reached its base first and with a cunning idea on her mind, she hurriedly scaled the rocky hill taking advantage of the elevated height to pin down Samantha on the ground level rocks. How long can you think you can hold out? Samantha taunted only to be shot at again by another hand bow bolt. She cursed herself as she tactically reloaded her gladius. Samantha, Aliathra panted. I followed as best as I could, she said. Did she see you? Samantha asked of her. Ayum. Aliathra stuttered not understanding Samantha's question. Did the bomber we are chasing saw you? Samantha clarified. I don't think so. The elf denied. Good. I need you to do something. I got our bomber trying to climb up the hill and I need you to run around the hill and corner her. Can you do that? Samantha asked of the elf. Yes. We must rescue April. Aliathra nodded. Good. I will keep her distracted. Now move. The lieutenant sent her off. Samantha emerged from her rock and opened fire at the suspect as Aliathra snuck around to the other side of Ayu Aja Hill. You growing weak now? Let the hostage go and I will let you run away. Samantha teased. Never. With this specimen I have taken from your demon fortress we will finally be able to know how to defeat you once and for all. The kidnapper shot back. Well, that specimen of yours is slowing you down. It is only a matter of time until we surround you. Samantha appealed. By the gods of the world. I will not fail in my task while I still live. The suspect stubbornly refused again as she loose another shot of her hand bow at Samantha that she easily vanished into the safety of the hill's rocks, its piercing bolt strongly kicking tiny stone and dust into the wind like an all-powerful bullet. They continued their stalemate of the distance between each other now that the tower elf spy was exhaustively scaled the hill at the same rate of advancement as the lieutenant. Little did the former notice daily a through a circle behind then scale the hill from the other side. Her prosthetic legs built for raw athleticism plus the enhanced stamina thanks to her bio-augmented new heart allowed her to reach the summit of the hill just as her quarry, with her hostage, also reached the top too. Let her go, Aliathra conjured a phantasmal bow from her magical hands. But as she drew its semi-ethereal string, her eyes took aim at a closer look at the villain and the elf's new icy vision enhancement package or as she would call them super eyes, and was shocked to see who the unhooded individual was. Lindus? Aliathra muttered. The sapphire Liad spy's heart skipped a beat as she turned around and saw Aliathra standing in front of her. If this was under normal circumstances, the auburn-haired elf would have been relieved to see one of the royal signs of the Lethaline grace their appearance before her, especially at such a dire time as this, but oh, how strange circumstances have brought them together at very disconsonant matters. She remembered how she saw the elven princess be found without a heart replaced instead with one of the stone when they performed one of Nenith's most sacred of healing rites. How she ran like a doe being preyed upon when the other clerics uncovered her deception. You, Lindus scowled and took aim with her hand bow, but it clicked harmlessly signifying that ammunition for its feed has been found wanting. Weidel's balls, the Sephid Liad agent cursed as she pulled out her dagger from her pocket and unveiled a confused and weeping eyed April from her kidnapper's sack and held the child at knife point. Let the little one go Lindus, Aliathra demanded. Princess, why? Lindus asked. What do you mean why? I am not jesting you like we used her back in the academy Lindus. Let her go. The cleric ranger pressed. Why do you fight with these demons? Is it because you wanted to change your destiny? You no longer wanted to be the perfect princess that your parents wanted you to be? Was that it? Lindus accused. That is none of your concern right now. Aliathra dodged. Wag. I want to go home. April Root wailed as she wiggled to loosen Linda's constricting grip on her little body but to no avail. April everything will be alright I promise. Aliathra reassured the birthday girl who was being like actual fairy tale princesses as a guarantee for whatever plots and schemes the story entailed for her. Then tell me this. 
Why do you care so much of this irritating imp? Look at her dressed in this mockery of a proper elven gala gown. Linda spilittled April, but I am a princess. April defended herself. Oh, you speak like you're lying, conspiring and treacherous princess Aliathra. The sapphire Liad said, no, she is nothing like you said. She loves me because she is a true-hearted princess. You are the one who is evil not her. April kicked back. Enough of your lies imp. Linda spommeled the girl with her dagger's blunt end producing a plum bruise that was slowly converting to crimson. What are you hoping to achieve by kidnapping that girl? Aliathra asked. What else? I thought it was so obvious for you now that you turned into the dark side that is Albone and his corrupted ilk. Linda sneered. This imp is the key, the basis, the foundation that the Alliance of the Light will triumph once again from the demonic invasion. Once we learn about your weaknesses from dissecting this imp, the result of that little raid on Tyrion and the demon fortress I had formulated will never result in the massacre ever again with for the forces of the Alliance. You are behind the raid? Aliathra questioned. Indeed. And I thank all of those useful idiots in the Grey Order to volunteer for my experiment that I came to the realization of how overwhelmingly powerful you demons. You are just as what they say in the old legends. So, I plan to kidnap this imp by discharging a Nuzigan bomb then kidnapping this easy prey. When I return to College of Magi in Herring Point, we will use her to learn about what weaknesses the demons hold by dissecting this little monster then parading the cadaver all over the empire to show that demons are not invincible and they can be killed. Lindus explained with a wicked smile attached to her face as she playfully tickled the tip of her dagger at April's vulnerable self. You want to dissect then parade her? Samantha rose up from the summit and aimed her gladius pistol at Lindus. You are a goddamn psycho. The lieutenant announced. Let my daughter go you bitch. A bee appeared by Samantha's side followed by the rest of Strider group. You. So, you are this Madame Gwarthan I found by biting off of that Grey Order adventurer? Iris accused. Correct. You are smart for such a feral little monster vampire. Lindis confirmed. I am afraid you will learn nothing by taking her away, from her parents no less. The vampire which rectified with a chastising tone. Oh if only wars were won by witty words or fibs. You think you can lie to me vampire? So, you are in the league too with these demons? HMPH. I would like to let you know that we will redouble our efforts to wipe your kind off of the face of the earth. Lindus derided. Lindus stop this now. Aliathra interrupted alarmingly. My old friend, what happened to you all of these decades? You are not the same roommate I had back in the academy. You were the only person who treated me like a friend. You were intelligent, well-spoken, and tranquil. Not this. Aliathra pleaded to her. Aliathra, dear Aliathra. Lindis chuckled. Even after all of what I had gone through with you, you are still a naive little princess. Don't you know who you are? The Sephid Liad agent asked. Who I am? Aliathra startled. You are Aliathra. The royal elven line that produces the strongest of mages in all of elvenkind, the one true ruler of all of elventum with your father is the greatest amongst us. Yet you are just the youngest, the last in the line of succession and you know how they said it in class. The strength of the parents' arcane might dwindles on each new seed. Your sister and brother, Ithiel and Valorian was nigh peerless in their prowess but for you, you allowed your exalted bloodline to be humbled in a convent. Lindus decried, I serve the goddess of life because I wish to give back as much as I can to our people Lindus. Aliathra contended with her life choice, but the Sephid Liad agent only laughed maniacally at the answer. You are still not getting it do you Aliathra? Lindus guffawed. Despite your line, you are just in a junction. A sideshow to the real prize. Oh if all of Alpha Nora could see you and what you have become now, their fracas could shake the heavens. If your family saw what sins you have done, their tears would fill the oceans. Look at what they have made of you. Linda scanned her finger over Aliathra's corrupted form. Your hand and your favor? They are just a stepping stone, a pawn, a doorway to ascend in elven society. Yet somehow, these pests ground you as their queen. You are only good for two things Princess Aliathra. 
to get close to your family and to plant the seed of the next line of mages through your womb. Lindis please, stop this. Aliathra began to weep. Her emotions of herself starting to pound her sordidly, yet her super eyes could not truly weep. She knew deep down that her old friend was correct. She was ultimately just a play piece in the grand game of politics but she also refuses to be a willing participant in it. It brought simply the worst of people out beneath those convivial balls and flattering diplomatic conventions. All wish to ascend when the goddess preaches that all of this is but trivial worldly matters that mean nothing ultimately in her eyes. Don't listen to her really. Diaz inspirited the elf cleric. Perhaps now I understand why you so easily were seduced by these pests. Lindus pompously smirked. You tire of your duty to your country, your family your people because you see that you are nothing which you are indeed nothing, she proudly declared her answer, you may boast of your great restoration magics while I and the rest of you classmates sat by while being outshined by someone who would ultimately become just a baby maker to produce another kinsman branch of the Lethe bloodline, to see you have that future while you outshined the likes of future law masters. Sephid Liad and Magi like the rest of your classmates was absolutely unacceptable. Your hubris knows no bounds, Lindis said, but I was an excellent student. I was cultivating my talents to my supreme limit. Aliathra tearfully, and hyperbolically, defended herself again. As I said your hubris and defiance over where you are in elven society must be put into place which is why I and many others had to do, Lindis boasted. No. You can't be saying. Aliathra beckoned her head in denial. Do you ever ask why you were so lonely back in the academy with only me, your sister and your brother being your only companions? That is because every one of us absolutely cannot swallow the sight of you Aliathra. You always to excel in all of your assignments despite how many times we tried to level the favor. I spread rumors about you that made many of our classmates leave you away so that I may be your only friend. Second, with you all alone I leave you to do my own homework secretly whilst I mingled with your much more impressive siblings, Lindis said. You were using me? Aliathra faltered, her legs barely maintaining verticality. All to have me ascend to your ranks as your closest friend as I said to your older sister. When you had that rare drug carth on our quarters I couldn't bear to see you avert your favor to that. That thing. So I had to cut your friendship short. Lindis seethed with spite. Zena, my pet? She didn't eat those berries by accident. The cleric's sorrow soon then turned to rambled ire. Did you know how long I cried when I held his body as he slowly faded away from my arms? You you tart. Aliathra cursed. With friends like her, who needs enemies? Clay commented. To think elves had it all. I thought Alphilnora was a paradise. Who knew the elves are no different like those stooges from the Empire? Iris added. The elven cleric collapsed to the floor now emotionally destroyed once again but greater was the damage of a betrayal of someone that was once thought to be your friend than finding out what you have become. So it is done, I have done it, Lindis smiled smugly as she saw the broken Aliathra fall down before her feet. It was not enough for a Cephid Liad to break someone physically as their philosophy in interacting with adversaries go, but to break them mentally and spiritually so they may be permanently disabled from becoming an enemy of the Entente was its highest purpose. To see a demon, break down upon Lindis breaking speech was the most sublime of satisfactions. I have to say, Princess, I have yet to tell you one more thing that I know would finally break you. Lindis said, I know Ethiel's secret and know how she will be torn down if everyone knows of it. My sister? No. Aliathra responded catatonically. Don't listen to her Ailey. Samantha attempted to elate the elf cleric ranger. Tell me again. Why are you continuing to disguise yourselves as humans demons? You are all the same inside. Watch. Look. Lindis questioned Samantha before she hinged her hand to plunge her knife on April's bowels so she may skirt the blade and expose the inner nothingness which are the true selves of the demons, nothingness personified into a form of something of eminence. Her dagger, blessed with holy water was meant to, in that split second, Aliathra was confronted with a hard but newfound truth. 
She was not a demon nor she was a monster anymore. Hearing all of Linda's words of how she used her all those years so she could selfishly ascend with her unwitting assistance made her blood boil. But what had made her truly snapped was how unrighteously impassioned Lindis truly was when she set off that bomb near those children, kidnapped a child thinking she was a demonic tyke and wanting to despoil her in front of her father no less. Get your claws off of her you demon. Aliathra launched herself from the ground and in a split second as she grabbed hold of Linda's hand as it sunk its blade's kiss on April's tight abdomen. Pulling the knife out from the child and then forcefully pushing April away so that the elf can take her place. But the sudden force that disrupted the already uneasy equilibrium that Lindis stood upon had now been broken. Gravity did its work as the two elven women, locked together in a desperate struggle fell over the hill leaving April to be immediately attended by the rest of Strider group. Lindis and Aliathra soon fell down upon roughly on a patch of flat but slowly eroded rock by the slope of Ayuaja Hill. Upon touchdown. The Sephid Liad managed to get the first initiative. Demon scum, Lindis shouted as she raised her hand as white magics flowed around her as she prepared a magical spell. Knowing through years of study, Aliathra knew that her old friend turned enemy is about to use a holy spell on her. This amused and displeases the elf at the same time. You have no power over here Lindis. Aliathra ridiculed. She prepared to shield her artificial blue eyes to brace herself for the impending blinding light that will follow. She knew full well that Lindis fully bought into the delusion that the elven princess was corrupted into a demon and will likely use harmless holy spells against her. Still it doesn't help to prepare for anything more than that at the meantime. Aliathra carefully stepped forward readying her dagger and her spell hand for any other conniving tricks the Sephid Liad are infamous for. Take this Lindis shouted. She cast what Aliathra can discern as a simple holy firefly spell. A relatively newly conceptualized spell invented by the Holy Inquisition. Its means of application is that after being shot out of the mage's hand or magical focus, it locks itself onto a target before meant to immobilize severely and inflict stinging pain upon any creature of a negative mana flow from demons. Undead in such air filled to name a few of effective targets, that fortunately, Aliathra was not. The firefly-like conjuration. Silvery in its eminence touched Aliathra's skin harmlessly before moving away and dissipating. How? Lindis challenged as she saw that her spell had no effect. Stop this madness now. Aliathra pleaded. Never. I will just have to try harder. Lindis revoked. She then tensed her legs to ready for another spell. Air Dine. Lindis cried. A more powerful variant of the Air Gallard spell. It conjures a bright sun-like object glow before the area of effect shining everything in a brilliant light. The spell is designed for banishing multiple demons or one powerful one at once. Yet again, Aliathra was again disappointed by Linda's obstinate live in denial attitude, its magical sun rays causing no effect on the elven cleric. What are you? Linda cried to Aliathra in a combined fervor of confusion and desperation as she began to switch tactics. You still think I am a demon Lindus? Aliathra asked her. A single tear now being able to fall from her eye. Do not lie again to me demon. I have to say, you have all gotten much stronger than the last time you came upon our lands. But playtime is over now. I purge you with the flames of the phoenix. This time the sapphire Liad's arms glow from silver to orange. As a dangerous sweat fell off of Aliathra's lively brow, this time she can feel it. A spell that could actually hurt her. In a split instant, Lindis erupted forth two twin jet streams of searing fire in one last anguish discharge of her mana reserves on Aliathra. They coiled together like a duo of snakes that move as fluidly like water charging forth towards the elf cleric. Any lesser mage would have been good as a well done roast but Aliathra had a tricker off her sleeve. Thanks to Samantha and David's application of high science as she would call their methodologies plus copious amounts of watching upon the lieutenant's magic mirror the play called Avatar The Last Airbender, Aliathra knew that fire requires air, specifically oxygen that is the very substance she and many other life forms of Nenith's creations to be able to breathe, to remain to be a light, an earlier experiment with a spell called air bubble. 
a cheaper but more serviceable versatile than the posh water breathing spell as it can be used to not only create a breathable area for deep sea divers to inhale precious air for but was also used by miners and artisans whose trades involves being within proximity of noxious aromas. It was also, quite sadistically for those who are skilled in its application can do the opposite and remove the oxygen out of the bubble creating a vacuum of space. It was theoretically possible as the other worlders had suggested but they had yet to put that theory to the test yet as all experimentations with Samantha was halted, gritting her teeth, Aliathra hastily cast with her readied hand an air bubble spell in front of her, inflating the bubble-like structure until it was just as tall as herself just as the dual fire streams collided onto her position. Thanks to her makeshift shield, Aliathra's air bubble negating itself of oxygen from the fire had perfectly countered spell Linda's attack as the fire was safely extinguished causing a misty smoke to permeate where the two dueling elves stood. Linda scoffed profusely as the smoke blinded her senses. Her body was exhausted but she still had her own two feet with her. Perhaps this smoke cloud could be her cover to escape now that all of her best laid plans were all for naught or its intended damages had been done as best as she could, but just as Lindis was about to cut her losses and flee, she felt a great right hook pommel her at the chest. This is for everything you had done to me. Aliathra struck with her left hand. This is for Zena and my sister. Her third strike, another right hook but to Lindis' head and this is for every innocent whom you shed their blood today. The elf proceeded to pelt a flurry of jabs on a bewildered Lindus who now exhausted of all means of offense or defense took every blow at full force, barely able to raise her hands in a vain attempt to shield her severely battered face now bleeding, bruised, pus-filled, cut and swollen. Ali, yur, fra, I, dust, wa, die, Lindus yielded. She reached out to Aliathra beseechingly by caressing her cheek equally wetted cheeks, made flushed by the cleric's mournful sorrows. Aliathra could see her old friend in the iron that in that moment, she hesitated to bring down a final crushing blow to end this tragic chapter. She was left in a stupor of thoughts that encircled her mind thinking about how she like many others of her people were so led to misbelief to the lie about the other worlders. Blinded by her heart rendered airs it was hard to keep track of all the emotions that encircled her head. Elves are known to be, despite their outward appearances of being very aloof beings of being very emotionally sensitive. It is said that what any other race could feel, an elf would feel five times as much. It was also easy for them to be quite dizzying when it comes to thought patterns from the point of view of a non-elf as their extended lifetimes gave them plenty of time to learn many hobbies, skills, and habits over the decades. But going back, Aliathra hesitated to kill Lindis as it was the first time, she willingly attempted to take another elf's life, in her teachings by the goddess of Nenith. There were two tenets in her word about the just time one devoted to the goddess of life can take the life away from her creation is when it is the animals you hunt, with a thanksgiving prayer upon chancing on the corpse of Hunt's successes, and in self-defense. But in this terrible chapter, she was just about to commit murder. Aliathra, watch out. Iris' voice echoed behind her. She snapped back from her haze as she saw Lindis slyly grab a knife hidden on her pocket and was prepared to throw it. It was a feigned surrender. One final spiteful strike for the Cephide Liad that if she were to go down this day, she will take one of forces of darkness with her. Aliathra weaved out of the way from Lindis' knife throw but little did the elven cleric knew that Iris was directly behind her. Ag! Iris quailed as the knife pierced her shoulder. It was a backup dagger of Lindis' many thrice blessed elven daggers that managed to hit its mark on a truly effective target, the quasi undead Iris Kudahagan. Iris Aliathra rushed to the vampire witch. In all of her disdain for the Sochairfil, to have her saved her life from her once friend's wrath had truly shocked her. It's okay, it is not at my heart. Ah, Iris smiled as she leaned herself to a rock to rest upon. Die, all of you, die. Lindis shouted. Meanwhile, Aliathra saw that Lieutenant Rose had also followed the vampire witch with her, and with a renewed vigor of some recharged mana reserves thanks to feeding upon Iris' necklace, Samantha conjured from the earth. 
a giant stone slab that wrapped itself on Linda's cabalistic hands shackling her. You may have bested me and corrupted the royal princess demon, but hearken my words, all of Gleesia now knows you are here. The alliance of the light has prevailed against your kind once and we will again. Linda sneered. Well then, when they come, we will be ready. Samantha grimly accepted the challenge. Kill me now then, though my last wish shall be when I see your priggish selves fall into oblivion upon the sight of our armies. Oh, how you shall wait to see when our chosen ones come upon you all and annihilate you back to whence you came for this dark time. The sacred crystal heart had chosen not one but three. Linda slouted with one final nefarious laugh. She was ready to die now by the demon's hands but it would make embracing Tivna as she guided her soul to her garden or be damned forever into oblivion feel partially consoling. You're wrong, bitch. Take a look at this. Samantha coyly responded as she removed her right glove and showed her stigmata, the branch she had received to the gesturing elven terrorist that is Lindus. I am possible, the shareholder. But, how can you be the chosen one? Linda's eyes widened in a fluster, was her eyes deceiving her or was there more to this sight than first glance? Unless, chosen one, you have been deceived. The elven spy cried out to Samantha. Deceived? Samantha returned the favor of expressing her confusion to these demons. Just like the royal princess Aliathra, they are making you fight for them. Making you fight against your people and destroy all of Gleesia for them. Linda said. Oh. Come on are you that stupid? Samantha berated Lindus. Your people? My people had always been with the Federation for all of my life. Born and raised in Sacraterra's green earth. I am with the Federation always and will always be. I will never fight for barbarians like you. The lieutenant scolded the captive elf's hubristic accusation. Then you are a demon who killed the real shareholder chosen one and stolen his power. Lindis continued her lunacy which has begun to tear on Samantha. Bullshit. Samantha protested. I dot I dot you. Lindis growled. Her fanaticism expending beyond any mortal limit conjured her hands to ready a spell to smite this false chosen one. Using the last bit of her magical reserves, the Sephide Liad member cracks out of the stone bounds that Samantha had disconcertingly placed upon her prideful self before aiming her evil eyes on the lieutenant. No, Aliathra dashed towards her former friend turned enemy and grabbed her from the back like cattle wrangling a rampaging ox, her two arms caressing heavily its weight on Linda's throat. She now see Linda's for what she truly is now, a demon in plain sight and by her dying breath, she will not let them harm her friends. Linda struggled to heave away Aliathra's grip, with her hands bound, losing her breath slowly and unable to concentrate to conjure her next spell. Desperate tears fell down upon the Sephide Liad's eyes as her breath was being stolen away from her by the person she swore to avenge for her nation's honor's sake. I, I, wa, er, uh, fend, Linda gasped, but Aliathra tightened her viper's grip on Linda's further. I, dos, one, die. The Sephide Liad wheezed. Linda's scrapping of feet and arms slowly dulled the longer Aliathra's grip stayed its weight between her throat. The cleric could feel the warmth of Nenith's gift fade away from her former friend until finally she lay limp upon Aliathra's elvenwood vambraces, dead, face frozen in despair. Ironic, for all of your grandiosity, you did not have the stomach to face death much like a craven little rat you truly are. Aliathra mocked taunted Linda's corpse allowing her emotions to possess her voice. She then turned to Iris, who was being tended by Samantha. She could see the vampire witch, a creature of darkness who had just saved her life now lay before her wound, her hand feebly grasping the knife thrown to her and her teeth gnashed out of her snow white and tattooed face. Iris, Aliathra readied her healing hands onto the sot chair Phil, don't worry about me, I have taken worse. Iris reassured her, but you need to get back up there now, it is April she needs you, she behest. Hearing those words, Aliathra quickly rescaled Ayu Aja Hill again until she had reached the summit where a more desperate scene was displayed to her. Abidaya, 
laying his slowly dying daughter in his lap whilst Crocker, out of the weighted arms of his exosuit arm replied pressure to the child's stab wound where Linda's knife had been embedded onto her. The rest of Strider group meanwhile stared on anxiously as the more venerable members of the squad tenaciously cling on to April's life in a bid to deny the terrorist one more life to take. Ailey, get your knife eared ass over here and do something. Crocker shouted. The thing you are good at. Please. Abida pleaded. Baby, keep your eyes open. Please. Please. He held his daughter's bloodied hand, quickly switching themselves over. Aliathra took over Crocker's role of holding the leak from April's blood wound. From her sense of touch, Aliathra could easily feel the young child's intestines hanging out loosely along with the dangerous amount of blood being seeped out of April dangerously. In her knowledge of anatomy, scale of the creature is inversely proportional to how much blood one can afford to lose. Children are the most vulnerable to being killed forcefully through bloodshed due to their size and juvenile state hence why Nanith's teachings always put a fond emphasis onto their character and protection. Seeing the blood leak out of April, made Aliathra distress over the grave situation. Even if she seals her wound and corrects the way April's intestines should be arranged, she has lost too much of her precious essence for such a small child. She is losing so much blood. The elf wailed. April please do not give up on me. She pleaded. April's eyes turned upside down as her body begins to jolt furiously as she began to rattle causing Abidia and Aliathra's hands to shake in forlorn anguish. Damn it. She is going through high volemic shock. Crocker shouted. Pardon? Aliathra asked. Can you make her produce more blood? Crocker asked of her, not wanting to waste more seconds in explaining scientific terminologies with the elf. Hearing the sergeant's words, Aliathra knew what to do albeit a very risky and invasive procedure. She will have to target April's bone marrow where she will have to accelerate the production of blood whilst at the same time. She will have to seal up the little girl's room so that she can jumpstart her body once again and bring her out of death's cold grasp. She has only one shot at this but, with a renewed faith in her heart, the elf, like Diaz would have done, took a risk, and cast the dice. April, Emaliathra to Linlathad. Aliathra prayed as her hands glowed in restoration magics. Last Obeth Nintolo Dan Nanenith Salag. It was a mind racking effort as her bloodied palms dried and her hands sweated off of expenditure as slowly April's vitality mounted upwards as Dolores throws blithely reversed to calm breathing as April opened her starry eyes at her savior Aliathra Letha. Princess. Are you. My. Knight in shining armor? April asked her with a child's sunny beam of glee. Yes. Yes, darling. Yes, I, I am. The elf smiled back, panting and sweating just like a triumphant gallant returning to the damsel in distress to show that all is well and that the knight shall take the damsel safely home. April tried to raise herself back up but her recent wound crippled her upper body strength. No don't sweetie you need to rest, Abidia said. It was so dark and scary when that bad lady stole me, daddy. Princess, daddy, can you hold me please? April asked. Of course, you can. Aliathra nodded together, bracing April between each other. Aliathra and Abidia warmly hugged April as she nestled herself between their embrace. Aliathra, thank you. Again, Abidia blessed the elf, his beard brushing her shoulder quite ticklishly. Due to how exhausted both April and Aliathra were, they had to be carried back to the land cruiser by Abidia and Diaz respectively. Despite all of the wounds being easily healed they still have to get a proper go-ahead from the new Albany military hospital which was a ten-minute drive from Ayu Aja Hill. It was quiet in contrast to the contempt everyone had to go through. Except for April whom her father shielded her eyes away, have to transport a Linda's corpse with them to be disposed of for autopsy at the hospital. Aliathra was by far the most did, grasping her fist tightly as she glared at Linda's body. Upon arrival at the hospital, at the same time, a sizable quantity of ambulances and Red Cross trucks gathered around the vicinity of the military hospital as their red and blue lights glowed into the background. To Samantha's unnerving. She saw dozens upon dozens of hospital stretchers being dispatched to receive the human cargo, 
some bandaged with rouge tints over their mummy-like bodies while others were veiled completely in black bags, some of whom were meant to be designed meant for medium-sized animal cadavers. She and Strider even saw a very emotionally overwhelmed Dr. Lee Hainanol squatting coldly on the pavement of the hospital's emergency receiving lobby. Abida quickly let April go, giving her to her newly dubbed Auntie Aliathro and dashed off. Kane, Clay, and Diaz meanwhile brought out Linda's despicable corpse to be disposed of so that the dishonorable bitch of an elf would not leave her taint on their vehicle leaving Samantha and Crocker inside the land cruiser with the elf and the little girl. Mark my words. This alliance of the light, they will pay. Samantha vowed. Patience you. We must build our strength. Crocker stayed the fiery redhead's hand. We cannot let them get away like this sergeant. This time they directly attacked us. Look at those bags. Samantha pointed to the much smaller body bags. I assure lieutenant, patience for when the time is right. They will know of the Federation's might. High command needs more time. Crocker rebuked her enthusiasm. Samantha reluctantly sulked down in admission upon her veteran second in command's words. He was ultimately correct. Princess Aliathra, April asked the elf, Can you sing me a lullaby? Elgara Valas, Darlin, Melavasumnia, Malatara Aravas, Aramadis and Mela. Aliathra soothed the little one as all the horrible terror of that day melted away from April's mind. Just then, a knock on the rap's back door was heard. It was a bee now returned. His eyes were catatonic and his posture jittered in micro vibrations. He reached out to his now sleeping daughter and personally enveloped her in his embrace quietly. Daddy, where is mommy? April asked of him. SHH. Sleep now. Abidia hushed April to sleep. Papa, where's mommy? Where are my friends? April continued to ask, but Abidia continued to seal his lips, unwilling to stomach to tell the horrible, painful truth of their fates. Patting her back he slowly swayed the young child like a cradle as April faded to rest her tired body. Samantha and Aliathra looked on at first confused about why Abidia, typically the most honest and down-to-earth man in the team dodge April's question. Until, to their alarm, Abidia began to sob very profusely as he continued to lull April with his tearful legis. Their realizations were later confirmed when Cain, Diaz, and Clay returned to the Mrap with similarly morose visages, Clay holding onto Abidia's shoulders as Abidia held onto his daughter tightly not wanting to let her go. Iris too now realizing last what had happened, roll her hair to like a morning veil as she hid in her face to show her condolences in the squad marksman's plight. Lieutenant could only back away to give Abidia the space he needs as she held back her go lamentation by cupping her mouth with her two hands to shadow her emotion. This was the first time in her squad where one of their own was seriously wounded. They, they, they are. I am so sorry. Abidia stammered. I, I, don't understand? April asked her father. She, she is dead. Your mother, is dead. Abidia told his daughter. What is dead? April asked. I want to see mommy and my friends again. She rattled with a few tears streaming down her cheek. Abidia had honestly no idea how to respond to April's naivete. He was more of the family breadwinner whilst his wife was the caretaker of the household. His skills being of weapons, the tracking, and taking of life. Never its nurture. Deep down for the old hunter, he now regrets those times he chose to pursue upwards his career over attending to his family, but now, those rare moments he had together with Leo and April became more so precious for its scarcity. As for April's friends, oh how would he also explain several of their fates to his daughter? How would her school teachers too in dealing with such trauma? But for all intents and purposes, now it has become more than just a tour of service to his country in exchange for the material privileges his family enjoys compared to the average citizen. Now it has become personal. I will explain one day sweetie. Not now, Abidia said. By God, he will journey to the very depths of hell to protect the one last person he loves. Abidia looked on to his daughter and further embraced April. 
perhaps arguably the least physically damaged but in contrast the most psychologically scarred of her kindergarten, covering her eyes and ears from the mourning parents and orphan children that echoed down the halls of New Albany Military Hospital. The surviving Root family then stood up and passed by the sad scene that lay bare with a bee dyer doing his best with his faltering two hands to shield April from this sight, but his hands were so weak that the overtly curious little girls managed to peek out from the crevices of her father's fingers to witness what he had meant. It only took one look to see one little Jimmy Baxton, one such friend of hers from her school who now lay cold and still in front of his parents as they cried over his body just as the paramedics zipped up his black body bag to realize what had happened. April soon began to wail loudly as a bee dyer, Iris, and Aliathra checked into the hospital for debriefing medical examination on their injuries, for several hours till she fainted on her father's arms. She unleashed a flood of tears, questioning the mortality of man being thrust upon such an innocent little girl at such a ripe young age for her to barely understand. None of Strider Group can ever forget April's cries all throughout that long night. Dash. One of Governor White's attendants quietly entered the conference where he held a video conference with between himself and His Excellency Prime Minister Bowsky. They were discussing about the conclusion of Klovich's tour of Earth the damages of the recent Grey Order aid upon the Principality and how best tactfully say the grave news. There has been a second attack Governor, the attendant whispered to Jeremy. What of the damages? The Governor asked. Mr. Sight is seeing to it now, the attendant nodded. The Governor White's head swayed back as he absorbed the bureaucrat's affirmative words as his attendant just as quietly as he entered took his leave. Jeremy lay there out in the open distraught on his words as he mindlessly recomposed himself as he turned to Prime Minister Bowski's holographic image from the video call standing in front of him. Is there something you want to tell of me? The Prime Minister asked. Bazka swallowed nervously as he prepared to make his opening word to a very indignant Prime Minister who had high hopes for New Albany's and Tyrion's continued partnership. Chapter 42 Exordia Bellum Garner have mercy. This is cannot be. Clovich wailed upon hearing first the news of the Grey Order attack on his realm. Walking around his hotel suite in the Imperial Hotel of Tokyo. He screamed at his closest confidants in attendance including Prime Minister Bowski himself who came rushing out of Switzerland to personally deliver and console the other world a prince of the incident. Clovich turned to the holographic images of his council of administrators who were left at home to see through the day-to-day -day operations of the principality in his absence. They were also Governor White who helped arrange this emergency meeting on the Metnet video conference had brought them all on the line. The prince kicked and screamed as he tossed every valuable piece of decor and furniture in his luxurious suite until his room became vandalized by the act of barbarism the other world brought forth. He couldn't believe at first that such a brazen display of reassertion of authority by his liege masters would do such a heinous act. But with the veracity of the shocking news now unquestioningly factual thanks in part to several prominent citizens of his principality speaking up of their plight that brought a wave of distraught amongst the people in the suite over the sheer amount of damages done. Initially, after personally seeing with his own two eyes the Federation of Earth's Marvels, Clovich wanted to gather a few gifts from Earth to be sent to Emperor Alden and his court of the imaginable prospects of a partnership between the Empire and the Earth and how both of them living together would be mutually beneficial. With all of those taken care of the Empire of Man will reach a new level of prestige the likes of which can humble venerable elves and the splendorous civilization of the Yujigong Fox people in their prime. With Federation resources and the Empire's magics a great new age can happen with them together in friendship, but ho! Oh, those plans are for naught by the news of his beloved Tyrion being devastated by an attack by said master he had served faithfully as their easternmost enforcer. Governor White reported that over half of Tyrion had been burnt down no thanks in part to rogue mages specializing in pyromantics being amongst the ranks of the Grey Order adventurers. Over about 800 of the prince's subjects had perished alongside 31 new colonists. 
half of them being young children. In terms of material damages, about 15 plots of land within the principality, accounting of less than half of all property plots in Tyrian had been burnt down by the raid. Economically it is a mix between several artisanry houses, townhomes, and several administrational offices that answered to him or the empire. And all for what? A prophecy that talks about the empire's destruction by the hands of the other worlders. So, they preemptively struck first, don't they actually understand who they are messing with? He knew that the empire can be arrogant at times especially to those they deem uncivilized as them but for them to do something like this. This was unforgivable that he couldn't believe that his masters would stab him and the people of Tyrian in the back over something so unsure than the oracles of a comet that could mean so many things within the imagination of just one person's interpretation. Show me again. Show me her again. Clovich fell down to his knees and shredded a torrent of tears. You know already N. Governor White tried to push the conversation forward as the prince was stalling himself on the damages rather than finding out how he can move forward but he was interrupted. I said show IT to me, the prince demanded, reluctantly. Jeremy conceded as he grabbed his tablet and played the traumatizing images of the damages, material and human back to the prince. There were bodies, injured, the anguishes and the ebony color of burnt wood that flooded Clovich's eyes once again as he and those of his entourage fell down into a despondent state. Yet worse of all is when Clovich saw his beloved sister, once the bright star of his life in this cold and grueling world be reduced to a comatose sleeping beauty on a hospital bed with bandages that covered her once fair face from the sinister blow she had received during the attack. The Prince of Tyrian screamed so loud that the glass window behind where Prime Minister Bowski stood upon reverberated. Clovich tore his clothes and lashed out to everything he could grab to be made upset of in the room from furniture, decor and even the flat screen TV, like a rampaging bull kicked, toss and punch every fragile and expensive piece of decor and furniture in his expensive Tokyo suite. Glass shattered, wood splintered and fabrics violated as the prince melted down to a rabid dog. A far cry of his once regal self. Prince Clovich. Prime Minister Bowsky coughed for the other worlders' attention. He had strafed to the side and took cover by the suite's closet as the prince vandalized his expensive hotel room. The prince, red-eyed with a seething broth filled with the stock of anger and despondency locked eyes with the grand leader of the Federation. A feeling of retreat could be detected when they faced each other as the prince crawled towards the Prime Minister's feet and knelt down looking for arms to the godly being before him. Are you feeling any better your highness? Francis asked him. I am fine. Thank you sir prime minister. The prince huffed. I apologize for this. Barbarism. He turned to the wreckage he created. Nothing some tax refunds can fix. The prime minister nodded with minuscule chide to break off some of the tension upon his smile. However, he stopped himself and shifted the mood of the conversation to a more deliberative tone. You do understand right now that your masters, the Slay agents have forced our hands and refuse all our talks of diplomacy. They made their bed with this misunderstanding so we have no other choice than war I am afraid. The Prime Minister went straight to the difficult words. He is right my prince, Edmure butted in with his sage words. We served faithfully for the Slegends for centuries and this is how they treat us. Over what? Some stupid prophecy from those quacks from the academy. All pish posh from those quill scrawlers. They slaughtered our people and burned half of the Tyrian on the words of that bastard Oin. I cannot believe the college and the emperor could be this foolish, reckless and inconsiderable like this. He growled. Seems like you have not much to say anything kindly to this Oin. Who is he to you? Francis asked. He and his ilk are dumb old sack of bones beneath all those fancy robes I tell you. He and the High Council of Magi, the leaders of the college would steal other forms of magic or ban those studies they do not approve of. Edmer curled his fist. I used to be part of the college as one of their scribes and I get to know what the Grand Master of Magics really is. A tired old tart who can't take anything for a good answer outside of his own. His stubbornness of how right he is, makes even the elves look humble. That sounds ghastly. Bazki commented. Oh, it does not stop there. 
He and the High Council is just another Senate I tell you where they're more concerned of keeping their positions rather than doing anything to help their own kind like us hedge mages. Ed Merle explained further, he likely had mistaken our workings with you for us dabbling in the arts of demon sorcery. Surely, they will send out their wizards and sorceresses to blast all of Tyrian to rubble as we speak. I know this is hard of me to say to you my prince but the Federation is our only safe haven. Even if survival is at stake, such a radical idea from Ed Merle was a concept that is initially hard to grasp. It was essentially changing masters from the one you know than the one you just met. But even then, by the way the former lashed out towards the other and himself the answer was perhaps the most uneasiest of transitions, your advisor is right. We all want to live in peace with my people wanting to make a new life on your world and your people wanting bring something to their current ones. If the problem is caused by us simply being together then we must solve this together. Francis Bowsky nodded in agreement. What are you proposing to us? Clovich asked the Prime Minister. Your cooperation, Bazka swayed. In exchange for our aid and our protection, you must now fall under our sphere. Your masters, the Slay Egyptians, no longer have your best interests at heart no more. But we do, the Prime Minister said, from the way you are speak your words, my lord. But you ask for our cooperation rather than for our servitude. They are the same thing. Clovich gave a passing mention. I can assure you that what I am saying is that I am speaking to you as a partner. Not as a master to your servant Prince Klovich, Bazki explained, in exchange for your native expertise in the land and your blessing in exchange for the ability to access your country's national resources, protect you from the Emperor's wrath, and then help develop Tyrian. You know just like Emperor Meiji, Bazka said. But I digress, for now what is best for your people is order them to stay within their principality and not leave their homes until after this crisis with the Empire is over. What will you plan to do with the Empire when you meet them in battle? Clovich asked. Pacification. We will make them calm down, by the force of our arms, Bazka said. The Tyriani prince sunk down to the ground as he heard those grim words from him. It was going to be a war with imperial bloodshed once again. Do not act like that now Prince Clovich, you would have done the same if you were me. This is the best option for all of us, the Prime Minister reminded him. We are to decisively stop this war that we all agree shouldn't have been made in the first place. With my speed and your subject's familiarity we can turn all of this around for the better of our mutual future. Francis spoke to all the other worlders in the room. The way you speak of your terms my lord, being under the wings of you Uifi is much more profitable than the Empire. We and the rest of Tyrian will enjoy prosperity with you now. A Tyriani official nodded of the radical idea for Clovich by the Hollow Conference. I do have to warn you that the people of the Empire will never kneel to the likes of an Astroni like the Federation. But for me, I share their blood so it is only right that when you do fight the Empire on this campaign of ours that I take the lead, he said. I can understand that Prince Clovich Bowsky nodded, but we can deal with the more pressing concerns of yours of modernizing Tyrian after we deal with the Empire. He reminded the Prince of the task at hand. If this were much simpler times, a few back-ended deals and subterfuge would have disposed or lobbied the Prince to dance to their tune. But alas, the common state party's opponents would eviscerate him five times over for breaking the so-called prime directive that some sages specializing in ethics would argue for. The Prime Minister do have to say, the Prince, being of a military rest himself, his knowledge working alongside the Slay Aegean legions should be invaluable on how their adversary would organize, intelligence that Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky would appreciate happily upon his cooperation with Operation Haymaker. I am not yet done, Clovich interrupted. I wished to at first, just one chance to write a letter, an ultimatum to Emperor Eldon before you descend upon them to reconsider his actions. If he doesn't then you may raise him down to the ground like he did to my fair city, he vengefully requested. That can be arranged. Francis smiled. Anything else? Yes, one more. The prince depressed his tone. The last thing I ask of you is that, I, beg of you for more one thing before we go through with this, that you promise not to unleash your mushroom clouds on the Empire. 
As much I want to see Eldon and my former masters be punished for this hubris, I cannot live with myself to see Gleezia become like of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I am still not able to get rid of those horrific images from my head. Clovich expresses his dreadfulness upon referencing the various means the youth could a destructive hell upon their foes. The visit in the Japanese History Museum in Tokyo was an eye-opening experience for Clovich and his entourage. He saw how his patronized paragon, Emperor Meiji brought his country to the peak of civilization despite the severe disadvantage and amount of barbarian influence he had to fight off with during his time. He could understand that hint of reluctance when he asserted himself in front of him so brazenly when they were talking about the terms of their very tendentious alliance. The visit was an insightful way to understand more about Japan but it was that trip. Clovich and his officials understand why they should see the youth in a more godly manner as for the first time. They see wars the earthlings had endured throughout their entire history, especially the three world wars that made the demon wars and some of the other dystopic conflicts in Gleesia compare to of drunken bar brawls and street triads, the destruction and greater amount of desire to cause it throughout the ages. These earthlings were of a strange capability behind all their opulence and senses of order and peace to be more than capable of being possessed with Weidel the war god's madness. I know and I understand, Francis reassured him. We only use it when for the last resort and we have strict rules of using the nukes. Fidar be praised and may you Aries bless you so Bowski. Now that is settled, I would declare that in light of these new events, the Slay Aegeans are lost cause now. After seeing what they had done and how overwhelmingly powerful and advanced UFAE really are, I see that the only way forward is with you. The prince agreed to his terms. Agir Bian, Francis shook the prince's hand. We shall stand together, arms banded together. Then it is settled. I Prince Clovich, is declaring secession of Tyrian from the Slaeagian Empire and joining the UFAE. For the betterment of my people and the entire Glycia I declare from this moment onward a new age for not only the people of Tyrian but of all of the Empire and the Glycia. The Tyrian amelioration. We will bring forth a new sun to rise on the Verdun Valley and throughout all of my world. Clovich decreed. Bazka smiles as he turned to the holographic projector to see the optimistic cheers of Clovich's cheering subjects. Unite, harmony, prosperite. He said the common state party's banner to the patriotic fervor of the attending Governor White, Major Holyfield, and Colonel Polonsky. Dash. Faith Len huffed and puffed in relief as his sword split in half the final obstacle in the dungeon, a Frankenstein of a golem made of assorted muscles and bones of what appears to be a bear, a moose and appallingly several human parts. The abominable construct fell before him as the cowering Sochephil necromancer cowered behind his phylactery of evil make. For his first ever quest he and his party consisting of Marchog Fawn, Pedger and Carlia came to the small village of Igni to investigate a strange happening according to the local sheriff. There is a plague happening in the village that has claimed the lives of several people and the once lively town had devolved into a dreary hamlet that is shadow of its once vigorous self of an animal husbandry focused town. According to the quest board, a mysterious stranger entered the village months ago and had been making numerous strange requests to the mayor regarding about the deceased victims of the plague. It is said that the stranger requested for the bodies of the deceased at first that at initial glance, the mayor assumed he was just going to dispose of the bodies properly but then he started asking for livestock viscera, escalating to live animals before finally hiring out one of the village maidens to go work for him at his abode a walk away from Igni. In exchange for the chosen one's help, the local duke in charge of Igni will supply additional men and resources for Faithland's army against the demonic invasion. It was also an opportunity for the Chosen One to also test his mettle in a real quest as he feels very confident and self-assured with two of the Grey Order's greatest champions by his side. Upon entering the shady individual's abode, Faith Len in a rather dense display of his naivete shouted on the door like the tales in the book of how the hero would declare that his challenge upon the villain. Please wait for a moment while my master picks up the door, said a magical voice that resonated by the door. I faith Len Garmhaik, 
Knight of the Empire have come to strike you down you vile vampire, he said as he unsheathes his broadsword, the chosen one, with his blessed might kicked down the enchanted door with a forceful incantation that blessed him with titanic strength, tearing the barrier down with a mighty wail upon its collapse. He hurriedly rushes down into the bowels of the home screaming a battle cry demanding for the necromancer's head. He had unwittingly while causing a ruckus to all of the furniture of the place, set off several traps that while his enhanced agility made him easily dodge past them to the point he never noticed he actually triggered them unwittingly left his teammates at the mercy of the traps payload from explosive runes, poison darts and even a spike trap. Thankfully his more experienced teammates knew of such traps and were already anticipating something like this but much to their chagrin, especially the more tomb raiding experienced gold ranked adventurers at his side, he would rather disarm the traps than having to weave around them post triggering. Even when encountering the vampire's bone constructs that the young chosen one displayed his fighting prowess but without much plan to the concepts of teamwork as he would for a brief moment find himself fighting against three or four skeletal guards alone. If it weren't for Petrick Dorf hasting to his side, a skeletal warrior with his rusted blade would have struck an easy blow on the Chosen One's overwhelmed defenses. The faithful Spellblade has to admit to his colleague Carlia, the boy was starting to get into his nerves. After making short work of the guards, and a quick scolding by Petra and Marchog Fawn, the party breached the necromancer's inner sanctum where they were greeted by frail-looking vampire with his contrastingly imposing flesh gillum. Inside the sanctum, the party to their horror saw a very macabre sight of pickled body parts in jars, vials of blood stocked to such a height that it could feed a whole coven of such a I feel. Blasphemous notes that illustrated on detail the vast amount of effects the Igni Plague had brought forth in vivid detail. It was all that obvious that the vampire is turning the Hamlet into the subject of his sick experiments. You villain, how dare you place this plague upon the village of Igni? Faith Len pointed his sword at the cowering vampire, his feet standing atop of the crumbled corpse of the necromancer's bodyguard. No, you do not understand what you are doing, you brats. The vampirist. I am trying to save people not kill them. If you just let me explain and wait for my assistant. He pleaded for his life. Oh? Care to defend yourself then? Marchog Fawn asked. Yes. Let me explain to you what I am doing. The vampire said. I grab some of the known holders of the plague and with some restoration magics I created a weak conversion of the tainted blood too. He reached into his desk and to the skipped beat of the hearts of the entire party, the vampire wielded with him a crooked knife, freshly tasting of blood. Higher, Faith Len shouted. He didn't hesitate and cut down the vampire with his sword. Wait. No, the vampire's unnatural life faded as he collapsed to the ground. It was a fatal blow. Faith Len. What did you do? Carlyle scolded him. He tried to reach for a knife. He justified. I have to say. Yes that vampire just did try to grab that blade, Marchog Fane backed up the chosen one as he investigated the knife from the dead hands of the vampire. And look it's indeed tainted with blood, we were supposed to capture him however so that he may be tried for his crimes. Petcher mentioned the details of the bounty, but still Sir Petcher, this evidence is damning enough. Faith Len added, gesturing his arms across all the sickening sights within the necromancer's sanctum. He and Carlyle could barely keep their fragile stomachs together the longer they stayed inside the room. Gar just take whatever evidence that proves this one's guilt and toss away the rest. Carlyle gagged. Marchog Fawn, Faith Len, and Petra nodded and began to carry off as many of the disgusting paraphernalia away. Research notes. The necromancer's knife, a few samples of the preserved body parts were saved to be presented to the local lord and his sheriff to prove of the vampire's guilt whilst the rest of the contraband were tossed away to rot and be washed away nearby a creek. May Nanith and Tivno welcome you to their garden. Faith Len prayed to the poor souls whose body parts were trapped inside the preservative fluids within the jar. It was a right to give peace to do those that had passed on of incomplete form a special prayer, if one perished in a very unrecognizable form, the soul cannot pass on to the afterlife normally and remain still bound inside the mortal world, 
The funerary rite to correct this is to have whatever remains of their body to be sanctified in holy water before expediating the remains to a nearby body of running water such as a river, a creek or the seas. The legend says that all life used to come from water and that the life and death goddess with the help of the water god Delios reform the body part from within the earth through the waters that rooted and breathe life to what was once alive. It was a harmonious prayer that also signifies the cycle of life that all beings must one day go through, despite some people's attempts to defy said cycle. Through this prayer, the goddess will return the body to its rightful owner's soul before it can be passed off peacefully into the afterlife lest they suffer in a limbo between life and death as eternally sorrowful spirits who wail loudly for the justice of crossing to the other side but unable to for their mortal forms were not complete upon their demise. What, by the gods what happened? A woman approached the vampire's hideout, dropping a basket of meager groceries to the earthen floor and cupped her hands as her eyes teared in confusion. She leapt herself towards the ransacked hideout but she was caught by Carlia and Marchog Fawn. What are you doing here lady? This is official imperial business you are intruding upon. Fawn informed the stranger. What are you doing at my master's abode? She questioned. Your master has been caught dealing with the arts of necromancy and causing a plague throughout the region. Faith Len explained to her. Why, you? You are the chosen one? The lady asked of him. Faith Len nodded, confirming the woman's hopes that the hero could listen to her reason. You have this all wrong hero. My master would never hurt anyone. He is kind, benevolent and too reclusive to go out and curse the land. And for what? The woman made her case. Lies you wench. You are a thrall to the vampire master of yours just like the rest. Faith Len dejected her. It was uncommon for vampires to acquire outside help due to their nature of keeping within the shadows of contemporary society. But when they do, they would often use a spell that would mesmerize any non-vampiric servant of theirs to do their unquestioned bidding called and thrall. According to Magicum Codex, a written law detailing about the extent magic can be used in society. That illusion spell was deemed illegal to cast and the punishment is a hefty fine for damages and or a period within a jail cell. Please hero, I can prove it to you please. The woman struggled to break the combined bindings of Marchog Fawn and Carlia. Calm down peasant, Fawn coughed. She is still under the vampire's thrall spell. Take her away and have her watched by the guards until she returns to normal. Faith Len said. Allow me. Carlia volunteered. She knows her way around such spells that revolves around duration and constant intoxication. With a flick of her hands she attempts to use her magics to reverse the woman's senses. What are you doing to me? Stop. The woman struggled from Carlia's grip. If it was like lock picking a very high quality lock, which said lock tries it it might to remain unlock. That is what Carlia could say when she tried and failed to reverse the woman's mesmerized condition. Whatever and however this vampire had enthralled her with, it must have been a very potent spell to keep her in line to his whims. The woman's frantic shuffles brought Marchog Fain to the brink of losing his grip and bringing Faith Len and Petra on edge. No, you are making a big mistake here chosen one, you have doomed us all. The woman tried to reach out her hands, but Faith Len grabbing his rope by his pocket, lassoed the woman into a hogty and boarded her atop of his horse with a gag on her mouth for good measure. Throughout all the time during the transition of his brutal act, he roughhoused the crazed woman with a few blunt strikes from the pommel of his sword whenever she attempted to scrap herself free. That was a bit too much force of you child. Carlia rebuked Faith Len over his heavy handedness. Indeed, she's not like those gillums and skeletons we fought back there. She is just less of your height. Petra added, even he has limits when it comes to forms of bystander control. A simple yell and a mention of his name would have got many bystanders to back off from his way when it comes to any Grey Order related business. I thought you were adventurers you too? Faith Len turned around to his seniors. We must not delay for every waking moment. Evil continues to fester like an ulcer in the land. We cannot be denidling with this frivolous shite. He justified himself. I am not saying we are denidling chosen one. What I am saying is that you need to learn how to think before you act. 
There is a difference that separates the lower-ranked adventurers from the higher ones. What you did was reckless of you, rushing in and triggering all of the necromancer's traps. You were lucky it was a delayed but still. You and all of us here could have died. Petra said. By all accounts so far, that woman you handled was by law to be innocent due to her unsound state of being enthralled. Carly added. Before you two say that because you are jealous because the crystal had chosen me to be its champion. I am blessed with divine protection by all of Empyrean. He boasted to the Gleesian pantheon. Watch your mouth boy. Being a chosen one does not mean you are invincible. We are a team. Blessed by the Emperor to protect the realm from darkness. Remember what that shaman did to you? Marchog Fain added. May I remind you that I, Faith Lengarm Hayek, did all the work clearing the vampire hideout. Why are we having this argument when we must continue in? Do you haste to Mount Sin now? Faith Len turned around and mounted on his horse as the three seniors of his were left low before him shaking their heads disapprovingly by his attitude. Sometimes, I think that the Emperor knighting him at such a callow age was a mistake. Carlyle grumbled. Give the boy some more time. I know many of knights who were like him. Even you were guilty of that Petra, Fawn said. I wish I could take that all back. Petra regretted his youthful days of hot-headed rebelliousness. It is best we give him some more patience. The venerable knight gave his sage wisdom. Very well. Just keep the boy intact enough until we reach Mountson. Carlyle conceded. They mounted their horses and quickly galloped to the quarantined town of Igni where after an explanation of what had transpired, the submission of their evidence and one crazed vampire thrall, the village mayor happily declared the end of the outbreak now that the source of the plague had been eradicated to the wind. Faith Len's party was handsomely rewarded with a generous stock, at least by a small animal husbandry focused village could thankfully donate, of preserved meats and poultry eggs for their travels. There was still quite a long road ahead for Faith Len and his army men to cover before reaching their destination of Mountson, where they would meet up with diplomats from the dwarven hold of Kerfulta to facilitate the extensive purchase of dwarven ingots. On their way, there were more activities for Faith Len's followers that they undertake from requisition quests to helping out the local lords that he and his army passed by in their lands. However, try as he might. Whenever he put himself into the fray to display his heroic status amongst the populace, for a reason or another, he always seems to get under one's skin, the nerves of those parties involved. During one time, during a hunting expedition to gather some game meat for the camp, he spotted a lone stag whose leg was stuck upon a suffocating leg trap meant for a much larger beast. Faith Len had though that if he had freed the stag, he would have either its eternal gratitude or perhaps transform into a fae and bless him with some gods given boon that would boost his power tenfold but instead, all he received the stag's two hind legs kicking him in the face before it limply scampered off before succumbing to its injuries. They still brought the corpse back to camp for some venison stew but the chosen one himself couldn't bear the insult of it. Another time, when passing by for his tour of the eastern provinces of the empire, he undertook a quest to help exterminate a giant spider who had managed to burrow itself inside a burial mound that frequented a particularly Tivna devoted township. Employing the same tactics, he did back in Agni, Faithlen rushed inside the mound to slay the mother spider. He had gotten a mouthful of spider webbings for his haphazard approach and have unintentionally awoken the rest of the hive to scamper scurry off from the burial mound now that their home has been compromised. A total of nine of Faithland's followers plus ten of the local lord's people were killed with dozens more incapacitated via spider venom due to the resulting stampede before it was burnt off by a few streams of fire blasts from the College of Magi demographic of Faithland's army. But even then, after that mishap, Faithland still had the gall to demand for the promised supplies the Lord pledged to donate to him without him considering about the losers he had taken which had infuriated several of his followers upon his insensitivity. The Lord shortchanged his pledge by denying half of the promised goods and it took Petra and Findrum to drag Faithland away when he tried to impose imperial mandate upon that Lord before quietly galloping off at the first opportunity.
The next similar incident was when Faith Len chanced upon a barony after the previous arachnid incident where he was told that the land was plagued by a group of centaur bandits who have been stealing food stocks from the farmers in the area. Upon tracking them down, the centaur bandits were soon discovered to be a nomadic group of Rhodos tribesmen that migrated south clandestinely for better grazing grounds but due to the Slaegeans' inherent racism against Beastkin they were denied any such services or abilities to trade as if it were illegal to even give them a passing glance. Thus they were forced into banditry in order to acquire supplies and items that they need to scrape by. The Beastkin begged Faith Len's party to take pity at them for they were only trying to live peacefully but circumstances forced them into the dishonorable state they are in now. At first, Marchog Fawn suggested that the most diplomatic choice was to hand over several of their supplies to the centaurs and then tell them to run away from them with a head start since he they were only hired to be rid of the bandits in the local region, but it doesn't say to kill them or arrest them. The old knight also fears that fully confronting this roving clan of centaurs would cause too much trouble than it is worth, as Dawson fighters can be deceptively tenacious. But Faith Len immediately shot him down, saying that the law is law and with his empowered magics tried to force them to give up their ill-gotten gains or else. A fight broke out where Faith Len savagely murdered several filthy beastmen whilst the rest of the clan fled away easily due to their superior speed. This escalation and failure of dialogue however left a very bad taste in the mouth for many of Faith Len's followers upon the news of what had transpired. Meta warned Faith Len that the Dawson, are not the type who would forgive nor forget about such a crime against them. Yet the last encounter they had undertaken before reaching their destination was perhaps the most infuriating of Faith Len's impetuous youthfulness. The son of a local prominent citizen of the adjacent region had begged for Faith Len's help in searching for his missing son who was spelunking at a nearby river and had never returned. Wanting to become a knight in shining armor like the stories he read of them rescuing the weak and helpless, Faith Len tracked the boy's whereabouts. With the help of Meta the Crow's superior tracking skills, Faith Len's party deduced that the little boy shouldn't have gone too far into the river. After a desperate search for the child, Faith Len's party happened to chance upon a goblin encampment deep within Slaegean territory. Greenskins such as these pint-sized people would often roam around the Slaegean territories and look for work and would have enclaves of their kin living about in the Empire's lands. They often find themselves as either household servants, hired muscle or descent into pickpocketing. This gave them a bad reputation as being bottom feeders that many of the Imperials would look down upon them forcing them to remain and scrap by in their enclaves. Occasionally they do business or interact with their non-goblin neighbors but due to the aforementioned discrimination, their options were severely limited. The Chosen One plus several other of his men were uneasy passing by the encampment but they kept their cool since the goblins mean no harm to them, only fleeing to their TP tents to hide from their more physically imposing hosts. But when Faith Len's eyes caught the most unusual sight inside the goblin witch doctor's tent to see a small human boy being placed on the altar work table, Faith Len threw a huge fit against the witch doctor and the chieftain accusing them of kidnapping the boy. The two co-rulers of the goblin encampment immediately denied those accusations and gave their sides of the story. They stated that the boy was found unconscious but alive by a nearby riverbank and one of their hunter-gatherers chanced upon him and brought him back to the camp to be nursed back to health by the witch doctor. The chosen one however, did not want to hear another word from the goblins no longer. He tells that greenskins, beastmen taint this holy good imperial earth with their filthy feet and charged his hands to cast a fireball upon the goblin chieftain incinerating him and several other goblins. This forced the rest of the goblins to attack Faith Len and his party in self-defense led by the witch doctor. Due to the unexpectation on the chosen one's part, Faith Len didn't expect the witch doctor to be more than capable of disabling all of his warrior heroics to its potential during the melee. Using the goblin's terrifying shamanistic powers, he casted a totem on Faith Len causing his feet to be weighed heavily as his footwork became kneecapped by the influence of witch doctor's magics. 
he chanted to his heathen gods to aid him in this battle for his tribe by casting additional curses upon their attackers from making them move uncomfortably slow, cancelling out their magics or blunting their attacks. Meter the crow, still as stealthy as she is, managed to backstab the witch doctor, killing off his maledicted cursing once and for all freeing every one of the Imperials out of the shamanistic curses they were infected upon. Overall, after retrieving the captive and scattering the goblins away from their home, the group calculated that they may have killed off half of the encampment's populace. Faith then returned the young boy to his grateful father whom the child mentioned that in his dreams he saw a kind green forest spirit that healed him off of his waterlogged lungs. Marchog Fawn and Petja, after attaining additional supplies and levies quietly dragged Faithlen away to the side and scolded him again for his impulsive behavior and refused to let go of the Chosen One's excuses of they were going to do something evil with the boy. They told him that if they are to draw weapons, it would be in their more strategically planned terms from now on instead of Faithlen's reckless zealotry. Much to his chagrin, Faithlen yielded his pride for once. If it meant that the approaching crowd of onlookers look at him being scolded by those technically at his senior in spite of his chosen one status. Deep down behind all of Faith Len's bravado of exemplifying the perfect romanticizations of folk tale hero, he was raised by his parents to be a self-sufficient child capable of a high degree of versatility with one's body. A true do-it-yourself kind of individual which is complemented by his reliance on the pure strength of will that his courage as a warrior also entails upon confronting any challenge. Additionally, there weren't that much opportunities for him to experience the real world outside of his hometown of Clearviewite so his temperaments remained of a country simpleton, uneducated in the ways of any form that requires finesse. These factors resulted in Faithlen being the kind of person who wouldn't work well with large teams, instead working with himself or a small group of people, let alone an army at his behest and call. This was ironic since in the stories of heroes that Faithlen had observed, the protagonists always had a myriad cast of supporters and followers that lifted the hero up to venture forward despite all the odds. The young boy was too affixed on the superhuman achievements that the heroes of each story to barely give a glance to the other characters in those stories. But even then, Faith Len has yet to meet a proper challenge to his exponential abilities. He was just a beholding sight in the middle of the terror of the fight that most of his opponents, all lesser in strength cower below him as none could match his swordsmanship coupled with his magics. After the embarrassing scene, the Chosen One kicked himself up and quietly marched forward with the rest of his now relieved comrades who were already getting put up with his youthful arrogance. They trod the road now undeterred as they made their way to Mountson for their rendezvous. This time he will try to follow his senior's suggestions from this point forward if it means they would stop holding him down from further realizing the extent of his power. Although officially a city within the jurisdiction of the Far Eastern lands of the Stlaetian Empire, the city of Mountson, situated right below the westernmost slopes of the Astlrooks has a very significant dwarven influence both political and economic throughout the architecture, people, governance and culture. About a century ago, the human mining town was met with an onset of immigration of dwarves descending from the Astlrock Mountains looking for new opportunities outside of their padded slopes and treacherous undergrounds that was the Dwarven Mountain clan lands. Most of them were of a skill trade ranging from craftsmen and tradesmen. Throughout that century, Mountson grew into the Stlaetian Empire's arsenal, boosted with a supply of ingots from the Dwarven Mountains built by the best artisans the empire could gather second to the blacksmiths of Herring Point all to arm the Stlaetian Empire with the best arms to boast throughout all of the land. Their people brought about a unique architectural design to Mountson's cityscape alongside the industrial district within the city famous for acquiring high-quality metallurgical works across all the Zanigrad continent. It was like Kerfold Herminus, the lucrative and conveniently embedded mine since the city relies on imports for more exotic ingots to keep their workshops belching smoke. 
The deal between the Empire and the great dwarven hold of Kerfoldha was to meet halfway between this melting pot of two long-friended cultures in Mountson since the city has the blacksmithing aptitude and industrial might to re-equip an entire army so quickly, all that Faithlen needed to do was to entertain a few formalities before sealing off the trade deal that will allow him to build the weapons and armor of Gyronite and Scandonite he needs to be able to take the fight against the demonic threat. But upon his arrival, instead of the delectable fanfare of the populace cheering towards his arrival and dressing him in all greetings, he and his party saw a once prosperous and industrious city of Mountson on the brink of anarchy. The streets were crowded with protesting artisans from the city's smith and guilds as they marched down to the city centre to air their grievances to the local duke. Upon the site of Faith Len's party, the protests calmed down slightly as several of the citizenry turned round and flocked to Faith Len Garmhaik so they could bid him and his blessed imperial mandated army to the city. However, some of the greeters who unleashed a torrent of complaints and apologies to the entourage as realizing what is wrong, Mita the Crow suggested that they investigate what had just happened by getting an audience with the Duke of Mountson. With Findrum, Pecha, Carlia, Fawn and Olera by his side, Faithlen entered the city hall and made his way up to the assembly hall where the Duke was mediating the squabbling powers that runs Mountson. The Chosen One the Duke's eyes widened upon the unexpected arrival of Faithlen and his party. Everyone in the room, human and dwarf kneeled down on the blessed individual to show their respects which made Faithlen lighten himself after the humiliation he had received earlier. My lord, I see that your city has been seeing a malady of unrest right now, is not Mountson famous for being one of the most peaceful cities in all of the Empire? The Chosen One asked. It was a few days ago but my apologies for having you witness such an insurrection upon your arrival. I hope the commoners did not trouble you too much on your way here, the duke asked for pardon. What had just recently transpired to result such chaos, Marchog Fawn asked of the duke. The duke gulped as he took a deep breath and a cold sweat fell down his brow as he and also the rest of his board of bureaucratic administrators fearfully turned their eyes at the chosen one and his companions. This revolt involves you in a way, the duke stuttered. It is about the shipment of Gyronite and Scandonite for your army my lord. What happened? Faithlen pressed to have the duke come to the point of his dialogue. The shipment had failed to make the journey in all of its entirety. The duke confided. My sword and armor have been what? Faithlen bolted up, a nerve piercing his forehead as he was left shaken by the news. The demons, we believe have attacked the Dwarven Mining Guild's shipment of all of those ingots your emperor had paid so handsomely to obtain, the duke said. Curse ye all of them. Faith Lent shouted. These demons are very tenacious I have to say. Findrum commented. Incredibly clever too. Olayra nodded. They are denying us the means to fight them by making off of our army's weapons that could defeat them. Scandonite and Gyronite were incredibly expensive to not only harvest from the depths of the Estal Rock Mountain mines but the skill required demands an equally expensive amount of effort to forge the ingots into weapons worthy of an army of heroes that is capable of keeping the darkness at bay. Manson and Kerfoldha were perhaps the ideal places to process these powerful metals into such powerful arms and they lack no competency nor any high quality industry to accomplish such a task. However, within the context of the situation, it was easier and cheaper to import the ingots to Manson and have them be manufactured into weapons within the Empire territory than pass through a heftier tariff on the dwarves and if the weapons themselves were imported to Manson for Faithland's army to pick up. That doesn't explain the turmoil that is clamoring about outside of this hall right now? Petra questioned. Those are the artisans that were meant to help forge the ingots into your weapons. Many of them traveled from all across the land to be able to take their opportunity of the great pay they receive upon undertaking this imperial contract of forging your mighty weapons and armor chosen one of the sacred crystal. But alas, with no ingots to forge with many are without work and without work they have no means of creating a livelihood, the duke explained. That is. 
That is impossible. Surely these people must know if they don't work then the Empire and soon all of Gleesia will be devoured by the demonic horde if they don't get to work soon. Faith Len objected to this setback. What of the great Kerfalter? What had happened to them? Surely they also know of this tragedy? Mogul Dolmond of Kerfaldher is saddened greatly by the loss of his porters and the shipment of ingots from his mines to Mountson. A dwarven emissary apologized. Then what can we do? Without the ingots we cannot have weapons, and without the weapons we cannot fight the demonic invasion. Faith Lendy cried. I apologize greatly again chosen one but we do not have the capability, not with our current manpower working in the mines to harvest all of the same amount of gyronite and scandonite in such a short period of time. That was ten years worth of regular mining work mind you. The emissary explained. Then why not make the miners' families help them out to work faster? Have the women and children support their husbands and fathers in the mines? Faith Len impetuously suggested. We cannot be deterred by this setback from these demons. Hold on boy. You reminded me of something. Findrim waved off Faith Len as he scratched his long beard to recollect a memory from his aged mind. This one is drastic but I do believe we have no choice in the matter. Findrim stepped forward to the pedestal. You are not saying? The dwarven emissaries recoiled upon realizing what Findrim is about to propose. There is an edict within the dwarven holds that is often enacted during times of war or a great crisis happens upon them. We call it Lokantira. It involves the forced labor of a mandated amount of terrace dwarves to work for some great construction project conscription. Or to harvest more minerals. This applies to all of the terrace dwarves, male or female, young and old. Essentially put most of them to work in the mines to get the ingots we need. Findrim said. The last time we did that, Mogul Dolmond was nearly overthrown if we had not cut the head of those snakes from the mining guilds. The emissary protested. It was all for fighting off the beastkin out of the mountains and repairing what was destroyed in their wake. Findrim argued, I support my dwarven follower, Emissary. If we do not get our hands on these weapons then we might not have a tomorrow. Faith Len argued, Aralea forgive me. Fine. The Emissary recognizing the importance of this project conceded. But I will need you and your army to help keep the peace above the mountains whilst we regather the ingots you need for the demon invasion. He said, Gods be praised. Tell this mogul Dolman that he should have every healthy dwarven man, woman and child working around the clock with the geomancers to crack open those veins immediately. Findrim ordered. Wait. May I question one thing? Kalaya asked. Isn't Gyronite and Scandonite requires one to venture very deep below ground to obtain? Findrim and the Dwarven Emissary nodded. There is absolutely no way we can make women and children do something so dangerous like that. Carlia protested. You rather let the demons win in the end Carla? Faith Len asked of her. Do you know any other way we can defeat the demons? Do you master? Olaira asked Carlia. I. No. The mage humbled her head. Look Carlia. We just need to scale the Astrix and make sure the work goes smoothly. If anything happens to those miners you can protect them. Marchog Fawn placed his hand on her bare shoulder. I understand. Carlia softly acknowledged. A single lonesome tear filled with guilt fell upon her cheek as her heart sank over what she will be an accessory of doing for the trying time ahead. Times like these bring about the worst of some people. Even Olayra too was heartbroken that she will have to witness such a very heavy-handed sight all for the sake of survival. It was a hard choice that is made by hard men, but it was ultimately the right choice. Within the span of one day and through the Twitter bird messaging spell, Kerfold her immediately enacted the draconic Vlokantira edict. Across its lands and even several nearby ones, many unwilling terrorist dwarves were corralled and press ganged into the dark deep mines where they were put to work in slave like conditions. Young, old, male, and female, all in the name of a greater good. Those who tried to resist were either arrested, cowed into silence, or be made a brutal example of. However, there were still a few that managed to flee away to warn their fellow commoner of what tyranny had just sprouted its ugly head once again throughout the dwarven mountains that is the Astrix. 
One such dwarf soon began to write an urgent letter upon his messenger hawk to be sent off to inform his brother who is a merchant in the citadel of Tyrian. Dash. Either way of these old school methods, we still need to protect our rear before we can push forward with Haymaker, Polonsky said. We can no longer rest in our asses and underestimate the Empire no longer, Holyfield grumbled again. A thousand more apologies from me Colonel. And Major Agent Dessart bowed, I will. The recent attacks have staggered the Federation's presence in Gleesia, forcing them to fall back into a defensive posture, much to Major Holyfield's disappointment. If it were not for these attacks, the tanks and planes that are being armed for his grand operation Haymaker would have started tomorrow upon the dawn's first glint light. But alas, if the Federation cannot secure their home front then the enemy has already won. So now, the youth is forced to play pest exterminator. Operation Clearwater it is dubbed by Colonel Polonsky. This counter-terror campaign is in response after the investigation of Inspector Reed and his people on how the elf Sephid Liad member, known as Lindis by the identification of Aliath Rolatha managed to conduct the second attack on Tyrian. According to the recent police detective's publicly reported findings, Lindis used barrels of odorous preserved fish to smuggle inside a few smaller bags of Uzegan with fragmentation. A gunpowder-like substance originating from the Dwarven Islrix. She safely triggered the gas with a form of rune magics which allows her to safely detonate the hidden bomb much like a remote detonator. The elf would have gotten away with this heinous crime of killing those innocent people if it weren't for the valiant efforts of Strider Group cornering her and slaying her when she decided to resist arrest. It was disappointing however that she wasn't captured alive, but for some people, it was a deserving end for a monster such as her. As Holyfield has said, it is time for the gloves are off for the Federation and to show this alliance of the light to see who are the real monsters here. Whilst Haymaker is all about speed and power, Calm Waters revolves around staying one step ahead of an enemy that hides unseen until the moment it strikes. A shield to the former's sword, an internal intelligence campaign focused on strong governance and staying power. The operation follows a step-by-step -step process upon securing newly acquired territory for the Federation with Tyrian being the first stepping stone upon a long road ahead for the Gleesian pacification campaign. First upon making landfall in a new territory is to create blockages from the external borders leading out of the territory through restrictive checkpoints that are constantly monitored for any insurgency activity. The second step involves a propaganda campaign to discourage rebellion and encourage cooperation with the occupiers such as delivering Clovich's amelioration speech that the prince is working on to be spread out through the land and with plans to blare out such propaganda at common areas from towns, villages and city centers. The third step is to be purging all Grey Order adventurers that does not surrender or yield to any accepted Federation armed forces who are considered irregular fighters in units due to being not being part of a uniformed armed force but having the skills that have an innate value in a guerrilla force that then any remnant of the Stla Agent Legion would inevitably devolve into. Speaking about this plan, Polonsky, with the help of Klovich's administrators and the guard captain have declared martial law within Tyrian as search teams scour the citadel for any more insidious blots or suspicious items. In regards to the natives' primitive technology, it should not last long but when it comes to mages, that could become a problem as there are still too many unknown factors to take into account when it comes to them. At least Dr. Malona is currently making a magic countermeasure in which he asks for the acceleration of that project upon completion of Project Hecate. One more thing Jan, but are you sure about training these natives Colonel? With our training and guns? Major Holyfield added in one more question. Prince Klovich wants to modernize so he wants his men to be given our weapons and training to defend themselves, Polonsky explained. Besides it was straight from the top coming down so we can't question this one. The colonel added, there was a radical announcement that is being put into the discussion by the inner circle as of the early morning, from straight up by Prime Minister Bowski. The chairman said that the Principality of Tyrian in all of its extent is now a core territory and is under the protection of the United Federation of Earth.
a bold move in itself that many of the personnel on the ground have mixed opinions of the matter, but the second part of the announcement of Tyrion's annexation was the concept, from Prince Klovich's own words himself the modernization of the Principality's guards and knights arming and training the primitive soldiers of Tyrion into an equal-footed modern army on part of the degree of aptitude with a regular Yafif soldier. The inner circle had their personal opinions of the matter from the major, agent the Sut and Thomas being against the idea stating that this was essentially giving their one only leverage against the natives preferring the status quo of the power difference between them whilst Governor White, Inspector Reed, and the Colonel were supporting the notion as it would ease their military and administrative reach throughout the local region. The decision that overrides and decided upon the deadlock was straight from the unanimous decision of the Chairman of the High Command Commission, that Klovich will reform his army of knights, men at arms, and yeomen into a modern fighting force worthy to stand side by side with the Ufif, the rationale being of the political legitimacy of their mandated rule in their own land being more accepted compared to a Ufif outright occupying the entirety of the country. If this planet were to be annexed by the Federation and shall be through a native sun aligned to their designs. Word was shared that Prince Klovich has received a generous sum of Ufif weaponry and equipment ranging from helmets, body armor, radios, and rifles to be retrofitted the medieval soldiers into the 23rd century. I shall keep tabs when I start seeing knights holding guns now, just as I will for any of those bleeders. Agent de Sut sighed. Bleeders being the nickname he calls the thuggish Grey Order adventurers he and Inspector Reed are tasked to hunt down. So, if that is all that everyone has to say then I can say that this meeting is ad. Major Holyfield was about to conclude the meeting but suddenly the room was rudely interrupted when the conference room's door slammed open. Calamity, atrocity, tyranny, my lords. Luther Amirian stumbled upon the scene, screaming loudly to the air that all of the other nearby people of the governor's palace could hear. The dwarf held with him a letter by his hands. Mirian, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be back in the citadel helping the rebuilding process? Reed asked the dwarf. Mirian's role post incident was to facilitate the supply of much needed building materials imported from the dwarven dominated Astal Rock Mountains. Whatever is distressing him enough to brazenly crash into the Federation's inner heart of power in Gleesia must have been truly colossal in its direness. My brother, he has sent a letter to me about what has happened from my northern homeland. He says that the soldiers of the local moguls have been press-ganging the mining guilds and other terraced dwarves to redouble their mining efforts at an expeditious pace, the dwarf said. Sounds pretty normal since we just traded a ton of their most valuable trade goods. Holyfield commented, that is not the worst of it, but they have been also forcing the miners' families to venture into the mines with them, Marion said. That is disturbing, Polonsky gulped. Still. They are trying to make up for the lost time in production by speeding up the work processing. Essentially a form of forced labor. Holyfield spat in disgust. That is not even the worst of the worst of the news. You see, now this. This is a secret between me and the mining guilds, Luther confessed. According to the geological surveys, the extensive mining that the moguls and their families have pushed throughout the centuries have depleted nearly all the ore veins worth of value within the Isleriks. The mining guilds try to make this case to ease the collection but the geomancer is enslaved to their greeds. If they continue, a catastrophic collapse could happen in which many people from the Isleriks and even the Empire could die from. Tyrion could be buried if the Isleriks collapse if the moguls continue on their way. Essentially. A Yellowstone-like situation? Damnation. Holyfield cursed. My god that's horrible. Polonsky recoiled. So you are here to ask us to help you save your kin from themselves? The dwarf nodded. We can strike two birds with one stone Jan, save some lives and gain the gratitude of a new section of people whilst also cutting off the Empire from their much needed mineral stock once and for all. Holyfield smiled. But sending the troops out to the Astlerooks could be troublesome. We are stretched thin right now with the haymaker preparations and the bleeding within the principality. Dasat melancholically informed Luya. Please, 
You can trust my brother and the mining guilds to help you save our chained brothers and sisters. We need to stop them before it is too late, Luya begged. Tell me Mr. Mirian, the intelligence agent asked. How much influence does the mining guild has within dwarven society? They ensure that the mines continue to run without trouble but even then, most miners cannot stand seeing eye to eye with the geomancers for their intolerance to shortcomings. My brother and the mining guild is what is keeping them from killing each other, the dwarf answered. I see. What is the general opinion of the mining guilds over these new measures happening over there? Dasat pressed. Knowing them, they personally disagree with this measure but they simply cannot just quit because that is their only means of income and that the moguls men are keeping them in line against their wills. The Astlerox isn't particularly a very open place to find many other new forms of opportunities. If you were born in one station you will stay in that station of life forever and your children too. That is why so many dwarves back then migrated out of the mountains into the human lands such as the Empire and the Eastern Suzerainities, Luya replied. I get the picture now Luya, Dasad smiled. Women and children plus deep mining equal a horrible outcome. Luya's hope leapt for joy as he cheerfully shook the intelligence agent's hand. Colonel, Major with your permission I would like to lead a black op into the Astlerooks to ensure that the Empire never recover themselves Silvaus Platt. If we play our cards right, we might even gain ourselves a brand new friend, Dasat said. Interesting. What kind of resources will you need for this operation? Holyfield asked. I will need to have my own Super Osprey to ship some items on demand such as a few C4s guns and maybe even an exosuit when I make contact with these mining guild leaders. Plus I'll need a team to be my hand in the region as we dismantle this operation from the down up. The sad request granted. Holyfield acknowledged. Anyone you have in mind? I can send out a team of my best seals to accompany you. The Major offered. No. We need a team with a unique set of skills, Dasat requested specifically, Asset, Meetner, but only after her surgery is done, Lieutenant Rose, Rose, Rose. Holyfield raised his voice, his eyes widened as he just remembered something related to one of their most valuable assets in Gleesia. Her surgery is today and she is going to get herself inside the Hecate suit. We cannot miss this, Holyfield. Polonsky and Dasat had nearly forgotten that today was the day Lieutenant Samantha Rose was to undergo surgery by the combined minds of Aparo engineers and Dr. Malona in implanting several arcane meridian implants across specific vital areas of her body so that she can effectively wear the newly forged Hecate suit made from gyronite, actocolite and scandonite weaved together with a titanium mesh to create the perfect conduit to vessel Samantha's magical powers. They, bringing Luya along for the trip, rushed across from the new Albany Governor's Palace to the secret laboratory underneath the starport where Lieutenant Rose is completing her metamorphosis into the ultimate mage. After hurriedly descending down the elevator, the inner circle members met up with a very sweating but heavily pleased with himself Dr. Malona. You're late, but if you are going to ask, the surgery was a resounding success and the lieutenant is at the embedding chamber getting inside the Hecate suit for the first time. Come I will show you, David said. Following their second greatest asset, the inner circle made its way past the other scientific experiments going about inside the laboratories in house foundries until they came upon a room where a large pod-like object lay before them. Polonsky smiled when his eyes caught Sergeant Crocker and the rest of Strider group including a very excited Iris asset, Sackage Weaker de Hagen and Aliathra asset, Agatha Letha humming on his ears. The colonel could also discern the machinery being put to work attaching the arcane meridian implants across Samantha's bodies and aligning them to their allotted sockets within the Hecate suit that which the lieutenant was deathly quiet despite the harrowing circumstances of being experimented on for the first attempt ever of the youth to have one of their own becoming a mage. But just as the scientists, Strider Group and the inner circle held their breath, the machine stopped as cooling steam emitted off of Samantha's embedding chamber. Surgery complete. Hecate suit successfully neuralinked with asset Lefay. Subject vitals, stable. Isaac informed everyone into the room. 
Lieutenant Samantha Rose emerged from the pod now wearing the amethyst-colored and skin-sight Hecate suit that formed around her womanly features. Upon her first step out of the pod, she collapsed on one knee to the ground, gaining her bearings as she tries to get used to walking again post her metamorphosis into the youth's greatest magical asset. Barely containing the accomplishment of his work, Dr. Malona spoke from the placidity of the onlookers of this next step in human evolution unfold before them. Ever since mankind had first looked up to the stars, we have wondered, what lies beyond, yet very few even today dared to look. Inward, Malona said. Samantha wobbles upwards now that she has gotten used to the way her suit now feels being worn around her, within her head. She was besieged by many new sensations as she could feel the very planet and the mana crystals throughout all of the world sing to her tune. You know what is also funny Doc, just how ironic it is when you say that Bobby Biongchen commented. How so? Melona asked, that the means to defeat the Empire isn't through our machines or weapons of war, but within by using their own power against them, Bobby said. Do you know Mr. Byongchun, try as you corpos might. There are still some things within the human body, mind, and soul that we still do not understand, possibly beyond what we could have imagined else, Malona said. When we first started Project Hecate, I had hoped that if we had succeeded in this Project Bobby, we might just see a glimpse of what we might become. Samantha meanwhile tries to channel her newly enhanced powers by sparking her hand to conjure a ball of unbinilium energies for the first time with the Hecate suit. Oh, what is it exactly? The corpo twitched his eyebrows egging for the scientist to tell him his answer. About last, a ball of brilliant and unfettered magical energies conjured upon Samantha's hands its radiance filling the room with light and its beaming song emboldening the more magically sensitive Aliathra to perk up her large leaf-shaped ears. Lieutenant Samantha Rose, now fully synchronized the Hecate suit V1 roared in triumph as her eyes and veins grow in bright blue light filled with pure unbinilium energies. Something extraordinary, Malona said. Chapter 43, Blood Ingots a gathering of some of the Federation's best personnel in Gleesia was formed by the briefing room of the new Albany spaceport meant for pirates pre-deployment. Ironically the only pilot inside the room being briefed was Captain Carplian, known as Pegasus 3-5 whose aeronautical proficiency with her Super Osprey will be needed. There is also Strider Group, a SEAL team called Scalpel Team. A smaller squad of Aparo payroll PMCs from the Silverback Securities, half a dozen of scientists, Dr. Malona, Luya Amirian and lastly the director of this operation, Bureau of Intelligence Agent Gary Desardet. This upcoming operation, launching the day after would, for some of the people the room, be the most politically sensitive mission of their lives. Luya Amirian knew that the moguls have gone too far with the enactment of conscripting the feeble families of miners and any able-bodied dwarf to work in the hot and dark conditions of the dwarves' infamous deep mines, for the mines lay host to a variety of hazards such as geomantic accidents, underground fiends and the accidental flooding of unearthing some long-forgotten buried curses hidden beneath the Asterix. He and several of his kind tried to put a stop to such destructive practices with limited success but now, it's either the collapse of dwarf and society, culture and livelihood as they know it or the beginning of a new era for the Asluracy I. For Agent Gary Desardt, his reasons are of a noble but intrinsically selfish reason, he is loyal to the youth state by default and he will see to it that the Federation fully encircle all of Gleesia with its many appendages attached to every facet of this fantasy world's being if it further pushes what the potential of Gleesia can bestow upon all of the rest of Earthling kind. This venture was risky as it could mean the loss of not only him but several of the youth's best assets and some political capital for the party if this clandestine operation of subverting this brewing unrest in the Dwarven mountains into the federations. And ultimately the party's ends too, failed. Yet the payoff if operation succeeds would give the federation in Gleesia a significant strategic advantage. For Strider Group, the mission was just following orders albeit with reservations from the more greened individuals like Samantha, Aliathra, 
Ken and Clay who were given their first black operations quite early in their careers. It was the most abnormal of circumstances for the younger ones as they focused their at agent the Sud and Luya Amirian as they speak. In order to flip the Astorok's blue, we need to target not only give this revolution of theirs more momentum and support but also eliminate key infrastructure and personnel, the Sud demonstrated. First business is to gain momentum for the revolt and a revolt is nothing without people getting angry. Mogul Dolmond, ruler of Kerfold has been forcefully recruiting and enslaving many terrorist dwarves to toil tirelessly at the mines. If we can intercept the slave caravans we can turn those people against him by rallying their support and denying them their labor. Ludera said. What kind of people works for Dolmond? asked Cain. The whole dwarves lords over my terrace living kin with the power of their geomancers, enchanted weapon vaults, and well-trained army of 20,000 warriors in each hold plus the aforementioned wealth they earn from the mines. Mirian gave his insight. Within the hold army. There are the elite Everbeards and the Sting Eyes. Everbeards are elite frontline soldiers who personally protect the hold moguls with their lives. They have reputations of fighting until the last man without retreat. The Sting Eyes in the other hand are venerable skirmishers whose crossbows are famous for piercing the toughest armor and shooting the furthest away in all of Sanigrad. For our revolution to have a chance we need to thin them out before we can assault Mogul Dolmond directly. Speaking about our opposition, another problem is the war beasts that the whole dwarves also happen to domesticate and breed such as Pegasi, Griffins, and War Rams. They are native to the local mountainous regions and the former two are often bred and sold in mass to the empire. As for these war rams, they are the cavalry of the dwavers, small but very stubborn and, well, rammy, Dasad added, what of the people were supposed to be helping? Who are they exactly? Crocker raised his hands. Shepherds, miners and members of the regular army as bondsmen who devote their time to serve as guards to fight off against wild monsters and beasts. Mirian said. Yeah this is a tall order. Crocus neared his teeth. The odds were not stacked in favor of this rebellion. What of the weapons vaults? You say they got weapons that are special how? Would they be enough? Diaz asked. I believe so. The weapons were made by the blacksmiths to be used for the moguls army. Specifically the Everbeards and Sting Eyes. Mirian caressed his chin on the thought. They are however locked with a special rune key that only three people can place atop three special locks to open. And even then, each rune has to be inserted to its slot simultaneously. Ha! Huh. Challenge accepted. Tell me who to rob and I get them open for you. Diaz kicked his feet up on a pile of boxes and breezily leaned back with confidence. Chris Lydie. The Sud smiled. The rebellion itself has to be given momentum to and the people, the terrorist dwarves will flock to our banner, Mirian Hart skipped a beat. We will have to stop the press ganging then halt the mining operations further in order to get my kin to rise up against their overlords. Well as soon as we touch down on Nankaram you can consider it done. You just coordinate your people in your end to do the actual work. Dasad swore. The mining guilds will do everything they can to see the Astorok's dawn a new future earthling. Just you wait. Mirian cheered. One final note before we go. This operation will see the field testing of asset, Le Fay, that is Lieutenant Samantha Rose's Hecate suit. I believe the good doctor already gave you a list of all the things he wants to see be done with your powers now being enhanced by the suit Nest Spa. Dasad turned his head to the left and asked Samantha, Yes, the Hecate suit. Samantha nodded upon the reminder. Dr. Malona had given her a to-do list attached to her smartphone of a series of tasks she has to test out whilst wearing her new suit. These actions ranged from performing a wider range of different spells under Iris and Aliathra's tutelage. Test out the suit's combat capabilities by engaging an Apfa within the mission area and trying to cast a variety of new kinds of magical spells if possible. Based on what she could understand underneath all the scientific malarkey by Dr. Malona, the suit allows her to controllably collect, store and discharge unvanillium energies thanks to some neurological links surgically attached onto her body that is tailored made for the Hecate suit called Arcane Meridian Implants attached across Sam's palms, legs, back and abdomen. 
A significant amount of the research involved to make this new technology possible was contributed by Iris and Eliath Res help when it comes to the application of the arcane meridian implants. Additional features included a built-in computer connected to Isaac that not only monitors all that mana energy stored and being dispersed out of the suit but allows Samantha to scan the mana energies of sources and vessels such as crystals and other mages. She can also tap into High Command's communication feeds and Isaac to relay vital intelligence such as maps, vocal instruction and etc. Isaac can also assist in battle or any other dangerous situations, especially against other mages, by suggesting the most advantageous course of action for the situation. The spell database however, are still in the works at the moment as it needed more expansion in which it is Strider and other SOG Recon team's job is to locate, secure and research such paraphernalia. May I ask LT, how can you not explode by the way, do you just fart out all that extra gas? Diaz crudely asked his question, there were a few childish laughs followed by a few beleaguered moans over the question. Oh, you again? Samantha faced I can explain this one lieutenant, David intervened, the way I did it for the suit, in layman's terms, is called simply the cool down protocol. The gyronite within the suit will dilute the excessive mana energy to be safely dispersed out of her body upon reaching a critical point with a static discharge of unbenilium energies, the chief scientist explained, anything more? Crocker asked further, oh yes, I do, David smiled. It's still experimental but based on what me and that little voice thing in my head says, I mean based on our understanding of alteration magics, the Hecate suit can to a degree adapt, self-transmute to any new metaphysical conditions I have when I cast spells, cast a fireball the suit switches polarities to better suit the fire. Or maybe you need to stop the fire from burning you? The suit would burst out some ice water to extinguish the flames as a countermeasure. The doctor answered, explain doctor. One of the seals asked, it is supposed to make shooting out multiple spells and resisting certain spell of differing magics kind safer and easier to do. According to my research, most mages powers end the schools of magics they can learn depends on their personality. For example, mages with a penchant for destruction are passionate and love to take direct control whilst illusionists are cunning people who would love to manipulate people. I also found out that when they do a spell from a form of magic they are not proficient in, they exhaust their mana reserves more and may even hurt their bodies if not careful. That's why most mages stick to one or two categories of magics. 3 In the case for elves, David pointed to Aliathra who sat quietly observing with her legs crossed poshly. You are on par with the archmages of Parviala, Sam. Samantha, my further is one of them. Do not take this comparison lightly. Aliathra commented. She stopped herself to speak that social distance between an elf and a human now that she is considered an Ebrit, a friend. Essentially adaptation through mimicry. Smart Desart smiled. Of course, but again, experimental. The feature is a drain in the suit's power so I equip the suit to manually turn the feature on or off depending on the situation. There's also a bunch of other stuff here I am only authorized to explain to Lieutenant Rose and the other scientists about the Hecate suit. David cautioned. Anyways most of Samantha's suits are still experimental but it is the hope that Samantha can when she is deployed to the Astelrox can perform some field tests so that me and the rest of the science division back here would monitor the results then improve upon the Hecate suit with numerous updates and improvements. Dr. Malona nodded. More improvements. I like that a lot. Samantha smiled. Remember. We have to pull a lot of favors and deposits from the party just so you can get this suit. Do not disappoint them. They are plans for additional projects with the Gleesian minerals if the Hecate suit shows the signs of promising success. Desat reminded. I am sending you a list of stuff you will need to do to test out every limit the Hecate suit you need to perform. The data will be sent off back to us and then I will tell you what kind of goodies the engineers can do. Be also on the lookout for any additional research materials while you are there in the Astrix, such as magic scrolls, ruins or any more unbenilium crystals you name it. David further added, 
If that is all well in done then meeting dismissed, we all meet up at Captain Carplian's Super Osprey in as soon as dawn breaks tomorrow. Agent Dusaj concluded the meeting. Every one of the people involved in the operation stood up and left, except for one Abidai Root who remained quietly sitting at his chair holding his sniper rifle named after his late wife whilst grasping its hybrid wooden metal frame firmly with a vengeful intent that quaked the hunting rifle obsessively. The elf, concerningly tapped Samantha as she guided her to the squad's now darkened and brooding sharpshooter whose warm bearded smile faded into a shadowy grimace of obsessive inhalation, turning around just as she was about to leave. Samantha tactfully walked back inside the briefing room so she can sit down by Abidia's side. Abed, if you're not up to it I can tell Polonsky right now, Samantha attempted to offer Abidia a way out, sensing that he may not be right in the head. No, N no. I am okay. I am just focused. In thought. Yeah, Abidia answered. Look Abed, we know what happened to Leah and April and we are here for you. If you want you can sit this out and spend some time with your daughter at the hospital if you want. Samantha proposed. Th there is no need Lieutenant, I am fine. I already went to the hospital. Abidia said, I was there too but you barely spent any time with April. You went straight to the cemetery. Aliathro said. Cemetery? You mean the morgue Ailey? Abidia corrected. What were you doing there? Samantha asked. I saw. And. I participated in their. Dissection of that bitch who killed Leah. Abidia said. You dissected that bitch Lindus? W-H-Y? Samantha recoiled on the hearing of his testimony. For release, I wanted to see it all with her dead eyes looking at all what is being taken away from her that she holds dear. Abidia swore as his hands reverberated angrily upon reminiscing the incision he made to remove the elven spy's body organs out. He raised his hand and curled his fingers closed in a crushing motion to the unnerving of the lieutenant. The doctors showed to me what was left of my old classmate before B. Dyer could get his hands on them. He was angry as I am, I admit, like a rabid wolf, Aliathra said. We must end this pointless war before all truly becomes lost by any means necessary. The elf reminded. When we get to Herring Point LT I will tear every brick of that disgusting city to the ground and make them see what it all feels like to lose something they love. Justice I tell you, for great justice I will. Abed lashed his teeth to a grind. Samantha could sense now that the two kindest souls in her squad have started to become hardened as time passes on their service to the Afif. No longer were Abidia and Dalia through the naive and green recruits of before. Looking into their eyes, each of them bore down two distinct but ultimately aligned focuses that mirror of what had happened to them. Abidia's personal stake now in this war will be seen through no matter what. He will follow Samantha to the ends of the world just to see his vengeance for his wife and child be fulfilled. Aliathra's duty of self-sacrifice even in the face of such monumental odds that she is virtually alone against while noble. The reality of what depths of barbarity her people would do to fight the demons only made them no better than the ones they are fighting, in which the elf princess has started to amalgamate into a creature of indefatigable efficiency akin to the unscrupulousness of corpo warriors such as Diaz. But what about your daughter, April? Samantha asked. Don't you should spend just one more time for her before you leave? She needs you just as much as you need to give justice to those who have died. Samantha relayed her concern to Abed. Aye aye, you're right. Abidia leaned down and covered his face. What can I do? What could I do? What what? He asked. What has happened to April after we dropped her at the hospital? Samantha asked. Catching up with her school while inside. She is sad she can't freely run around like she always does, or meet up with her friends. What's left of them? I would say, Abidia said, you think she needs some cheering up? Samantha asked. Yes indeed, we can do something to lighten her spirits just before we leave for the Dwarven Mountains. Aliathra agreed. But, April, she, it's just, too painful to see her, like that. Abidia hesitated. April is your daughter Abidia, your child. Should you not attend to her just for one more fleeting moment? The elf argued. I it's not that. She. It. It's about Leah. I. 
Just seeing her reminds me of what I saw what had happened to Leah. Abed explained. It hit the lieutenant and the sharpshooter's reluctance to see his daughter again. April shared, based on the visages of the root parents that she shares more similarities with her mother's hair smile and eyes. Like a mirror to Abediah's late wife it was hard for him to see April again as it reminded him of the recent tragedy that befell on them. He was broken, vengeful and widowed before her upon piecing the final puzzle piece of his uncharacteristic disconnectedness. Abed, you know as your commanding officer I am always with you. Samantha placed her hand over his shoulder tenderly. Leah would have wanted you to take care of your little girl in her stead. She doesn't want to see her husband not be there for her, especially if you are doing this job now to keep food on the table. She appealed to his familial interests. I, I was never the best parent. All my life I was out of the house brining home food or hunting off savage beasts. Even then my daughter called me a hero for fighting all of those monsters in the dark. Abidia confessed. I. I need to be here for her please lieutenant. I need to get ready for the mission. Leah must not go unavenged. Just if you want to. Please visit her for me, he requested. Abed began to start disassembling his sniper rifle onto the ground floor of the briefing room to perform routine cleaning as was his locked obsession with avenging his wife. If it means you can come with us tomorrow with a sound mind then fine. I will visit her. Samantha nodded. I love darling, little ones. April always loved to see me every time. Aliathra lightly smiled as she agreed to accompany Samantha. Thank you. You have my rifle. Abidia smiled lightly as he continued to clean his weapons as the two girls left. As the girls left, they passed by Iris who had just finished a rather intimate moment with Cain. Samantha where are you going? The vampire witch asked. Abed asked me and Ailey to check on April tonight. You want to come? Samantha answered. Well April does remind me a little bit of me to be honest. Iris said. Pardon? Aliathra asked. She lost her mother just as I lost my father to people who think we are all monsters here. Iris explained. Unlike her, I had to face it alone. But now, she deserves some help even for just this night. Welcome aboard then. Samantha smiled. Aliathra has to admit. The more time she spends with Iris, the less of her monstrous side was set aside to be replaced with a much kinder soul. All she had done within and despite her presence was being helpful and amiable to everyone she meets. Were her prejudices making the elf blind to what is truly behind the myths of bloodthirsting such airfill? In a way, she was the ideal friend that Ailey always wanted to have when she was still in the academy in Pavia. Perhaps the Skadahagan wasn't as maliciously intended in her alliance with these other worlders at all. But then again, wasn't her reasons to redeem herself in front of her people somewhat or more selfish than Iris' desire to find a place she could truly belong to? Leaving the spaceport, the three young women journeyed to the New Albany Military Hospital where they passed by the many victims of the New Albany bombings and Grey Order raid. It had not prepared Samantha for the voluminous sight of injured men and women, Glesian and Earthling laying side by side as their wounds were slowly yet painfully being alleviated by the youth's best healthcare. In terms of manpower they were stretched thin by the sudden influx of impatience that they have to tend to. It was a significant relief that Samantha Iris and Aliathra came today and agreed to help volunteer for a few hours at the children's wards just to bypass the visiting hours rules being exempted for volunteers. A good number of the kids appreciated Aliathra's motherly presence within the ward as she sang a few songs and used her illusion magics to make dancing animals play around the room to their delight. Iris and Sam meanwhile assisted the nurses distribute super and the medicines for the children and assisted those that have a hard time taking the foul-tasting consumptive pills. However, not all of the children warmly greeted the two young women. Some remained locked by their heads non-responsive to the happening of the outside world. One such young child sat atop of her bed curled into a ball not daring exposing herself to the happenings around her. It was April Root, her state of far cry to the curiosity-driven type that April was known for before checking into the hospital. Hello little one, it's me your princess. Aliathra sat by the side edges of April's bed as he approached his daughter for the first time after her hospitalization. 
The little girl remained non-responsive to her father's words as she continued to silently lay still on her bed, not showing her eyes despite the elf's prompts to pique her attention. Aliathra noticed, to her amusement of how very record-heavy the Earthling's healthcare system was. Dozens upon dozens of bureaucratic work and sophisticated understanding of disease and efficiency impressed the healing cleric greatly. Each bed had a written piece of paper nailed to it with a sheet of plastic where it contains the patient's name and the type of malady slash eyes that got them into the hospital in the first place. Yet what was curious about April's case was not from her limited understanding of the earthling alphabet called Latin but that she wasn't as strikingly injured as compared to one child who had suffered severe third-degree burns, or a child who lost her leg. Instead, April suffered two disease, a fractured arm likely from Linda's rough handling of her and the second one however was the most alien sounding of ailments called PTSD. Samantha, if I may what does this word mean? Aliathra asked the lieutenant. Pointing to the medical chart with the words PTSD attached to April's bed, Sam looked onto the chart in horror which left the elf flabbergasted with grave concern. Is April going to recover? Iris asked. Not truly. Samantha sighed. What do you mean? Aliathra asked. Think about what had happened earlier? Her kidnapping? The attack? She's barely half a decade old and she is experiencing all kinds of stuff that no child should experience. Sam explained briefly. You think maybe I can heal her faster with some of my restoration magics? Aliathra proposed. I am afraid this time, April's wound cannot be healed with magic self. Samantha sadly replied. A wound that cannot be healed? That is impossible. The elf protested. Just as they discussed down to aspects of PTSD, Anne Nurse, being overwhelmed by the pestering children asking for her attention dropped her tray of foodstuffs meant for the children to the ground causing a loud pulsating crash that echoed the hallway of the children's ward. Instantly, April recoiled with a jump from her spine upon the hearing of the crash. April's body balked reflexively upon her little ears hearing the loud crash before proceeding to reduce herself into a torrent of sobs just as followed by several other of those bedlocked children reel into tears too. It was a storm of sorrows that the children's ward nurses scrambled to allay. Aliathra attempted to help by conjuring her restoration magics from her hands and proceeded to attempt to pinpoint the root cause of this malady that was inflicted upon these innocent children. But as her hands graced upon each child, to Aliathra's disorientation, her healing senses could not detect any form of disrepair within the children's bodies outside of their wounds being properly healed and attended by the earlier treatments from the ward nurses. They were by a cleric's perspective, fully healthy, yet they still continued to cry in an orchestra of torment leaving the elf unsure what she could do more for them all. I I I, Aliathra stuttered. Little ones, stop your tears. Neneths. Grace? I. The elf's composure crumbled as her large ears echoed the anguishes of dozens of children across the room. All of them lost something different but all equally valuable during the attacks. A home, a family member or even a part of their bodies. Such pains were minuscule now to what she had felt before. Such a pain, wound, malady or whatever this PTSD was could not be cured by even the best of restoration magics she could muster or even attempt to study to be able to cast. She was helpless yet powerful at the same time. Ailey, this is not a normal wound. Samantha squawked at the elf. Then what can I do? There is too much agony here? Aliathra asked. As they spoke, a familiar cry rung around Aliathra's leaf-shaped ears. Turning around she saw April Root crying ever the more passionately as he hands and legs flailed in torture to this strange disease. Little one, Aliathra's motherly instincts kicked in as she dashed back to April's bed and tenderly embraced her. Wet tears stained Aliathra's green dress as her arms cradled the child. The lieutenant approaches by the edges of her bed and added herself to April's hug. We are here for you April. Iris joined in. I know you are sad after all what happened. Aliathra poured her heart out. You are a sweet little bird that should be frolicking amongst the grass not sitting around here. If your wings are broken, 
you can borrow mine, for we will be stand by you even if we are far away. Samantha cooed. With all I am, Samantha acknowledged. And all that we are. For the first time after the tragedy, to the uplifted spirits of Samantha, Iris, and Aliathra, April Root beamed a soft smile upon their comforting words. There was no need of any additional words as the three girls proceeded to assuage all the other children in ward with their easing warmth, for the greatest cure that is discovered by the healing cleric Aliathra had just discovered, was the gift of a hand to hold them through the darkness. Dash. The Astorux has many sights and opportunities for verticality. Its steep slows were excellent observation nests for Samantha's team to observe all the alpine terrain that the Dwarven realms had to offer. If this were a simple playful tour, she would have basked upon the mountain's fresh air. Unfortunately, this was for business and not for pleasure as lives and the fate of an entire people is in the balance. Strider Group and the other accompanying teams went to work dismantling disrupting and destroying all the whole dwarf strategic production throughout the region. Kerfold has mining guild was very generous disclosing the important information that the earthlings need to flip the tables against the empire and their dwarven allies who sat decadently atop of their fortified holds across the mountain range. To say there was a divide as described by Luya Amirian would have revealed the limitations of spoken tongue when the earthling looked on first hand the disparity between hold and terrace dwarves that is, to put frankly, literally divided by the hold's walls. Whilst the city livers consume the very decadent, consumerist and manufacturing industry, the terrace dwarves toil the mountain slopes to produce grains livestock and other products that is sold to maintain their livelihoods. In terms of politics, the Dwarven Mountain clans are not united entity due to the mountains nearly obstructing roads and pathways in between the livable space in the Aslrix. Instead the Dwarves are divided into five clans listed as Kerfaldur, Tyler, Darbadi, Merlirum, and Nankarim. Each hold has a localized set of laws and a leader called a mogul that runs the respective land by maintaining the legal courts and armed soldiers in exchange for taxes which can come in a variety of means of trade such as food, a rather complicated form of indentured servitude and the most lucrative, minerals. Theoretically, as Luya Amirian explained, all the Dwarven clan holds are of equal political strength in the grand scheme of things within the Astorux but due to how the mineral-centric economy of Dwarven society works, Kerfaldha, said to boats the greatest mine in all of Gleesia was atop of the socio-political food chain able to influence and dictate the rules within and out of the mountains. Some holds unfortunately aren't as blessed as the Kerfold her hold and thus in practice, Mogul Dolmond is the de facto king of the dwarves as treated by many foreign diplomats whom he had entertained by owning an oligarchic hold on the riches underneath the Aslrix. His power is such to an extent that he can even influence how other holds would set their own laws and economic structure to suit his interests. He even has plans to unite the clans into one huge kingdom with Kerfold her as its epicenter. To do that however, he will need to gain legitimacy for his right to rule all of the mountains and the slay each an empire are perhaps his staunchest ally into seeing his ambitions come true and he is not afraid to perform underhanded tactics to achieve it. He has been going above and beyond to curry favor with the Imperial House for the past century performing very great many business deals at the cost of many upsetting the interests of the terrace dwarves who seek better living conditions and social upliftment to match the lofty lives of the hold living dwarves. It was in Dolmond and the Empire's mutual interest that they get the riches of the Astorux for cheap in exchange for imports and political favors from the Empire such as how the Empire so amiably assisted in subjugating his incessant terrorist dwarves from making up lost time after a lucrative mineral trade had unexpectedly gone awry. Ever since he had decreed the Locantira or as what the Federation calls it forced labor law. The terrace dwarves scattered around the Astorux were put into a tyrannical state of fear as dwarven soldiers ran across the mountains to scrape down to the bottom the manpower needed to harvest the precious minerals that the Empire needs for their war against the second demon invasion. 
But all the propaganda by the shouts of fear hawking heralds could not shake off the fact that the dwarven mines that became the source of all the Astrox's glory, for it was also equally treacherous to enter with cases of cavens, monster attacks and worker negligence being a case by case normal that the mining guilds have to contend with. Those who resisted were made an example of via pain of death as none were spared in order to persuade those reluctant to toil for their country. This ranges from roadside displays of crucifixions, public beatings. None were spared as all ages, genders and beard colors were deemed equal in the eyes of dwarven law. This didn't help due to the decree extended to the families of the miners to be breast ganged to work in the mines, regardless of sex, health age and sometimes even race just to meet the required manpower needed to re-harvest all that minerals that the dwarves had lost in their trading deal with the empire. The disgust from Aliathra, upon one such sight of the brutalized family with children nearly stoked her into a vengeful frenzy if it were not the rational leashes of the rest of Strider group to focus on the mission so that they could all vent this and all the more of the many sad tragedies that littered the blood-stained Astrooks. I got my sights on the caravan Clay relayed from his drone feed. It was just before sunrise as the twilight passes of the Dwarven Mountains gave way to the morning sun. It was the ideal time for many logistics-related caravans to move forward on their journeys without the worry of traffic and the inconvenience of darkness hindering their way, especially for such valuable materials that is in high demand. Atokalite, Garanite, and Scandonite. Okay. Hit it. Samantha gave the signal. One of the freedom fighters that allied himself from one of Mirian's clansmen from Nankaram activated a trap that let loose a trap that stream of fire that caused the yoke toxin of the slave caravan carrying with them newly captured warm bodies to be delivered into the dwarven mines for their labor. Collaborating with the Nankaram mining guilds and a few local sympathizers in the form of shepherds and herdsmen, the Federation's forces made quick work of the caravan guards before promptly releasing the slaves from their caged carriages. To Strider Group's surprise, half of the prisoners weren't dwarves from the local villages surrounding Kerfold her at all but instead there were what she can describe to be beast folk known as Dosn and Goblins in the mix too. We are saved. One of the dwarven prisoners shouted in glee as Samantha broke of every chain on their bodies. Who are you people? You have their faces but you fight them. One of the centaur slaves, one whose human self of the body was of a physically fit yet conventional enchanting female asked the strangers. A friend Samantha bluntly said as she led out the prisoners from the carriage. One of their friendly dwarven allies began to unlock each of the cages atop of the caravans with his pickaxe to free those inside. But as his eyes locked onto the goblins and centaur prisoners, he tapped the lieutenant's attention reaching up to her hip by his squat little height about the abnormality of their appearance in the Astrooks. Those folks are not from around here, he said. Normally, the Vlok and Tira decree only applied to dwarves yet the way how vaguely worded the law is stating able-bodied one rather than dwarf was a loophole to allow non-dwarves to work without the expense of another dwarven life. Who are you? Samantha asked. You have never heard of what a Dustin is before? Typical of you imperial folks. Our people, the Oshadini Udi or Centaurs as you call us, are a strong and proud people who have been fighting against the U, the Stlaegeans for centuries. Me and many of my kin fled after one bearing the brand of the Bane, a chosen one, forced us to flee to the mountains where many of them captured my kin and forced them to work in the mines. One of the centaurs of Amazonian physique said as she stood there on all fours with her bare chest exposed to confess her story to her rescuers as tears trickled her eyes. Spirits be, that also happened to Hodden's people too. A goblin raised his hand after he was set free by Crocker on a pair of meticulously crafted cuffs made of gyronite reserved for imprisoning mages. By the tattoos that marked around the little humanoid's body, Iris whispered that the goblin must be a shaman. 
Can you tell me who is this chosen one? Asked Samantha as this piqued her interests and so would the Dr. Malona and his scientists. Aren't you an Imperial? Many of the Empire speak of this crystal heart choosing three chosen ones to fight against the coming demonic invasion. One of them who bears the mark of the bane is the evil one who killed tribe chieftain and massacred half of Hodden's village because we touch a little boy that we save from drowning on nearby river. The goblin brokenly that Samantha's translator could only define as broken grammar. That vile human also killed scores of my people including my little sister even after we said that we are no choice but to steal food from the Imperials as they refused to even look at us in the eyes. Their three chosen ones are no better than murderers and slavers, the female centaur tearfully stated. Actually, Samantha coughed. Not all of them are murderers and slavers. The other two are fighting for the right cause, the lieutenant asserted. Why do you say that? The goblin shaman inquires. Because I am too a chosen one. Sam unveils her mark by removing the glove of her right hand to present it to the prisoners whose eyes locked on with awe at the holy markings that authenticated Samantha's status. The mark of the shareholder. That is one of the other two chosen one brands that Brat and his folks were talking about. I think they are looking for you. Quite frantically, I say, the goblin shaman referred. But if you are one of the chosen ones, why do you fight to free us? What you are doing is against your emperor's will. One of the dwarves asked, his confusion being emitted across all the other freed prisoners. We are not slave agents. Never have been never will be. Crocker said. Then are you from the southern tribes? If your humans are not from the empire you are from the southern tribes. You are all too pale skinned to be from the suzerainities. The dwarf prisoner asked. Again no. Not from there either. Samantha answered. Then where are you from? The dwarf asked. How do I explain this? We come from the sky. Samantha bluntly answered. From where exactly? The skies are vast as many can see, the goblin shaman pressed Tyrion, the lieutenant replied Tyrion, but that is where the demon invasion came from, the dwarf twitched his nerves, you got that all wrong, the empire thinks we are the demons, Samantha said, those empire people attacked Tyrion and us because they think we are trying to corrupt the world, the lieutenant cursed, you don't look or act like the demons of yore. The centaur war maiden said. I do not see you as demons at all. The shaman informed the group. How can the empire say that you are demons? You do not have their scent nor do I hear the spirits cry from your presence. The shaman questions. That I have no idea. Samantha shrugged as she corralled the freed prisoners together as the rest of the dwarven resistance cell final checked for any more chains that will impede their journey back to Nankarim. Pa. More arrogance from the empire once again. The shaman cursed. What power did the crystal heart gave you chosen one if Hodden may ask? The mark of the shareholder? The goblin questioned. I was given the power to cast magic even if I am not of this world. Samantha said. That is odd but the way the word shareholder is so loosely defined by words could mean something dot more. Much more. Human makes Hodden curious about human. The goblin shaman curled his chin. Thank you for rescuing me. No human has ever showed kindness to our kind. By the honor of the Kvad I am forever in your debt. You have my body, heart and spear. If I had won, the centaur kneeled down and opened her hands in a servile gesture of reverence to her rescuers. Who might you two be then? Samantha asked. Hodden is the name mother bestow upon Hodden. Hodden is, was, apprentice shaman to Caldern. The goblin shaman introduced himself. I am Quimra of the Blue Grasses. I am a Yoshe Daini Udi war maiden. The centaur bowed. You must hurry now. Follow my dwarven friends for they will take you to safety where you will be safe. Samantha instructed. But I must find my tribe. They were captured too and I am separated from them. Kimra pleaded. Mine too. Hodden added. You can find them later when you get to safety. It's not safe here right now. And can we move now? Crocker ordered one of their dwarven allies to move out of the scene. A rudimentary system akin to an underground railway for escaped slaves was organized by the mining guilds to guide chain ganged workers to Nankarum through a network of sympathizers and trusted peoples. 
It was established through several underworld ties to several smuggling businesses to accommodate fleeing terrorist dwarves from forced recruitment from Mogul Dolmond which have been further accelerated and better organized with the usage of youth expertise led by agent Gary Desut who was no stranger to smuggling tactics used by human traffickers whom he had experience combating against. So far for the bluffer that is the youth and terrorist dwarves, they are performing guerrilla raids against the Mogul's men and his slave agent allies taking down slave caravans and minor operations in support of their endeavors. The guerrilla strategy as directed by Dasat is to put the Apfra on edge so they can start making mistakes such as spreading out their forces thinly leaving the more valuable areas such as larger mines and fortresses less defended as usual so that a strike upon them would be far less of risk without sacrificing the reward. The other objective was to instigate more unrest by organizing newly freed slaves and other sympathizers to the cause in order to flip the Estlrooks blue so that the grand strategic layer of cutting off the Stla agents from their mineral supply would be achieved. However, there was the double-sided blade effect of the more attacks they make the harsher the forced labor will be pushed to the limits. This could either create more popular support for the pro-youth dwarves or perhaps turn it against them as they could pinpoint the reasons why their lives were increasingly unbearable was through their actions with the right words inputted to their ears as de such reasoned. The revolution must overthrow the current regime whilst the wind is at their backs, but right now, for Strider Group, they are in enemy territory and they must collect more intelligence about the operations of the whole dwarves in the area and how they may use it to their advantage in addition to buying some extra supplies for the resistance. Nankarim upon their exfiltration was seeing a surge of activity as other resistance groups had also safely or somewhat safely returned from their various missions on weakening Mogul Dolman's assets across the Isleriks. The Apara Mercs had just returned showing proof of bounty to Luthia Amirian on their mission to assassinate several prominent geomancers whilst the SEAL team from Major Holyfield's contribution delivered much needed weapons and supplies for the growing resistance fighters. To Hodden and Quimera's astonishment, these humans, although look, like they are of the same shape of the Empire, were not acting like the Empire. These foreign warriors with their hulking shell armor and their black staves lend their hands sweat, and blood to those weaker than them equally regardless of color, race, and foot shape, they were the slay agents they would have spat around, looked in the eye with fear before ultimately being booted off of their lands before any word could be said. In addition to this buoyant scene, Kinra and Hodden were able to reunite with several of their separated kin exchanging heartful greetings that they didn't know that the day would come they would do they told the stories of how these men in green appeared like knights in shining armor to rescue them from their oppressors and how they aided them back up to their feet and escorted them all to safety. With the good character of these strange foreigners assured, the goblin shaman and the centaur war maiden turned to stride a group and agent the sergeant. What you have shown to my people is that you are of noble heart that is rare in this cruel cruel world. The centaur bowed, for saving my life I wish to aid you in avenging this unforgivable transgression against my people. She vowed, and to you, you have Hodden's magics are yours for it is by Hodden's tribe's honor to avenge my fallen master. The goblin shaman also joined in. Making new friends aren't we lieutenant? Dasat smiled to Samantha. Yeah, pretty much. She nodded. Welp. The more help the merrier we question mark tilde okay so you two come with me. I could use your help in some things. The intelligence agent grinned as he told the two newcomers. After exchanging pleasantries, Agent Dasat discerned that these two newcomers additionally come with two new unique capabilities that he can exploit. Hodden the Goblin Shaman has the expertise, outside of his obvious affinity to shamanistic powers of the primal forces of nature. He also has the ability of divination where he can let go of his mortal shell to soar above the clouds like a great bird. By that translation, Desat correctly guessed that underneath all of that mystical talk he speaks so avidly about is that his divination was essentially the ability to scout out hard to reach areas that not even drones could penetrate as advanced as they were. As for the Quimra the Centaur War Maiden, 
She was proficient with a bow and a spear and her ability to maneuver herself with her superior stamina and footwork allow her to cover more extensive distances due to the limited use of vehicles for his operation. Additionally, the centaur humbly chronicled her unique Yoshhandaini Udi characteristic being of having a strong back that can carry much heavy equipment and gear without impeding the war maiden the slightest. She did, however, insist on searching and rescuing the rest of her enslaved kin whom she boasted are just as strong as her. This promising development pleased as such as more of these centaurs would have a multiplicative effect on the bluffer side of the Asluriks. Get some Ella Casgroot and come back to me I have some more work for you today. Dash. A few hours later after escorting the prisoners to relative safety near Nankrum's territories, Strider Group was ordered by Agent de Sud to deploy to a nearby fortified dwarven hamlet of Gwaze that by an important watering hole run by a mostly whole dwarven populace. The mission objective, intelligence gathering, upon their arrival. Samantha discreetly photographed the dwarven town for this was her first time arriving at such a settlement. In terms of architecture, the dwarven settlements were of the design similar to 1930s Art Deco with its geometric symmetry cladding the homes in lustrous colors with angular and streamlined patterns made of decorative lacquer and metals. The only difference was that the Art Deco has to be scaled down to the size appropriate for those humanoids of five feet or less. Samantha. Iris, Diaz and Abidia were the only people who could comfortably enter dwarven buildings whilst Cain, Clay, Crocker, and Aliathra have to refrain for now due to the excessive heights that would have otherwise made them awkwardly bend forward to accommodate themselves inside. It was perhaps why humans and other races sparingly venture to the dwarven mountains for all of the facilities of civilization taken for granted were physically downsized to fit the scale of the local dwarves. Before entering the town, Strider Group dressed in their medieval disguises of a heavy cloak used by local mountaineers and shepherds to keep warm. Splitting up to cover as much ground quickly, Samantha ventured to the local tavern whilst Clay scanned the outer perimeter for anything on the bulletin board posted by the front door. Meanwhile, Diaz and Crocker cover the local blacksmith whilst Cain, Abidia, Iris, and Aliathra browse market goods by the square whilst eavesdropping on the local herald's reports of any significant development. Welcome to the wet tankard tavern. I am generous but you can call me Lady Tankard. You must be a traveller may I guess. Guest? A bubbly dwarf and female greeted the lieutenant upon entrance. Greetings generous. I mean, Lady Tankard may I have a table by the bar side? Samantha asked. Follow me. Tilda the dwarf lady guided Samantha past the fairly small crowd of patrons, mostly dwarves eating, drinking, or gambling away themselves to pay notice to the human stranger. Getting a bar side seat, Samantha sat down at a stool as generous turned over the counter to arrive at the bartender's side of the table. What may I get for you? The dwarf asked. I am just sightseeing. Samantha answered. Sightseeing? What is that? The dwarf questioned, not understanding the concept from the lieutenant who was trying to maintain her cover. I mean, I am just a scout for the Imperials. I am returning to my camp to report my findings. Samantha said. Ah, so that's what they are calling it now at the Empire? Sightseeing for scouting? Pretty fun play on words if I do say so myself. But you didn't answer my question dearie. What can I get for your question mark Tilda? She leaned over. Her cleavage exposed down by the undercut of her blouse to Samantha pressing for an answer. I'm pretty bored. Of my job lately. She faked a sigh. I just want someone to talk to. She said. Ah, I see. It's been a while since a stranger came into these parts. The last folks were a band of adventurers from the Grey Order coming in for some free drinks after a quest. I know just what might get ye in the mood. Generous winked as she shifted her child-sized body to prepare a mug of dwarf nail. You know dearie, that's a pretty strange tattoo you got on your hand there. Generous pointed to Samantha's brand on her right hand, reflexively. The lieutenant retreated her hand away from sight, covering her right hand with her left. 
She cursed herself as she forgot to reattach her glove back to her right hand from the slave raid earlier that day. I it's just an embarrassing tattoo I got when I was drunk. You know have you ever done something stupid when you were drunk miss? I mean Lady Tankard. Samantha shielded her identity to the dwarf. Oh, I understand. One time, I had to entertain for this one dwarf's birthday party and I got so drunk that I outshined the entertainment. He was very handsome though. Generous blushed while caressing her heart throbbing chest. With the conversation saved, Samantha sighed in relief before continuing on with her mission. So, what's the news lately? The lieutenant asked. Well, outside of a whole army of Grey Order adventurers coming in to help keep the peace for Mogul Dolmond and a few bandit attacks. The biggest news so far is the chosen one being in Kerfold her exchanging handshakes with the noble folks there. Generous said. You know, my uncle is one of the adventurers too. A monster hunter of great fame I tell ye. Goes around the world killing all sorts of beasts. Almost everyone knows his name. She proudly tells her, by the fire, I almost forgot he is also part of the Chosen One's personal retinue too. The dwarf added, oh, did he tell you anything more about the Chosen One? I, I only just follow orders. Samantha feigned familiarity by keeping questions in a facade of curiosity. Faith Len, that s his name if I remember. He is a handsome lad who is said to be an excellent mage who the crystal heart blessed with lots of power Oh, that's how my uncle described it to me, Generous said. Where is he now if I presume? Samantha asked. Well he is at Kerfoldha where he is talking with the mogul Dolmond and his court about some stuff. I ain't into to the talks on politics sweetie but I love to get my hands or ears at the results, the dwarf replied about the chosen one. So who else is in his party outside of your uncle? Samantha interrogated. Most of them are from the Adventurers Guild. If I can remember their names. There is Petra Richtdorf, the Bladesinger, Carlyle Silverdane the College Mage, Marchog Fawn the Ageless Knight and my uncle, who in my humble opinion is the greatest of the Chosen One's followers. Generous was about to talk about her famous uncle when the front door of her tavern crashed open. I am home again, shouted a bearded dwarf on a red mohawk. He was followed by a company of one young looking human knight, an equally young but matured looking human mage, a fresher faced girl carrying with her several scholarly implements and one hooded figure of an indiscernible race yet feminine build, Uncle Findrum. Generous squealed as she leapt out of her counter to greet her monster slaying uncle. I. Welcome home to Janu. One of the dwarven patrons of the tavern raised his mug at the new arrival. It's good to be back and see you again my niece. Findrim smiled at Generous. You have to tell me all of your stories. Generous requested. You. Lady Tankard. Service. Samantha raised her hand. It was rather unprofessional for her to be interrupted by the new arrivals when she was about to sate her thirst. My apologies. Uncle grab some seats. The dwarf lady instructed. The dwarf monster slayer and his companions decided that they too will have a barside seat for this visit so they took the stools adjacent to Samantha's right side filling the sitting room to the rightmost edges of the tabletop counter. The usual like always, the dwarf ordered. Coming right up, Generous winked to her uncle as she went to work pouring mugs of ale tapped from the kegs behind the counter. Carrying stoutly a payload of a grand total of six heaving mugs of dwarven ale she passed the drinks along to Samantha, Findrum, and the rest of the countertop visitors. Drink up. Generous cheerfully smiled in unison. And in order to maintain her infiltration, Samantha coordinated her gulp down of her ale alongside Findrum and his companions. But as the alcoholic beverage entered Samantha's throat, Samantha's tasting senses alerted her mind as the ale she drank was surprisingly strong, its overpowering flavor and alcoholic content causing her gag reflexes to kick in. The lieutenant spat the ale out of her gullet, throwing up the reconstituted liquid under the countertop, her suit into the tavern's floor. Oh my! Generous jilted, her hands cupping her rosy cheeks in surprise. Ha! Huh? Milk drinker. Findrim made fun of Samantha as Generous kindly grabbed a rag and immediately mopped the violently expelled ale from the ground. Your first time drinking dwarven ale, dearie? 
Generous asked. Yeah, Samantha coughed. So, uncle, tell me now about your adventures. What did you see? Generous asked Findrum. Nothing much outside of an escort job but it requested the Imperial Seal so I couldn't pass it up, Findrum said. Oh uncle, you don't have to push yourself so hard for me. I already have the wet tankard now after you helped me build it. Generous smiled. It is not just about you and your dreams Generous. It is about our future. Do you know why there are chosen ones again? Because we are in danger. Roma says the demons have returned for revenge. Findrum said. Oh, my how frightening. Generous recoiled. But what does this mean for you uncle? I have to fight for you and for the Mogul again. We need to prepare for war if we have any hope of surviving the dark times ahead. Have you heard of the new decree by the Mogul? Findrum asked his niece. I noticed that the streets are quieter as of late because the miners are working double time to make some end right now. Some of them were in such a rush, Generous said. Exactly. We need to arm ourselves with the best weapons and armor for this fight against the demon. The young knight stomped the table with the hoof of his hand, and find the other two chosen ones too. Petra do not forget that. The female human mage in the white cloak said. What were they called again Carla? The knight identified as Petra asked the mage. Oh, I remember. Ranupata, their shareholder and Astigal, the scholar. The pedantic one raised her voice. Thank you Olera. Petra smiled. Samantha's hearts beat rapidly as sweat poured down from her forehead as these strangers, likely Grey Order adventurers at that were looking for her and Dr. Malona. Fingers twitched, as her left hand instinctively glided to her hidden pistol holstered by her hips as she discreetly scooted to the far side of the tavern's bar counter for distance. Uncle, how exactly did the Crystal Heart choose as a chosen one? Generous asked. Oh, it's simple really dwarf. The heart would send out these special brands and they would fly off across all of Glee easier to search for the ones who it chose. The nerdy looking girl identified as Olera said. She unfurled a parchment of paper onto the table filled with drawings. Brandings can be found anywhere on the chosen one's body. This is the brand of the bane which is Faith Lens and the other two are the brands of the shareholder and the scholar whom we are missing. We are going to post a notice across all of Zanagrad in every town center and every tavern of these, Olera said. The lieutenant's fight or flight response activated within her as Samantha quietly stood up from her chair and began to casually walk away whilst those natives talked themselves over her brand that she hid underneath her hand. Hey let me see that. Generous grabbed the parchment. Bicepag. I have seen that brand just now. The dwarf jumped enthusiastically. Where? Kalaya asked. The rest of her party stood up excitably as generous upon their investigation reaching a breakthrough. Red-headed one over there by her right hand. Generous pointed to Samantha. The lieutenant's heart sank upon hearing the dwarf's excited squeals. She was too careless with hiding her brand and now all of the tavern's patrons and hostile natives in search of her turned their eyes to her. She has been exposed by the Empire's will my lady, may we have a moment with you. Petra grabbed Samantha's cloak accidentally yanking the garment off of Samantha's body uncovering her amethyst Hecate suit. My my, praise be to her. I never would have foresaw that the shareholder would be such a fair maiden. Petra lightly bantered to Samantha, most especially eyeing her figure up towards her emerald eyes and Ceres ponytail. You. You're the chosen one here to save us, the dwarf girl squealed. That is, some strange armor you have there Vera. Of the most superb of makings coming from a dwarf such as I do say so myself. Actocolite with gyronite. Who is your blacksmith may I ask? Findrum commented on the unconventional design of two radically opposite minerals that somehow coalesce together harmoniously on Samantha's suit. Whomever was the smith who created this marvel of engineering must have remarkable skill that somehow evaded even the senior echelons of the Grey Order, the Empire and the Moguls. Thank Nenya that we have found you chosen one. We never thought we would find you here. Olera cheered. Please come with us. We are part of the Imperial Entourage to one other chosen one by the name of Marchog Faith Langarm Haik of the brand of the Anathema. We are on a valiant quest to vanquish a coming evil that will soon descend upon our lands. 
she gave out the group's collective proposal. Never. I will not join you. Samantha spat, her head ready to ineluctably reject any attempt of solicited enlistment from these natives. She needs to leave whilst the scenario is still of a sober state. Please. You need to save the world. Do you want to protect your friends? family and countrymen from the demon hordes coming from the fallen Tyrian citadel, the light of civilization is in need of heroes like you, Oleru implored the lieutenant, you can have glory, wealth and the honor of the emperor's favor if you follow us, Findrum attempts to appeal to Samantha's self-interest, you can become a heroine, forever your name will be etched on the annals of history and sung illustriously by bards all over. Why deny the calling of your gift chosen one? Carlyle asked Samantha, how can you all say that? Samantha rebuked her confronters. Saving civilization? You're doing a superb job destroying it already. I beg your pardon? Petra asked. Look at what you are doing to your own people for a start. Samantha shouted her voice echoing across the room to the scare of everyone. Public beatings, enslavement, crucifixions, impalements, every day all I see you is tearing families apart sending them out the mines where they will surely die, you people have the gall to tell me that I as the shareholder should fight for the light of civilization. Why should I join you, a band of thugs you all are? Samantha called them out on this hypocrisy. The lieutenant's words shocked the adventurers but not in the negative sense, they do have to admit, that the various harsh methods they used in order to secure their supplely line were draconian at best yet a necessary measure if they were to stand a chance against the demonic invasion from the southeast of the empire. This shareholder's character, as Carlyle can evaluate is direct in contrast to Faith Lens. This impassionate red-headed maiden was of a better moral standing to the latter's naivete-driven brashness albeit very confrontational by the tone of her voice when she mouthed off their offering attempts. In the old books, as she has read with young Oleira when they passed the time together during their travels together when the Crystal Heart chose multiple chosen ones to act on its stead. The individuals had differing and contrasting personalities that balanced each other out. One hero was a fervent idealist whilst his companion and eventual wife-to-be was of a serene mind. A trio of heroes showed differing patterns of thought, one of instinct, another of morality, and the last grounded towards reality. The most extensive case, the Vinholder Four, may have come from the same town but are of differing temperaments. Chosen One Shareholder Carlyle inhaled already her appeals, you have every right to be angry by the Empire's actions but we have no other choice in the matter, if we have no ingots then we can have no weapons to fight the demons, she explained, sometimes you have to make sacrifices for the greater good, Findrum added, what kind of greater good, the mumblings of some old cooch you call a grandmaster for some spell he has no mastery of? What was it? Seeing through the future is it not? Samantha returned fire. Chosen one. Carlyle's nerves snapped. Do not speak ill of the Grand Master like that. His infinite wisdom foretold the prophecy so that we may be able to prevent the demons from coming here to our world in the first place. And yet you continue to fail. Samantha yelled louder for emphasis. That Grand Master of yours is just an old fool who is dabbling in something he will not understand. You and your chosen one Faith Len are not trying to prevent the end times but hastening it, you are destroying yourselves. Samantha recalled how Aliathra's words and Iris' interrogation painted a sort of oracle like a ceremony that had taken place before the Eodem's arrival in Gleesia, how their arrival will bring about the end of all time. A new change to the era as foretold by Jeltigar's comet. In their haste to fight the inevitable, they only ensured of its happening. I am sorry, but no amount of your flowery words and promises of wealth will make me join all you, you, barbarians. Samantha rested her case with one final insult to those so-called Alliance of the Light. The Grey Order adventurers were lifted in a storm of emotions, none of them positive upon the tempestuous rejection from the shareholder chosen one. Petra and Findrim were left gasping for air upon the sight whilst Meter's eyes widened in surprise. Oleira's face cracked, ready to flood a few tears as hope drained from her soul at the chosen one's rejection to save the world. For Carlia, she had frustration taking over her temperament. 
the college mage had enough troubles boggling her mind that, all the weight taken from dealing with Faithland's antics, the journeying and hearing from Samantha's words took her to the boiling point. I am sorry chosen one, but you leave us no choice. Carlyle apologized to her. We need you and we needed you yesterday. We may talk again when you finally calm down. Seize her. She ordered her companions. The college mage gestured her hands as acidic green energy formed on her hands. By the recognition of how the mage twirled her fingers, Samantha knows that she is about to unleash a paralysis spell. Not today, Samantha smirked as she reached out her hand and conjured her magics to counter spell, instantly snuffing out Carlyle's attempts for her capture. Much to the mage's bewilderment, Counterspelling can be described as an art on its own according to Aliathra's teachings which the lieutenant has recently begun to learn. It requires an encyclopedic knowledge of many spells as each spell's category requires a unique means to effectively answer. Thankfully, her shareholder abilities complemented by her Hecate suit gave her an extensive affinity on sensing magics which her go allows her to detect Carlyre's spell, identify it and then neutralize it. This was her first time counterspelling someone outside of the training environment back in the laboratory. Now the college mage's power flows within her now. Get over here. Mita shouted as her hooded figure charged towards the lieutenant for a good old-fashioned tackle to take her down. But as her form collided with Samantha's, instead of hitting a solid object instead, the crow master only caught her. She can notice that the shareholder chosen one's body was in a state of fluctuating blur. Impossible. That is a magic spell used by only the Dark Elves by the Sisters of the Blade. Olayra pointed out. Ha. Huh. Let's say I know someone. Samantha smirked. The answer to that question was from Aliathra again. Get her. Findrim rallied the tavern patrons. The dwarves in the wet tankard rose from their chairs and eager to help a native son such as Findrim was more than an incentive to follow his command. Come get some. Samantha taunted. The entire patrons at the bar, along with Findrim and Petra jumps on some to pin her down. However, as they made the landing. They felt a sharp pain on their bodies in which they reflexively winced in pain from an explosion of wooden splinters piercing their bodies like quills. For instead of pinning down Samantha managed to temporarily displace one of the tables in the tavern by the front door with herself at the last second. Suckers, Samantha teased as she was seen running across the marketplace outside of the tavern. Oh no you don't. Mita growled. She was the faster runner in the group so she gave chase to the runaway chosen one. Dashing expeditiously, the crow master caught up with her, grabbing her by the hand and pinning her to the floor. Stand down chosen one, don't make me do this the hard way. You cannot escape me since I am Mita the crow and I never let any of my prey escape. She said whilst brandishing her knife, Me to the crow, you're the bitch that attacked our half plaza with the demon bane. Samantha curses, recognizing the name. How did you know that? Mita asked, dumbfounded by being exposed herself. Never mind. Get off of me. Samantha shouted. Thanks to her CQC training back in West Point, ranging from Kruf Maga and Judo. The lieutenant was able to seize the moment and release herself from Mita's grip causing the crowmaster to be given a good number of bruises on her pale white skin with a discombobulated noggin to boot. Literally, none of Mita's previous prey shared such superb talent in evading her grasp which both infuriated and impressed the crowmaster. Remarkable skill chosen one. Perhaps we can make you into not only a fine mage but a member of the crows too. She complimented. Not interested. Samantha rejected the offer as she ran away. Mita held back as she could not pursue such a slippery individual at her current state so she has to rely on her final card to play. She whistled loudly for a friend as the feisty redhead ran away. LT why are you running? Asked Clay. We have been exposed. Get evac now. Samantha warned. Damn it. Clay execrated as he radioed the rest of the squad. Code Red get out of there and meet up at the rendezvous. We return to Nankarim, he ordered. The rest of Strider group made it out of Gwazdan unharmed with partial amounts of useful items in tow. Diaz was able to rob of a handful of weapons from a blacksmith whilst Tyrus and Abidai learned more intelligence of slave caravan routes. 
However, unbeknownst to them as they returned safely to the rebel headquarters of Nankarim, an avian creature, known as the Briarus, a domesticated bird that the crows are known to breed and use for their missions. The creature is famous for its adaptability, intelligence, loyalty, sense of smell, and incredible eyesight as they were trained as a more maneuverable option to your standard hunting dogs. It vultures over Strider Group as it made its way back to Nankarim. Mita ran ahead to pursue the Chosen One with her Brarus as an act of penance for underestimating the shareholder to her fellow adventurers. Upon reuniting with her bet, the Crowmaster looked over the southernmost hold of the Astlrox and smiled confidently for not only she found where the Chosen One is, but also where all the escaped slaves were running away to. This will be reported to Faithlen in the Mogul Dolmond. This rebellion shall be crushed and the shareholder will be captured in one stroke of her quill as she sent a message out to inform her allies of this discovery. Chapter 44 A Baleful Turn Agent Gary the Sard huffed a cloud out of effervescent cigarette smoke from his lungs as he dismissed the team that gave their reports after safely returning back to Nankaram headquarters. He let out a heavy sigh as he swallowed what he just heard. He grows wearier the more this rebellion continues to stretch its duration the riskier things could get for everyone thanks in no part of the whole dwarves home field advantage. Not only that, but the more he continues the fight, this proxy war the youth is conducting, the more of the chilling story behind the seemingly serene dwarven mountains revealed its ugly self to the youth in the Astrix. Mining is its claim to fame and thus the most valued form of labor one can find in the region. The mines are all controlled by the holds via the Mughal dynasties who are descendants of great wizards who specialize in geomancy. Not only were the profits of rare earth minerals such as actocolite, scandonite and gyronite were of common place but also mana crystals themselves that grows beneath the ground the mountains sat upon. However, Despite its lucrative values it holds roundly easier, the moguls maintain a systematic and draconic control of the mining industries only remotely on paper in check by the mining guilds who acts like a primitive labor union between the servile terrorist dwarves and their opulent lavish hold dwarven masters. The moguls one and only interests above all else was to maintain their sole control and mastery of the prices and supply of mana crystals. Actocolite Scandinite and Gyronite within the continent. There was stiff competition between the Dwarves, the Elves and the Yujigong Empire for the sale of such minerals to the rest of the world as in the case of their hastily panicked emergency conscription of terrorist Dwarves from an earlier trade deal between them and the Empire involving a lucrative order to supply enough of wonder minerals to equip an army worthy of a chosen one of legend. It would have gone smoothly like any other deal as before was it not for the actions of one Captain Mendoza and a caravan of said one the minerals being liberated off of its contents. Now the dwarves were hastily strip mining the Astlrooks to make up for the lost shipment. In their haste, they enacted the tyrannical forced labor laws to get the manpower they needed to mine the minerals to fulfill the contract made by the Empire. Many miners would be subjected to treacherous conditions such as cavens, exhaustion and the monster attacks in which a dozen casualties would be a normal occurrence every month. Even with the terrifying conditions within the mines that the dwarves had utilized in the past. Several cunning strategies to recruit more workers as it was cheaper for the mogul geomancers to recruit more workers, than to improve working conditions in the mines to maintain a competitive edge within the continent. This exploitative system was especially appealing for the geomancers of the mogul dynasties as their magics of geomancy required a significant amount of mana energies to dig further in the ground which said mana crystals was more suited for sale to the mages who demand such goods. But such a large dragon that feeds on the decadent hold dwarves requires more food to feed it less it leaves and brings with it the good fortune said dragon brought to the Islrix. In their first attempt to feed said metaphorical dragon it was the establishment of a rudimentary feudal system of castes between the lordly hold dwarves and the commoner terrace dwarves that is still being lived by today in the Islrix. When the demand only grew higher, the second attempt was incentivizing penal and debt forgiveness to offenders. 
The third time, it was attempted through half-promising from silver-tongued judges to make pursuing a career in the mines appealing before slowly pulling out said statements in the interest of shortcomings. Ultimately, it was the fourth attempt the present-day forced labor laws normally reserved for times of war was when the whole dwarves had the greatest possible amount of manpower available at their disposal. Such a system was like a bubble, doomed to pop any time soon and as such will see it that it does pop. For the past few days after assuming control of the situation and organizing an insurgency for the terrorist dwarves to be freed of their centuries-old bondage to their opulently decadent hold masters has seen promising success. His strategy was to snowball the resistance against the hold dwarves by rescuing slaves, the assassination of key political figures, and acquiring supplies stolen from enemy armories. Based on the statistics he recorded he initially started with about 1,000 insurgent dwarves based on the existing amount of supporters that Luther Amirian's kinsmen had collected throughout their time before which had grown to a healthy after some fruitful slave raids acquired an additional 1,200 ex-slaves joining their cause ranging from humans, dwarves, some of Kimra and Hodden's kinsmen too. As for assassinations, they have eliminated about 10 geomancers, 25 officials working for mogul dolment in military or civilian aspects and approximately 200 combined numbers of the elite Everbeards and Stinger infantry via ambushes. Lastly, in terms of supplies, the resistance managed to secure about 500 pieces of high-quality weapons from forges that were either raided or destroyed depending on what would be the best desired outcome before the attack. In response to their attacks, the whole dwarves and their slaygen allies are employing several tactics to mitigate the damages they made. Body doubles, doubling their guards spreading out their supply chains or simply putting themselves into hiding which is what the intelligence agent wants them to do, to stretch them thin until they reach a breaking point. But now the challenge is looking for that breaking point. A lot of their most valuable assets such as Mogul Dolmond and his lucrative mines are guarded tightly and they had recently lost contact with the Kerfold her mining guilds when he attempted to have his agents acquire maps of the more lucratively blessed of dwarven mines to plan a raid on. There are still however several more outposts across the Astrox that the Sard can go for the tiresome death by a thousand cuts strategy but it will involve establishing more extensive networks and time was not on his side. The army that Mogul Dolmond commands, however, is the most troublesome factor to the freedom of movement for the resistance so perhaps he should focus the next attacks in whittling the Everbeards and Sting Eyes plus their foot and core bondsmen to even the odds. Strategically speaking, Desart knows that he will have to do something to send the dwarves into a state of disarray if he were to regain the advantage. He needed some sort of opportunity that is explosive, demobilizing, and upsetting. He sent out scouts to grab as much intelligence for any large projects, major troop movements, or public appearances that he could use to bewilder his opponent and take the fight to the very gilded gates of Kerfold Ur itself. Lieutenant please tell me something useful if you're here, he asked Samantha who walked inside his makeshift office inside the dwarven courthouse that each hold is one to administrate the local region it respectively controls. Desart, it is about my brand. I had a thought, Samantha said, make it quick. Desart induced Samantha to invest his time away from his maps, documents, and plans for her. There are three chosen ones, right? There's me and Dr. Malona, right? Followed by this other one that the Slay agents have by the name of Faith Len. Samantha said. Ooh, that's was the hearsay everyone talks about. A lot of people right now are confused. You fighting on their side and the other way around? Cecilia Bordelite tell you lieutenant The Sart responded. As you know, my mark was exposed some days ago and now my chosen oneness is being known to the natives. What are the latest rumors about me now decided? What did everyone else found out? Samantha sighed. Parouge er comments? I got so many from Mirian's folks that it honestly made my head hurt. The intelligence officer sighed. I hear of one rumor that you are a faux chosen one. A fake. That you, stolen the branding from the real one or you're just pretending to be the shareholder. The other is that you are misguided. That you are not seeing the true evil or whatever. 
That's a mouthful. Samantha sulked. What about Faith Len? The chosen one that the Empire has? Samantha asked. From what I gathered, this petty Garson is said to be a powerful warrior and mage said to be able to overwhelm many opponent with his attacks. He divulged. High Command recommends that you avoid confrontation with him until we know for certain what kind of sorcerer we are dealing with. Anything else to go by other than that? Samantha asked. Actually, there are some words going about that is related to both you and this Faith Len. Dasat mentions, what kind of words? The lieutenant leaned close to listen. They say that a certain group of Imperials are very interested in finding you. For you are more desirable than Faith Len. Dasat explained. More desirable? Samantha recoiled in disbelief. According to what our informants said, whilst the so-called Bane Chosen One is a powerful individual, he equally has an ego to match and the Empire seeks to acquire you because they hope you are more manageable given your name. Dasat explained. He is still considered the enemy however Lieutenant E. Rose. We may not know much more about him as of late so we must proceed with caution. The intelligence officer warns. Of course, if his Bane name is anything to go by, he could be more powerful than me. Samantha nods. But I want to be sure of one thing. That if the time comes, you will not hesitate to eliminate him if you cross paths which I believe is simply inevitable. Dasat told her. She had seen the amount of mysticism and play that many fantastic stories took place over her incessant consumptions of their media. There was always a twist to the tale and hearing about this Faithland character, her fellow chosen one had made her contemplate more about the prophecy that promised great change to all of Gleesia. Already she is witnessing firsthand the modernization of Tyrion being worked on as they spoke with the return of Prince Clovich expediating the process. Meanwhile, this mysterious Faithland person has been said to be a person of heavy repute being of the Bane brand that the mysterious artifact had bestowed upon him. There is a clamor within Samantha that partly, she wanted to get some answers from anyone who knows more of this sacred crystal heart and why did it choose her and Dr. Melona, non-natives of Gleesia to be a chosen one? Right now. Her greatest desire is to find out more about her powers, but yet her loyalty to the youth state must be of equal priority. I understand. Samantha softly accepted. Good, I am glad you see it our way. Dasad nodded before looking down at his map and sighed. How goes the operations? The lieutenant asked. The good news is that we have the whole dwarves on the run. Our raids have been producing successful results. As of late. We have observed that their armies are switching tactics, more dispersed guards for search and destroy operations to counteract us, body doubles for assassination targets and curfews to limit the resistance's movements. He explained. There's just a problem I am having. A problem? Samantha asked. Nothing critical, just some personal frustrations. Look at me here Lieutenant e. Dasat huffed. The dwarves are likely going to plan out for the long game while we want to cut off the mining supply as soon as possible. Right now, I am trying to dig in for something we can do to take the fight directly against the whole dwarves, you know? Take it to the next level. But right now everything is all hush-hush. The agent confessed. If you and your team can find something that could turn up the heat against these dwarves then take it. Yes sir. Samantha saluted. Just as the lieutenant was about to make her leave, Dasat's office door slammed open to a very alarmed Luya Amirian. We are being besieged, the dwarf said. Of a gate, of a gate is the northernmost gate in Nankaram that faced the rest of the Astrox behind it. It was also one of the most elevated areas of the Dwarven Holden so an attack from such a vertically superior position would be devastating to the resistance forces of Nankarim. Officially, the hold remained untouched by the insurgencies that plagued the rest of the mountains but the Sard reasoned that the Dwarves would know that Nankarim was the poorest and least developed hold in all of the Astlrooks as the targets worth a damn would have been the other richer holds north of Nankarim. Unofficially, Nankarim, or the mining guild's office of Nankarim with the local courthouse being an extension of the insurgency's political base where they coordinate with other terrorist dwarves and mining guilds across the rest of the Astrix. A successful attack on Nankarim would have decapitated this insurgency before it could even begin. 
However, this could be the case of experience for the whole dwarves as Lulia Amirian can attest to. He had described that dwarves from Nankaram were looked down upon by the other hold moguls for their turbulence against the status quo and how the hold would have been called a ghetto pretending to be a hold as many moguls would belittle. Despite the impoverished reputation, the dwarves of Nankaram were no born losers. Instead, they were fighters of the sense that they always try to endure in spite of their less than ideal surroundings compared to their richer kin. The origins of the Dwarven Mining Guilds can be traced back to Nankaram where it was its cradle. They had always been a thorn on the side of the Geomancer dynasties of the whole Dwarves for centuries as they tried to fight for better working conditions, higher wages, and other sorts of moves that would require the whole Dwarves to compromise their power to those lower in the socio-economic food chain. Oftentimes, the other dwarven holds would cast an irking eye of suspicion towards Nankaram whenever the mining guilds attempt another power play. Lulia had several occasions talk about the various times that Nankaram was temporarily occupied by another hold and it was only through the skin of the mining guilds where the foreign soldiers left them alone but after having their blades wetted with the blood of a few troublemakers before departure. Additionally, there was also a budding tinkerer's workshop within Nankaram's walls that have been trying to build new mining equipment within closed-doored court receptions in other hold courts for the mining guilds whom they are close partners of and together they produced with mixed results. Mirian often speaks very highly of them despite their several failures at times due to how they would consistently improve upon themselves to learn from their previous mistakes and moved forward from them. So far. Desart hadn't looked closely on the tinkerers as of late due to the circumstances but he does, when the time or if his boredom gets the better of him would pay these inventors a visit. There were several of them taking part in the defences of the walls outside of northern Nankaram with their modified crossbows that had a rudimentary telescope attached atop of its flight groove. What am I looking at? Samantha asked one of the dwarves. It's the army. A dot a coalition of all the dwarven holds brought together here. To kill us all, the dwarf stuttered in fright. I see even the armies of the empire with them too brother Agni. Mirian beamed over the great army lines. Estimated hostile force size is approximately 15,000 enemy combatants, Isaac informed from behind her radio. They were outnumbered 1 to 15 and that's if they account for the fact that most of their ragtag forces of insurgent dwarves were barely trained militiamen with several maladies ranging from injuries to malnourishment due to their supplies stretched to its logistical limits. Bollocks! Man the guns! Crocker yelled at the youth soldiers and mercenaries as they set up their rifles above the crevices of Nernkaram's walls. Their dwarven, goblin and centaur allies too scrambled to a defensive position as they steeled themselves steadfastly for they now entered as Sun Tzu would call it death ground. Either the rebellion lives to fight another day or they die together within these creaking walls. Across the battlefield, a proud young knight smiled eagerly for his first ever battle. Is it true that the shareholder lives within those walls? Faith Len asked. My bird never fails me. Meet a bowed. But, in essence, we have also found the heart of these rebels and it was unsurprising this bastard city gives refuge to them. Then we shall crush this rebellion once and for all. Marchog Fawn cheered as he zealously unsheathed his sword from its scabbard. Indeed, with my magics and my power, I can triumph over anything that is thrown against me. If this shareholder cowers behind those walls like the craven she is and not accept her fate then I shall squash her down like those rebel scum. Faith Len joined in the older knight's zealotry. Why do we need her anyway? She refuses to fight and we do not need cowards in my great crusade for righteousness. Child, do not speak ill of the shareholder. Carlyas scolded. May you stay your hand for one moment knights? Olayra pleaded. We also have no clue how powerful this chosen one truly is and already you are rushing with blasphemous boasts. Do stay your confidence at least until after we triumph against these dwarves, Carlyle said, and we need the shareholder and the scholar to form the trinity we need to defeat the demons once more. We need her alive and end this bloody uprising quickly and now, she pressed. If the shareholder is within those walls then we must exercise with the utmost discretion. We must not injure the other chosen one, she reminded. 
yet the rebels inside are free to slay. Faith Lent smirked. Why do you think the Chosen One is colluding with the rebels' mage? Fawn asked. I hypothesize that in a somewhat misguided attempt of virtue, this new Chosen One is aiding these rebels if her good aligned morals are what I had observed when we first encountered her. Carlyle added. This is based on what was our conversation back in Gweza had transpired. It is an art that no magic can help master I tell you. The art of the tongue. Carlia, Pecha, Findrum and Oleira could remember those scathing words that echoed from the red-headed one's fiery and passionate heart. She was a fighter for a better future but by the judgment of her yet wrinkled cheeks and the youth on her eyes. She still has yet to fully understand her place in Gleesia. This shareholder better hopes that she can contain Faith Len's passions to a more refined extent than what she and the other of the first chosen one's mentors could ever do. As much as I find her notions noble, she is rather naive of the world just like my niece sometimes. Findrum commented, What I find odd about her is that she is a complete unknown, a ghost, a nobody from what I asked of Evrian. None of them could tell of seeing a woman such as her before, perhaps she is lone cells or door of one of the southern barbarians from the frontiers or a maybe a new member of the adventurer's guild. Petra gave his piece. I appreciated that you had tried Richtdorf. Carlyle smiled softly, but let bygones be bygones, now is the time that we finish this chapter and capture ourselves the next chosen one. Marchog Fane swaggered his steed in front of the rest of the coalition's army and presented himself at a good distance that his shouts can be heard. Rebels of Nankaram heed the words of Marchog Grashen S. Fawn, the will of Emperor Aldens Lae Ejak and the Mogul Dolmund of Kerfalda. You are surrounded and outnumbered greatly. Resistance is futile but if you surrender to me immediately then I shall promise you mercy lest you want us to descend upon you and be made an example of those who dare uproot the peace of the realms. Marchog Fawn called out and gave his proposition, but as the venerable knight yelled, Faith Len galloped forward a plot of the field away from Grashina's position and called out the top of his lungs, Chosen one that bears the mark of Ranupata, the shareholder, if you are so brave to be in league with those tough enough to challenge the Empire and the Dwarven clans then why not you and your lackeys come out and fight us in the honorable and glorious field of battle? Faith Len shouted gallantly his head boiling red with battle elast. The garrison shuddered silence again as Faith Len's ego sees only that the enemy quivered behind the safety of those walls. Come now, bring your champion out, bring your chosen one the shareholder out as your champion or maybe you are all craven peons. Faith Len pressed his verbal assault forward. I know you are their shareholder and your reputation has not escaped my ears of your power your fiery red hair, and also your slipperiness. Samantha's resolve shook for one moment at the mentioning of her name. If she was no soldier, her knees would have cowered by this other world as words but after recovering her volition she knew that it is just what this hostile native wanted her and her allies to do for they will lose their one advantage against the coalition that is the walls of Nankarim. However, their native allies who had helped them so far shuddered at the gleaming armor that the coalition had presented themselves in their march towards their stronghold. In comparison, it was an absolute mismatch between a professional army and a ragtag guerrilla rebels trapped in a corner. Don apostrophe t dot even dot think dot about dot it does not order discipline amongst his ranks. Boy, what are you doing? Marchog Fawn questioned the insubordination of Faith Len. What we all want, to end this rebellion once and for all. I have an idea. Faith Len proposed, what could possibly be a good idea right now? The knight asked. Bring out the Gwistlon and hold them out in front of our front line. Faith Len shows his unexpected aptitude of tactics to the knight. That does indeed sound like a good idea. I hope this could work. Fay nodded. He knows that in spite of Faith Len's boldness they commonly agreed that this insurrection should end quickly one way or the other, galloping back to the lines as Faith Len proceeded to draw the rebels' attention with arrogant taunts, which are finally being put to a somewhat beneficial use, the old knight made his play. He ordered his men to bring out the Gwistlons that they had kept and ordered them to be brought out in full view of the two armies. It was a common siege tactic with a subtle yet at times a very potent gambit if one played his cards and honeyed his tongue right. What are they doing? 
Desaad looked, grabbing his binoculars. The intelligence agent zoomed his sight across the horizon as the enemy coalition parted themselves to reveal perhaps their greatest weapon. Murd, you have got to be kidding me. Desaad's eyes widened as his flame shuddered, his hand's grip weakening upon realizing the sight before him. Oh no. It is like the riots all over again. Mirian shuddered alongside him seeing his people in chains and being ready to be put to the sword by cruel-eyed men. To the dismay of the youth soldiers, the Gwistlons were no siege engine nor was it some fantastic beast of monstrous potent. Instead they were dozens upon dozens groups of ragged people, dwarf, human, goblin and even centaur chained gang together as they were corralled towards the front of the army in the pain of running themselves towards a line of fire of an archer or a front line spear. They were positioned at a forward element where a contingent of faith lens Legion legionnaires was of a few dozen feet meters away from the eloquent youth. The prisoners' bodies showed the wounds of continuous abuse and neglect as their hopeless and terrified eyes looked on to the bastion that had represented their freedoms before them, its sweet embrace just out of reach and yet a life of chains tethering them from the havenhood of Nurnkarim. The presentation of Gwistlons or hostages is a common siege warfare tactic that can be employed by either side. Such a controversial tactic is used to negotiate the other side's cessation of hostilities fulfillment of a specific yet precarious condition or a hefty ransom less the one being struck with the dangerous dilemma see the person s of value held hostage often a family member close friend or in the worst cases entire populaces be thrown into the hungry wolves that is the one pulling for leverage in a very demoralizing fashion but even then it's a double-edged sword with its own risks and rewards that throughout several records of the Empire's steel-blooded history cases of such an attempt of negotiations ended unfavorably for the enactor of such a gambit. What you see before you are your kin whom we had gathered to help persuade you to seize your insolence. Come down from Nurnkarim now for I demand a challenge to a duel. The winner shall have their way with the prisoners. Faithland proposed appealing to the rumored trait of the shareholder sense of common justice as the hostages whimpered behind him. Silence fell upon the Nurnkarim garrison as they were struck with a sadistic choice, the death of their loved ones, or the continued dishonor of their own kin once again. Equally frightened were several of Faithland's own followers who were bewilderment by Faithland's surprising ruthlessness. Originally, these hostages were going to go through diplomatic channels and a few underground ones via ransom brokers to safely ferry away these rebels back to their families in order to force a peace in concert to the interests of the defenders of such a rebellion of whilst pacifying the region off of any malcontents usually through the use of authoritative examples, yet even then. To use such hostages so suddenly in a rush of thought as formerly. To use Gwistlons requires a formal letter from the enactor to the targeted party before physical presentation of hostages. One must be willing to suffer penalizing wrath from the offended party or stomach the strongest of wills to be so shrewd of committing. March Og. What are you doing? Carlyle asked the old knight. Some of these prisoners are just children. This doesn't seem to be the noblest tact to do. Using hostages, Olera argued in support of her senior. Are we not a crusade for the salvation of Gleesia? We are ending this dance today. The knight bluntly answered with a stern grin to separate himself emotionally from the wailing moans of the hostages that they present before the rebels of Nurnkarim. We need to have them surrender immediately. It pains me to do this but we need to end this pointless war and go back to focusing on who the true enemy is. The knight said, this is not the right way, none of this is right. Why I should inform the emperor and the grand master of all of these happenings is not helping the war effort at all. Carlyle protested, shut your mouth woman, you know nothing of war. The knight scolded her. He grabbed the female mage and her junior aged scholar colleague by their arms to silence the two's incessant protests. He dragged the women's prying eyes away from the tent scene back to their camp as the more war wired of Faithland's retinue readied themselves with their dwarven allies. 
however, Faith Len shouted, I had traveled too far to be quelling rebellions when there is a demon invasion happening and it is within everyone's likings that I propose an alternative solution for you to be chosen at your leisure. I demand you hand over the one called their shareholder to be within my audience and I shall spare several of your kin. Faith Len proposed, we are not risking Lieutenant Rose with that wanker. Crocker protested, he'll just kill them all anyway and grab Samantha at the first opportunity. Dassard tadded, they have my people as hostages, Marion argued, despair reeking from his beard as he pleaded with the other worlders. And so are ours. Hodden and Quim rejoined the dialogue in unison. I can't bear to see more of my kin die. If they kill them all then the men of those families will surely break. Marion cried, we cannot leave the walls. That's what they want us to do. Clay reasoned, if we give Samantha to the Empire. We can kiss everything that Aparo and the Doc did in the lab goodbye. Diaz says his piece. Knowing the Empire and their Magi College, they will use her and the Hecate suit she wears against us. Iris nodded. I hate all of our options. I know. Dasat shouted at everyone, flailing his hands uncontrollably. The defenders fell quiet, cognitively confounded into a deadlock on how to proceed with their next move. The hostages are quite frankly the hearts and the minds of the whole rebellion in same vein that Nankaram is the historical icon of said rebellion too. Losing Samantha Rose would also be of a devastating loss too. For the first time in a long while after their arrival, the Federation has found themselves in a true disadvantage. Help was a call away but it will not matter when they needed the Guardian-like and angelic wings of an A-25 Dragoon the most. All three choices were of equal and devastating compromises for the youth to take that neither could ill afford to suffer the loss of and now innocent blood will be shed before their eyes and there is almost not a thing they can do about it. Several of the natives began to cause a ruckus below the walls, demanding that the Federation give up Samantha to the Empire at the honorable chance that they may be able to reunite with their loved ones once again. Please Ledewey Rose. You have to rescue my people and if it means you having to entertain that brat then so be it. I know many of those people he is holding hostage before the holds was right this moment. Miriam pleaded. Samantha knew the risks of presenting herself to the Empire before the other chosen one. They may capture her or attempt to kill her and even then. It doesn't guarantee the safety of the hostages that Faith Len is holding by a thread before their rebel allies. She has to say. This Bain chosen one was really being such a poisonous individual by the way he is acting upon them. Yet her most human side of her mind urged her to do the right thing to rescue those innocent civilians from the clutches of the Empire. Pragmatically speaking if the rebelling terrorist dwarves breaks as the people, they are fighting to make a future for die. Then the whole hearts and the minds campaign of flipping the Astrox blue goes down the drain in one literal stroke of the blade. The lieutenant needed to breathe for one moment, to meditate on her options, remembering her teaching in West Point a good commanding officer must share a basic principle of warfare, to know thyself. She remembered the diverse prowess of her allies' abilities on the field, how the centaur's awe-inspiring swiftness, Diaz's cyberpunk reflexes, Crocker's strength, Kane's versatile serviceability of his drones, the dwarven willpower, the goblin's craftiness, Aliathra and Iris magics and also her own reactive core that became both her blessing and her curse. She even forgot a little feature that Dr. Malone mentioned to her about the current incarnation of her suit's abilities. The Hecate suit allows the user to discharge mana energies more efficiently than any other living person can hope to do. Strider, Hodden, Quimera. I have a plan. Samantha rallied her friends. Do what I say and we can save them all. Chapter 45, Quaking Earth. Where is your chosen one Nankarim? Is she a coward? Your time is running out. Faith Len challenged. He held at sword point a hostage, a youthful dwarven male, before him as he awaited this so-called shareholder with her so boasted nobility she excretes from her words. The northeastern winds from the Astorox peaks blew across the integument of the dwarven hold sending a chilling breath that unfurled the various authoritative flags that the hold dwarves and their slaves and allies brought forth to this field proudly and display in all of its flowing glory. All of the bannermen and their men at arms clutched their weapons restlessly, 
awaiting the call to begin a battle. The Bane Chosen One was starting to get impatient and uneased as the walls of Nurnkarum grew silent before him. He was barely out of the range of any of the Nurnkarum's ballist to end range fire as he guesses by no sharpshooter daring to lay a narrow head near him. Had the rebels decided to cowardly further embed themselves within their walls and not mount to rescue of their kin? Stubborn cravens you are. Maybe this shall motivate you. Faith Len yelled out to the seemingly abandoned walls of Nurnkarim. He thrusted his sword back, ready to impale the hostage before him. No, please have mercy. The hostage begged for his life. Stop it. I am here. Samantha's voice broke the silence of the no man's land. Show yourself. Faith Len yelled underneath Samantha's intervening voice. On cue, the lieutenant materializes out of invisibility in front of Faith Len. Her fists curled with a cracking sound from her knuckles to show her intent to entertain this hot-headed young boy who claims himself to be a hero. So, our guest of honor has arrived. Faith Len smiled as he halted his harming act on his hostage. Let us engage in parley my lady. He politely bowed. Let that man go first. Samantha ordered. But of course, I am in a good mood today. Faith Len smiled. He honorably let go of his captive as the man ran safely to the walls of Nurnkarim where a team of rebels came to his immediate aid. So, you are the shareholder? Faith Len asked of Samantha. And you are the bane? Samantha returned his gesture. You. You're just a kid. The lieutenant grinned. Faith Len looked barely legal by his late teenage physique. I may be a child but the crystal heart blessed me to lead the light against the darkness. Faith Len gasconaded. But where is my courtesy? I am Faith Len Garmhaik, March of the Slaeijan Empire and the Chosen One that is the bane of all demons. He introduced himself. Why are you here Chosen One in Nurnkarim? Samantha asked. I had heard you had encountered several of my comrades in Gwezza several days ago as we are all searching for you, the shareholder and also the other Chosen One who goes by the name of the Scholar. My associates had chanced upon you on a tavern one day and attempted to put you under my wings but you ran away? Why do you run away from your destiny? Do you cower because of the demon's invasion? Faith Lent shared thoughts. I am sorry but I do not associate with people like you. Samantha shot him down. Then maybe you cower because you do not wish to fight against someone who is clearly your better if may guess? But pardon me, I never got your name shareholder. Faith Len continues to grandstand. My name is not important but now you have me. She declined. I know what I want, you know if I win you release those hostages. Samantha tells him her terms. But what is the point of this duel? Samantha asked. To show all of the empire and the asturacy I my prowess in battle, to rally the faithful to the alliance and to also see what you are capable of shareholder. This a contest of who can make the other yield first, not a duel to the death may I let you know for I need of you alive for the crystal heart saith so. Faith Len reminded her. Now. If I triumph against you woman, you must submit to me and the alliance of the light, your whole rebellion will surrender and be punished for your ill-timed insolence. Best me, and I will let them go. Faith Len bashfully boasted, then it is a deal, and to add to the table, if you best me, I will tell you where the scholar is too. He is a friend of mine. Samantha taunted. Faith Len and his followers behind him dingled in gossip upon hearing the lieutenant's passing mention of the third and final chosen one. The astisical, the scholar. Some wondered if what this exotically dressed warrior speaks the truth whilst others trembled that she is trying to provoke Faith Len into a mental state that the challenged shareholder can exploit upon their upcoming duel by appealing to Faith Len's dreams of grandiosity. Ha, huh, that is delightful to hear. Faith Len gleamed as he hopped off of his horse. He approaches Samantha, his hands juggling above him in a rotary movement multiple magical balls of energy, each from the basic elements of destruction that Samantha has learned, fire, lightning, and ice, conjured at the Faith Len's other hand as the Bane Chosen One confidently strutted towards Samantha. The ground quaked in the powerful mage's evocation of power as burning singes from the lightning and fireballs collided over the slowly frosting grounds from the ice ball that Faith Len had created. How do you like my magic's shareholder? It is more powerful than yours, 
Does the sight of my magics make you cower like before? Faith Len bragged. I am not impressed. I have seen better. Samantha dismissed. Oh? Perhaps I may learn more magics with them too. The Bane Chosen One requested. PFFT. I wouldn't even allow you to be my training dummy. The lieutenant jeered. You rascal. I will make you pay for that insult. Faith Lens countered. His nerves struck upon the lieutenant's casual shots of antagonism. He charged forth, sword raised high like the epics he had listened to as he charged forth like a blazing comet towards obstacle that he swore to overcome with all of his might and at all of his expense. He began to shower Samantha in destructive elemental balls to overwhelm her defenses. Adrenaline pumping. The lieutenant reacted quickly. Samantha Straft left dodging the magical projectiles by the skin of her teeth, jumping weaving and sidestepping every attack Faith Lent shot at her. Ha, look at the savage dance. One of the slay Egen legionnaires teased. Are you here to fight me or are you here to dance shareholder? Faith Lent taunted by the light heaving of the young boy's body. Samantha knew that he was about to reach the phase where the mages need to temporarily take heed on themselves as they overheat from mana expenditure. This was her opportunity. With him tired and Samantha still at full reserves, the lieutenant summoned her own destructive elemental balls from her hands and returned fire. For the first time, Faith Len has met someone of his equal. He never could have anticipated that he would be forced into the defensive in which said doctrine he forsook in his trainings with the college mage as he had focused more in the more spectacular of magics rather than the more mundane and utilicious of spells. Samantha's magical attacks caused a crack through Faith Len's defenses with singing burns on his armor followed by several cuts on his arms and face as he turtled himself up with magical wards to shield himself from the assault. Predictable. The lieutenant taunted. This chosen one was more of a glass cannon as Samantha can attest, all attack with abysmal defenses. Even then despite his heavy throws, Faith Lens attacks when in the sight of an adversary capable of defending himself would have read him like a book on what his next move will be, allowing the lieutenant to be ready to counter whatever he throws at her. Gah, you are strong for a coward. But I am stronger. Faith Len spat out the saliva mixed blood off of his now wounded mouth. It was however much more wounding the mental censure of now being forced to place himself on the defensives against an opponent that not only does not fight like any of the sword and or sorcery using opponents he is used to confronting and dominate over. Now it is my turn. Samantha smirked. With her Hecate suit pushing itself into full gear. Samantha. Oh my. This shareholder sure knows how to fight. Findrim grinned. Faith Len. This one is dangerous. Petra cautioned. His shouts echoing from behind Faith Len's personal guards. Quiet. I can do this. Faith Len shot him down. Take this rebel scum. The bane swirled his fingers fluidly as a bright energy engulfed him turning the very scenery around him to quake in his resonance. Samantha could feel a cold sweat escape her brow as she readied herself for Faith Len's next attack. A moment later unleashed from his fingers perhaps his greatest spell that he has managed to capture its affinity as of late. A high level spell called the Golden Lance allows Faith Len to turn the air around intensely torrid that he can by command magically immolate almost any opponent, magical defenses and all but the toughest of armors in white sun hot lightning. Its superheated rays dashed towards Samantha impacting with powerful force upon the Hecate suit's arcane meridians. Such an exhaustive spell awoke a primal hunger within Samantha's ID. The power she had absorbed began to flow within her suit nearly overheating the suit's capacitive limits. Luckily if she were not wearing the suit she would have been vaporized. But with so much energies barely contained within her suit her inner reactor-like self that is the shareholder's curse stretched to its limits. Yet the lieutenant refuse waver not one inch. She needed to buy more time. Divert this chosen one's attention to center around her and only her. Warning, mana energies are at supercritical level. The Hecate suit built in Isaac gave its early warning to Samantha. So. Much power. In me. The lieutenants churned. A buzz of energies surged throughout her body like a growing heat that weakened the lieutenant's knees whilst burning mana energies jolts every fiber within her being. Faith Len, seeing that he has finally turned the tables of this duel pressed his attack, 
further channeling his golden lance spell further, he did not care if he would seriously injure the shareholder. All that he can think of that instance is that he, Marchog Faith Langarm Haik remains the greatest of the chosen ones in his avarice to become the greatest hero that Gleesia had ever seen. LT Crocker cried on his radio. He could detect Samantha's unbinilium levels being contained within her suit reached dangerous levels and he feared for the worst as he couldn't help but look on from the walls of Nankarin. Samantha's body soon reached her limits the more the Hecate suit absorbed Faith Len's powerful spell. She needed to get rid of the energies whilst also stopping incoming in one move or her body will undergo mana meltdown. All of her time back in the laboratory has come down to this moment either she harnesses the power or she dies from this spike of energy surging within her. Remembering her training from Aliathra on how to best manage one's DUI, a mage's energy flow, Samantha braced her abdomen and began to redirect the mana energies being absorbed through her reactor-like core and with a heave she reflects Faith Len's lightning bolt. When the redirected arcane energies turns itself on Faith Len, a thunderous clap quaked the earth around the field the two warring chosen ones duel on causing the ground to rupture in fissures as the sound echoed across all of Nankarim. Faith Len not expecting someone to manage to redirect his spell barely had enough time to conjure another shield to protect him as the backfired arcane energies of the Golden Lance made contact with his defenses. A redirected spell isn't as empowered as before due to energy loss yet the spell was still considerably powerful powerful that Faith Len was left heavily reeling and heavily flustered by this humiliation. He was being set back upon every move he could make by this strange warrior in her exotic armor that he lost all cool within himself. His confidence, now replaced with a barbaric fury, the Bane Chosen One drew his sword impulsively charged forth towards Samantha, frothing for the moment to personally show his blessed strength to fulfill his prophecy. Again, big mistake. Samantha gave a scornful remark as she winded her right arm back as she conjured another wave of energy from her enhanced arcane meridians. Seismic Palm. The lieutenant called out her attacks. It was more of an original name she conjured based on her hidden nerdy self. Often, during her experimentations with her powers, Samantha was able to exhibit a creativity unforeseen by Iris and Aliathra. Being able to invent new spells based on Samantha's own experiences consuming fantasy and sci-fi culture with a dash of understanding of physics and chemistry. Seismic Palm, the spell she uses her coup de grace allows her to create a bare-handed strike with her palms whose shock waves was with a vigorous energies that it is capable at full charge to break the sound barrier and crack the earth. Faith Len was sent flying across the battlefield landing disastrously near to his army as in the spells wake the ground in that which was the point of impact sprouted out of the rockiest Lurisii soil like devilish spine straight from the voids of hell. All of the whole dwarven bondsmen and all the Slaegian legionnaires stared, suspended in disbelief upon Faith Len's broken body laying before them upon the equally broken earth from the Samantha's wake. Clerics rushed towards Faith Len's aid and checked on the Chosen One's vitals. A painful moan escaping his lips confirmed that he is still alive, albeit half dead. The coalition army of the Alliance of the Light were left agape by Samantha's powers as the shareholder. Amazed by what this mysterious warrior's capabilities are. Can you call me a coward now boy? The lieutenant gloated triumphantly before turning to the rest of the coalition army. Well done LT. That was great. Clay radioed ecstatically. Out cold already? Samantha scornfully mocked at Faith Len's unconscious figure. No surprise from a kid playing hero. After saying her sarcastic congratulations the lieutenant then turned to the rest of the coalition crusaders. I have won. Release those hostages now. Samantha demanded the human dwarf coalition of the Alliance of the Light and honor their end of the terms. I am afraid we will not do that. You must yield before us now and then we will release the prisoners. Marchog Fawn broke his words his duty to the Empire overriding any senses of honoring the words of an accord created by Faith Len earlier that he had no say on the arrangement but went along with it if it means the crusade of the Alliance of the Light can push forward with its goals of collecting the Chosen Ones together under their banner.
and you call yourselves knights. Never, Samantha declined once again. Then I am afraid the hostages lives are to forfeit, Fawn ordered. Samantha laughed. She laughed comedically upon hearing the knight's orders that left every one of the coalition army unnerved. Did this shareholder not care about the lives of the hostages that she apathetically brushed off, breaking her so-called description of being concerned of the welfare of the commoners? Why are you laughing? Were you not here to rescue the hostages? You call yourself a hero? Fawn questioned Samantha's before. No. The lieutenant lulled her laughter to a chuckle. I am laughing because that is exactly what I wanted you to say. Pardon? Marchog Fawn's heart skipped a beat as he turned his eyes to the forward contingent of soldiers that he had brought forth to escort the hostages with. The group dissipated seamlessly as light refracted to show that what was supposed to be the hostages and their guards standing idly by was an illusion. The real happening before them was that the guards were killed under the cloak and dagger of suppressed gunfire from the otherworldly weapons in a shape of black colored staves. The hostages meanwhile, their manacles were broken, unshackled of right under their noses whilst an illusion was used to mimic an image of the incumbent guards deceptively continuing their watch on the prisoners. They were all well into the clear towards the Lavla gates by the time the virtual images faded away, with one such warrior giving a playful salute towards Samantha as they retreated. I have got to say, I normally would feel bad beating up kids but this one was asking for it. Fun thing he makes a great punching bag for my magics yeah? Samantha chuckled as she loosens her limbs with a few curls from her ankles and wrists. What trickery was this? Fawn questioned. Illusion magics at work Sir Ekdorf. A serene voice whispered from the winds. End of block 5.